preface of pioneers of science this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by avai in march 2010 pioneers of science by sir oliver lodge professor of physics in victoria university college liverpool preface this book takes its origin in a course of lectures on the history and progress of astronomy arranged for me in the year eighteen eighty seven by three of my colleagues a c b j m g h r one of whom gave the course its name the lectures having been found interesting it was natural to write them out in full and publish if i may claim for them any merit i should say it consists in their simple statement and explanation of scientific facts and laws the biographical details are compiled from all readily available sources there is no novelty or originality about them though it is hoped that there may be some vividness i have simply tried to present a living figure of each pioneer in turn and to trace his influence on the progress of thought i am indebted to many biographers and writers among others to mr e j c morton whose excellent set of lives published by the s p c k saved me much trouble in the early part of the course as we approach recent times the subject grows more complex and the men more nearly contemporaries hence the biographical aspect diminishes and the scientific treatment becomes fuller but in no case has it been allowed to become technical and generally unreadable to the friends c c c f w h m e f r who with great kindness have revised the proofs and have indicated places where the facts could be made more readily intelligible by a clearer statement i express my genuine gratitude university college liverpool november eighteen ninety two end of preface Lecture One of the Pioneers of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lecture One The Pioneers of Science by Sir Oliver Lodge. Dates and Summary of Facts for Lecture One Physical Science of the Ancients. Tales, 640 BC. Anaximander, 610 B.C., Pythagoras, 600 B.C., Anaxagoras, 500 B.C., Eudoxus, 400 B.C., Aristotle, 384 B.C., Aristarchus, 300 B.C., Archimedes, 287 B.C., Eratosthenes, 276 B.C., Hipparchus, 160 B.C., Ptolemy, 100 A.D., science of the middle ages cultivated only among the arabs largely in the forms of astrology alchemy and algebra return of science to europe roger bacon 1240 leonardo da vinci 1480 printing 1455 columbus 1492 copernicus 1543 a sketch of copernic's life and work born 1473 at torn in poland studied mathematics at bologna became an ecclesiastic lived at frauenburg near mouth of vistula substituted for the apparent motion of the heavens the real motion of the earth published tables of planetary motions motion still supposed to be in epicycles worked out his ideas for thirty-six years and finally dedicated his work to the pope died just as his book was printed aged seventy two a century before the birth of newton a colossal statue by thorwaldsen erected at warsaw in eighteen thirty lecture one copernicus and the motion of the earth the ordinary run of men live among phenomena of which they know nothing and care less they see bodies fall to the earth they hear sounds they kindle fires they see the heavens roll above them but of the causes and inner working of the whole they are ignorant and with their ignorance they are content 
understand the structure of a soap bubble said a cultivated literary man whom i know i wouldn't cross the street to know it and if this is a prevalent attitude now what must have been the attitude in ancient times when mankind was emerging from savagery and when history seems composed of harassments by wars abroad and revolutions at home in the most violently disturbed times indeed those with which ordinary history is mainly occupied science is quite impossible it needs as its condition in order to flourish a fairly quiet untroubled state or else a cloister or university removed from the din and bustle of the political and commercial world in such places it has taken its rise and in such peaceful places and quiet times true science will continue to be cultivated the great bulk of mankind must always remain i suppose more or less careless of scientific research and scientific result except in so far as it affects their modes of locomotion their health and pleasure or their purse but among a people hurried and busy and preoccupied some in the pursuit of riches some in the pursuit of pleasure and some the majority in the struggle for existence there arise in every generation here and there one or two great souls men who seem of another age and country who look upon the bustle and feverish activity and are not infected by it who watch others achieving prizes of riches and pleasure and are not disturbed who look on the world and universe they are born in with quite other eyes to them it appears not as a bazaar to buy and to sell in not as a ladder to scramble up or down helter-skelter without knowing whither or why but as a fact a great and mysterious fact to be pondered over studied and perchance in some small measure understood by the multitude these men were sneered at as eccentric or feared as supernatural their calm clear contemplative attitude seemed either insane or diabolic and accordingly they have been pitied as enthusiasts or killed as blasphemers one of these great souls may have been a prophet or preacher and have called to his generation to bethink them of why and what they were to struggle less and meditate more to search for things of true value and not for dross another has been a poet or musician and has uttered in words or in song thoughts dimly possible to many men but by them unutterable and left inarticulate another has been influenced still more directly by the universe around him has felt at times overpowered by the mystery and solemnity of it all and has been impelled by a force stronger than himself to study it patiently slowly diligently content if he could gather a few crumbs of the great harvest of knowledge happy if he could grasp some great generalization or wide embracing law and so in some small measure enter into the mind and thought of the designer of all this wondrous frame of things these last have been the men of science the great and heaven-born men of science and they are few in our own day amid the throng of inventions there are a multitude of small men using the name of science but working for their own ends jostling and scrambling just as they would jostle and scramble in any other trade or profession these may be workers they may and do advance knowledge but they are never pioneers not to them is it given to open out great tracts of unexplored territory or to view the promised land as from a mountain top of them we shall not speak we will concern ourselves only with the greatest the epoch making men to whose life and work we and all who come after them owe so much such a man was tales such was archimedes hipparchus copernicus such preeminently was newton now i am not going to attempt a history of science such a work in ten lectures would be absurd i intend to pick out a few salient names here and there and to study these in some detail rather than by attempting to deal with too many to lose individuality and distinctness we know so little of the great names of antiquity that they are for this purpose scarcely suitable 
in some departments the science of the greeks was remarkable though it is completely overshadowed by their philosophy yet it was largely based on what has proved to be a wrong method of procedure v the introspective and conjectural rather than the inductive and experimental methods they investigated nature by studying their own minds by considering the meanings of words rather than by studying things and recording phenomena this wrong though by no means on the face of it absurd method was not pursued exclusively else would their science have been valueless but the influence it had was such as materially to detract from the value of their speculations and discoveries for when truth and falsehood are inextricably woven into a statement the truth is as hopelessly hidden as if it had never been stated for we have no criterion to distinguish the false from the true besides this however many of their discoveries were ultimately lost to the world some as at alexandria by fire the bigoted work of a mohammedan conqueror some by eruption of barbarians and all were buried so long and so completely by the night of the dark ages that they had to be rediscovered almost as absolutely and completely as though they had never been some of the names of antiquity we shall have occasion to refer to so i have arranged some of them in chronological order on page four and as a representative one i may specially emphasize archimedes one of the greatest men of science there has ever been and the father of physics the only effective link between the old and the new science is afforded by the arabs the dark ages come as an utter gap in the scientific history of europe and for more than a thousand years there was not a scientific man of note except in arabia and with the arabs knowledge was so mixed up with magic and enchantment that one cannot contemplate it with any degree of satisfaction and little real progress was made in some of the waverly novels you can realize the state of matters in these times and you know how the only approach to science is through some arab sorcerer or astrologer maintained usually by a monarch and consulted upon all great occasions as the oracles were of old in the thirteenth century however a really great scientific man appeared who may be said to herald the dawn of modern science in europe this man was roger bacon he cannot be said to do more than herald it however for we must wait two hundred years for the next name of great magnitude moreover he was isolated and so far in advance of his time that he left no followers his own work suffered from the prevailing ignorance for he was persecuted and imprisoned not for the commonplace and natural reason that he frightened the church but merely because he was eccentric in his habits and knew too much the man i spoke of as coming two hundred years later is leonardo da vinci true he is best known as an artist but if you read his works you will come to the conclusion that he was the most scientific artist who ever lived he teaches the laws of perspective then new of light and shade of color of the equilibrium of bodies and of a multitude of other matters where science touches on art not always quite correctly according to modern ideas but in beautiful and precise language for clear and conscious power for wide embracing knowledge and skill leonardo is one of the most remarkable men that ever lived about this time the tremendous invention of printing was achieved and columbus unwittingly discovered the new world the middle of the next century must be taken as the real dawn of modern science for the year fifteen forty three marks the publication of the life work of copernicus nicholas copernic was his proper name copernicus is merely the latinized form of it according to the then prevailing fashion he was born at torn in polish prussia in fourteen seventy three his father is believed to have been a german he graduated at Krakow as a doctor in arts and medicine and was destined for the ecclesiastical profession. The details of his life are few. It seems to have been quiet and uneventful, and we know very little about it. He was instructed in astronomy at Krakow and learnt mathematics at Bologna. Thence he went to Rome, where he was made professor of mathematics, and soon afterwards he went into orders. 
on his return home he took charge of the principal church in his native place and became a canon at frauenburg near the mouth of the vistula he lived the remainder of his life we find him reporting on coinage for the government but otherwise he does not appear as having entered into the life of the times he was a quiet scholarly monk of studious habits and with a reputation which drew to him several earnest students who received viva voce instruction from him so in study and meditation his life passed he compiled tables of the planetary motions which were far more correct than any which had hitherto appeared and which remained serviceable for long afterwards the ptolemaic system of the heavens which had been the orthodox system all through the christian era he endeavored to improve and simplify by the hypothesis that the sun was the center of the system instead of the earth and the first consequences of this change he worked out for many years producing in the end a great book his one life work this famous work de revolutionibus orbium celestium embodied all his painstaking calculations applied his new system to each of the bodies in the solar system in succession and treated besides of much other recondite matter towards the close of his life it was put into type he can scarcely be said to have lived to see it appear for he was stricken with paralysis before its completion but a printed copy was brought to his bedside and put into his hands so that he might just feel it before he died that copernicus was a giant in intellect or power such as had lived in the past and were destined to live in the near future i see no reason whatever to believe he was just a quiet earnest patient and god-fearing man a deep student an unbiased thinker although with no specially brilliant or striking gifts yet to him it was given to effect such a revolution in the whole course of man's thought as is difficult to parallel you know what the outcome of his work was it proved he did not merely speculate he proved that the earth is a planet like the others and that it revolves round the sun yes it can be summed up in a sentence but what a revelation it contains if you have never made an effort to grasp the full significance of this discovery you will not appreciate it the doctrine is very familiar to us now we have heard it i suppose since we were four years old but can you realize it i know it was a long time before i could think of the solid earth with trees and houses cities and countries mountains and seas think of the vast tracts of land in asia africa and america and then picture the whole mass spinning like a top and rushing along its annual course round the sun at the rate of nineteen miles every second were we not accustomed to it the idea would be staggering no wonder it was received with incredulity but the difficulties of the conception are not only physical they are still more felt from the speculative and theological points of view with this last indeed the reconcilement cannot be considered complete even yet theologians do not indeed now deny the fact of the earth's subordination in the scheme of the universe but many of them ignore it and pass it by so soon as the church awoke to a perception of the tremendous and revolutionary import of the new doctrines it was bound to resist them or be false to its traditions for the whole tenor of men's thought must have been changed had they accepted it if the earth were not the central and all-important body in the universe if the sun and planets and stars were not attendant and subsidiary lights but were other worlds larger and perhaps superior to ours where was man's place in the universe and where were the doctrines they had maintained as irrefragable i by no means assert that the new doctrines were really utterly irreconcilable with the more essential parts of the old dogmas if only theologians had had patience and genius enough to consider the matter calmly i suppose that in that case they might have reached the amount of reconciliation at present attained and not only have left scientific truth in peace to spread as it could but might perhaps themselves have joined the band of earnest students and workers as so many of the higher catholic clergy do at the present day but this was too much to expect such a revelation was not to be accepted in a day or in a century 
the easiest plan was to treat it as a heresy and to try to crush it out not in Copernic's life, however, did they perceive the dangerous tendency of the doctrine, partly because it was buried in a ponderous and learned treatise not likely to be easily understood, partly, perhaps, because its propounder was himself an ecclesiastic, mainly because he was a patient and judicious man, not given to loud or intolerant assertion, but content to state his views in quiet conversation, and to let them gently spread for thirty years before he published them and when he did publish them he used the happy device of dedicating his great book to the pope and a cardinal bore the expense of printing it thus did the roman church stand sponsor to a system of truth against which it was destined in the next century to hurl its anathemas and to inflict on its conspicuous adherents torture imprisonment and death to realize the change of thought, the utterly new view of the universe which the Copernican theory introduced, we must go back to preceding ages and try to recall the views which had been held as probable concerning the form of the earth and the motion of the heavenly bodies. The earliest recorded notion of the earth is the very natural one that it is a flat area floating in an illimitable ocean. The sun was a god who drove his chariot across the heavens once a day, and Anaxagoras was threatened with death and punished with banishment for teaching that the sun was only a ball of fire, and that it might perhaps be as big as the country of Greece. The obvious difficulty as to how the sun got back to the east again every morning was got over, not by the conjecture that he went back in the dark, nor by the idea that there was a fresh sun every day though indeed it was once believed that the moon was created once a month and periodically cut up into stars but by the doctrine that in the northern part of the earth was a high range of mountains and that the sun travelled round on the surface of the sea behind these sometimes indeed you find a representation of the sun being rowed round in a boat later on it was perceived to be necessary that the sun should be able to travel beneath the earth and so the earth was supposed to be supported on pillars or on roots, or to be a dome-shaped body floating in the air, much like Dean Swift's island of Laputa. The elephant and tortoise of the Hindu earth are no doubt emblematic or typical, not literal. Aristotle, however, taught that the earth must be a sphere, and used all the orthodox arguments of the present children's geography books about the way you see ships at sea and about lunar eclipses to imagine a possible antipodes must however have been a tremendous difficulty in the way of this conception of a sphere and i scarcely suppose that any one can at that time have contemplated the possibility of such an upside-down regions being ha inhabited I find that intelligent children invariably feel the greatest difficulty in realizing the existence of inhabitants on the opposite side of the earth. Stupid children, like stupid persons in general, will, of course, believe anything they are told, and much good may the belief do them. But the kind of difficulties felt by intelligent and thoughtful children are most instructive, since it is quite certain that the early philosophers must have encountered and overcome those very same difficulties by their own genius. However, somehow or other, the conception of a spherical earth was gradually grasped, and the heavenly bodies were perceived all to revolve round it, some moving regularly, as the stars, all fixed together into one spherical shell or firmament, some moving irregularly and apparently anomalously, these irregular bodies were therefore called planets, or wanderers. Seven of them were known, v. Moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and there is little doubt that this number seven, so suggested, is the origin of the seven days of the week. The above order of the ancient planets is that of their supposed distance from the Earth. Not always, however, are they thus quoted by the ancients sometimes the sun is supposed nearer than mercury or venus it has always been known that the moon was the nearest of the heavenly bodies and some rough notion of its distance was current mars jupiter and saturn were placed in that order because that is the order of their apparent motions and it was natural to suppose that the slowest moving bodies were the furthest off 
the order of the days of the week shows what astrologers consider to be the order of the planets on their system of each successive hour of the day being ruled over by the successive planets taken in order the diagram figure seven shows that if the sun rule the first hour of a certain day thereby giving its name to the day venus will rule the second hour mercury the third and so on the sun will thus be found to rule the eighth fifteenth and twenty-second hour of that day venus the twenty-third and mercury the twenty-fourth hour so the moon will rule the first hour of the next day which will therefore be monday on the same principle numbering round the hours successively with the arrows the first hour of the next day will be found to be ruled by mars or by the saxon deity corresponding thereto the first hour of the day after by mercury mercredi and so on following the straight lines of the pattern the order of the planets round the circle counterclockwise i e the direction of their proper motions is that quoted above in the text to explain the motion of the planets and reduce them to any sort of law was a work of tremendous difficulty the greatest astronomer of ancient times was hipparchus and to him the system known as the ptolemaic system is no doubt largely due but it was delivered to the world mainly by ptolemy and goes by his name this was a fine piece of work and a great advance on anything that had gone before for although it is of course saturated with error still it is based on a large substratum of truth its superiority to all the previously mentioned systems is obvious and it really did in its more developed form describe the observed motions of the planets each planet was in the early stages of the system as taught say by eudoxus supposed to be set in a crystal sphere which revolved so as to carry the planet with it the sphere had to be a crystal to account for the visibility of the other planets and the stars through it outside the seven planetary spheres arranged one inside the other was still a larger one in which were set the stars this was believed to turn all the others and it was called the primum mobile the whole system was supposed to produce in its revolution for the few privileged to hear the music of the spheres a sound of some magnificent harmony the enthusiastic disciples of pythagoras believed that their master was privileged to hear this noble chant and far be it from us to doubt that the rapt and absorbing pleasure of contemplating the harmony of nature to a man so eminently great as pythagoras must be truly and adequately represented by some such poetic conception the precise kind of motion supposed to be communicated from the primum mobile to the other spheres so as to produce the observed motions of the planets was modified and improved by various philosophers until it developed into the epicyclic train of hipparchus and of ptolemy it is very instructive to observe a planet say mars or jupiter night after night and plot down its place with reference to the fixed stars on a celestial globe or star map or instead of direct observation by alignment with known stars it is easier to look out its right ascension and declination in whitaker's almanac and plot these down if this be done for a year or two it will be found that the motion of the planets is by no means regular but that on the whole it advances it sometimes is stationary and sometimes goes back these stations and retrogressions of the planet were well known to the ancients it was not to be supposed for a moment that the crystal spheres were subject to any irregularity neither was uniform circular motion to be readily abandoned so it was surmised that the main sphere carried not the planet itself but the center or axis of a subordinate sphere and that the planet was carried by this the minor sphere could be allowed to revolve at a different uniform pace from the main sphere and so a curve of some complexity could be obtained a curve described in space by a point of a circle or sphere which itself is carried along at the same time is some kind of cycloid if the center of the tracing circle travels along a straight line we get the ordinary cycloid the curve traced in air by a nail on a coach wheel but if the center of the tracing circle be carried round another circle the curve described is called an epicycloid by such curves the planetary stations and retrogressions could be explained a large sphere 
would have to revolve once for a year of the particular planet carrying with it a subsidiary sphere in which the planet was fixed this latter sphere revolving once for a year of the earth the actual looped curve thus described is depicted for jupiter and saturn in the annex diagram figure ten it was long ago perceived that real material spheres were unnecessary such spheres indeed though possibly transparent to light would be impermeable to comets any other epicyclic gearing would serve and as a mere description of the motion it is simpler to think of a system of jointed bars one long arm carrying a shorter arm the two revolving at different rates and the end of the short one carrying the planet this does all that is needful for the first approximation to a planet's motion in so far as the motion cannot be thus truly stated the short arm may be supposed to carry another and that another and so on so that the resultant motion of the planet is compounded of a large number of circular motions of different periods by this device any required amount of complexity could be attained we shall return to this at greater length in lecture three the main features of the motion as shown in the diagram required only two arms for their expression one arm revolving with the average motion of the planet and the other revolving with the apparent motion of the sun and always pointing in the same direction as the single arm supposed to carry the sun this last fact is of course because the motion to be represented does not really belong to the planet at all but to the earth and so all the main epicyclic motions for the superior planets were the same as for the inferior planets mercury and venus they only appear to oscillate like the bob of a pendulum about the sun and so it is very obvious that they must be really revolving round it an ancient egyptian system perceived this truth but the ptolemaic system imagined them to revolve round the earth like the rest with an artificial system of epicycles to prevent their ever getting far away from the neighborhood of the sun it is easy now to see how the copernican system explains the main features of planetary motions the stations and retrogressions quite naturally and without any complexity let the outer circle represent the orbit of jupiter and the inner circle the orbit of the earth which is moving faster than jupiter since jupiter takes four thousand three hundred and thirty two days to make one revolution then remember that the apparent position of jupiter is referred to in the infinitely distant fixed stars and refer to figure twelve let e one e two and company be successive positions of the earth j one j two and company corresponding positions of jupiter produce the lines e one j one e two and j two and company to an enormously greater circle outside and it will be seen that the termination of these lines representing apparent positions of jupiter among the stars advances while the earth goes from e one to e three it is almost stationary from somewhere about e three to e four and recedes from e four to e five so that evidently the recessions of jupiter are only apparent and are due to the orbital motion of the earth the apparent complications in the path of jupiter shown in figure ten are seen to be caused simply by the motion of the earth and to be thus completely and easily explained the same thing for an inferior planet say mercury is even still more easily seen vide figure thirteen the motion of mercury is direct from m two to m three retrograde from m three to m two and stationary at m two and m three it appears to oscillate taking seventy two point five days for its direct swing and forty three point five for its return swing on this system no artificiality is required to prevent mercury's ever getting far from the sun the radius of its orbit limits its real and apparent excursions even if the earth were stationary the motions of mercury and venus would not be essentially modified but the stations and retrogressions of the superior planets mars jupiter and company would wholly cease the complexity of the old mode of regarding apparent motion may be illustrated by the case of a traveler in a railway train unaware of his own motion it is though trees hedges distant objects were all flying past him and contorting themselves as you may see the furrows of a ploughed field do when travelling while you yourself seem stationary amidst it all 
how great a simplicity would be introduced by the hypothesis that after all these things might be stationary and oneself moving now you are not to suppose that the system of copernicus swept away the entire doctrine of epicycles that doctrine can hardly be said to be swept away even now as a description of a planet's motion it is not incorrect though it is geometrically cumbrous if you describe the motion of a railway train by stating that every point on the rim of each wheel describes a cycloid with reference to the earth and a circle with reference to the train and that the motion of the train is compounded of these cycloidal and circular motions you will not be saying what is false only what is cumbrous the ptolemaic system demanded large epicycles depending on the motion of the earth these are what copernicus overthrew but to express the minuter details of the motion a smaller epicycles remained and grew more and more complex as observations increased in accuracy until a greater man than either copernicus or ptolemy v kepler replaced them all by a simple ellipse one point i must not omit from this brief notice of the work of copernicus hipparchus had by most sagacious interpretation of certain observations of his discovered a remarkable phenomenon called the precession of the equinoxes it was a discovery of the first magnitude and such as would raise to great fame the man who should have made it in any period of the world's history even the present it is scarcely expressible in popular language and without some technical terms but i can try the plane of the earth's orbit produced into the sky gives the apparent path of the sun throughout a year this path is known as the ecliptic because eclipses only happen when the moon is in it the sun keeps to it accurately but the planets wander somewhat above and below it figure nine and the moon wanders a good deal it is manifest however in order that there may be an eclipse of any kind that a straight line must be able to be drawn through the earth and moon and sun not necessarily through their centers of course and this is impossible unless some parts of the three bodies are in one plane v the ecliptic or something very near it the ecliptic is a great circle of the sphere and is usually drawn on both celestial and terrestrial globes the earth's equator also produced into the sky where it may still be called the equator sometimes it is awkwardly called the equinoctal gives another great circle inclined to the ecliptic and cutting it at two opposite points labeled respectively aries and libra and together called the equinoxes the reason for the name is that when the sun is in that part of the ecliptic it is temporarily also on the equator and hence is symmetrically situated with respect to the earth's axis of rotation and consequently day and night are equal all over the earth well hipparchus found by plotting the position of the sun for a long time that these points of intersection or equinoxes were not stationary from century to century but slowly moved among the stars moving as it were to meet the sun so that he gets back to one of these points again twenty minutes twenty three and a quarter seconds before it has really completed a revolution i e before the true year is fairly over the slow movement forward of the goalpost is called precession the precession of the equinoxes one result of it is to shorten our years by about twenty minutes each for the shortened period has to be called a year because it is on the position of the sun with respect to the earth's axis that our seasons depend copernicus perceived that assuming the motion of the earth a clearer account of this motion could be given the ordinary approximate statement concerning the earth's axis is that it remains parallel to itself i e has a fixed direction as the earth moves round the sun but if instead of being thus fixed it is supposed to have a slow movement of revolution so that it traces out a cone in the course of about twenty six thousand years then since the equator of course goes with it the motion of its intersection with the fixed ecliptic is so far accounted for that is to say the precession of the equinoxes is seen to be dependent on and caused by a slow conical movement of the earth's axis the prolongation of each end of the earth's axis into the sky or the celestial north and south poles 
will thus slowly trace out an approximate circle among the stars and the course of the north pole during historic time is exhibited in the annex diagram it is now situated near one of the stars of the lesser bear which we therefore call the pole star but not always was it so nor will it be so in the future the position of the north pole four thousand years ago is shown in the figure and a revolution will be completed in something like twenty six thousand years the perception of the conical motion of the earth's axis was a beautiful generalization of copernic's whereby a multitude of facts were grouped into a single phenomenon of course he did not explain the motion of the axis itself he stated the fact that it so moved and i do not suppose it ever struck him to seek for an explanation an explanation was given later and that a most complete one but the idea even of seeking for it is a brilliant and striking one the achievement of the explanation by a single individual in the way it actually was accomplished is one of the most astounding things in the history of science and were it not that the same individual accomplished a dozen other things equally and some still more extraordinary we should rank that man as one of the greatest astronomers that ever lived as it is he is sir isaac newton we are to remember then as the life work of copernicus that he placed the sun in its true place as the center of the solar system instead of the earth that he greatly simplified the theory of planetary motion by this step and also by the simpler epicyclic chain which now sufficed and which he worked out mathematically that he exhibited the precession of the equinoxes discovered by hipparchus as due to a conical motion of the earth's axis and that by means of his simpler theory and more exact planetary tables he reduced to some sort of order the confused chaos of the ptolemaic system whose accumulation of complexity and of outstanding errors threatened to render astronomy impossible by the mere burden of its detail there are many imperfections in his system it is true but his great merit is that he dared to look at the facts of nature with his own eyes unhampered by the prejudice of centuries a system venerable with age and supported by great names was universally believed and had been believed for centuries to doubt this system and to seek after another and better one at a time when all men's minds were governed by tradition and authority and when to doubt was sin this required a great mind and a high character such a mind and such a character had this monk of frauenberg and it is interesting to notice that the so-called religious scruples of smaller and less truly religious men did not affect copernicus it was no dread of consequence to one form of truth that led him to delay the publication of the other form of truth specially revealed to him in his dedication he says if there be some babblers who though ignorant of all mathematics take upon them to judge of these things and dare to blame and cavil at my work because of some passage of scripture which they have wrested to their own purpose i regard them not and will not scruple to hold their judgment in contempt i will conclude with the words of one of his biographers mr e j c morton copernicus cannot be said to have flooded with light the dark places of nature in the way that one stupendous mind subsequently did but still as we look back through the long vista of the history of science the dim titanic figure of the old monk seems to rear itself out of the dull flats around it pierces with its head the mists that overshadow them and catches the first gleam of the rising sun like some iron peak by the creator fired with the red glow of the rushing morn end of lecture one of the pioneers of science by sir oliver lodge Recording by Kathleen Nelson, Austin, Texas, April 2010. Lecture 2 of Pioneers of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pioneers of Science by Sir Oliver Lodge Lecture 2 Dates and Summary of Facts for Lecture 2 Copernicus lived from 1473 to 1543, 
and was contemporary with Paracelsus and Raphael. Tycho Brahe, from 1546 to 1601. Kepler, from 1571 to 1630. Galileo, from 1564 to 1642. Gilbert, from 1540 to 1603. Francis Bacon, from 1561 to 1626. Descartes, from 1596 to 1650. A sketch of Tycho Brahe's life and work. Tycho was a Danish noble, born on his ancestral estate at Knutstorp, near Helsingborg in 1546. Adopted by his uncle and sent to the University of Copenhagen to study law. Attracted to astronomy by the occurrence of an eclipse on its predicted day, August 21st, 1560. Began to construct astronomical instruments, especially a quadrant and a sextant. Observed at Augsburg and Wittenberg. Studied alchemy, but was recalled to astronomy by the appearance of a new star. Overcame his aristocratic prejudices and delivered a course of lectures at Copenhagen at the request of the king. After this, he married a peasant girl. Again traveled and observed in Germany. In 1576, was sent for to Denmark by Frederick II and established in the island of Huen with an endowment enabling him to devote his life to astronomy. Built Uraniburg, furnished it with splendid instruments, and became the founder of accurate instrumental astronomy. His theories were poor, but his observations were admirable. In 1592, Frederick died, and five years later, Tycho was impoverished and practically banished. After wandering till 1599, he was invited to Prague by the Emperor Rudolf, and there received John Kepler, among other pupils. But the sentence of exile was too severe, and he died in 1601, aged 54 years. A man of strong character, untiring energy, and devotion to accuracy, his influence on astronomy has been immense. Lecture 2. Tycho Brahe and the Earliest Observatory We have seen how Copernicus placed the Earth in its true position in the solar system, making it merely one of a number of other worlds revolving around the central luminary. And observe that there are two phenomena to be thus accounted for and explained. First, the diurnal revolution of the heavens. Second, the annual motion of the sun among the stars. The effect of the diurnal motion is conspicuous to everyone, and explains the rising, southing, and setting of the whole visible firmament. The effect of the annual motion i.e. of the apparent annual motion of the sun among the stars, is less obvious, but it may be followed easily enough by observing the stars visible at any given time of evening at different seasons of the year. At midnight, for instance, the position of the sun is definite, viz. due north always, but the constellation, which at that time is due south, or is rising or setting, varies with the time of year. An interval of one month producing just the same effect on the appearance of the constellations as an interval of two hours does, because the day contains twice as many hours as the year contains months, e.g. the sky looks the same at midnight on the 1st of October as it does at 10 p.m. on the 1st of November. All these simple consequences of the geocentric as opposed to the heliocentric point of view were pointed out by Copernicus in addition to his greater work of constructing improved planetary tables on the basis of his theory. But it must be admitted that he himself felt a hypothesis of the motion of the Earth to be a difficulty. Its acceptance is by no means such an easy and childish matter as we are apt now to regard it, and the hostility to it is not at all surprising. The human race, after having ridiculed and resisted the truth for a long time, is apt to end in accepting it so blindly and unimaginatively as to fail to recognize the real achievement of its first propounders, or the difficulties which they had to overcome. The majority of men at the present day have grown accustomed to hear the motion of the earth spoken of. Their acceptance of it means nothing. The attitude of the paradoxer who denies it is more intelligent. It is not to be supposed that the idea of thus explaining some of the phenomena of the heavens, especially the daily motion of the entire firmament, by a diurnal rotation of the earth, had not struck anyone. It was often at this time referred to as the Pythagorean theory, and it had been taught, I believe, by Aristarchus. But it was new to the modern world, and it had the great weight of Aristotle against it. 
Consequently, for long after Copernicus, only a few leading spirits could be found to support it, and the long-established venerable Ptolemaic system continued to be taught in all universities. The main objections to the motion of the Earth were such as the following. 1. The motion is unfelt and difficult to imagine. That it is unfelt is due to its uniformity, and can be explained mechanically. That it is difficult to imagine is and remains true, but a most important lesson we have to learn is that difficulty of conception is no valid argument against reality. 2. That the stars do not alter their relative positions according to the season of the year, but the constellations preserve always the same aspect precisely, even to careful measurement. This is indeed a difficulty, and a great one. In June, the Earth is 184 million miles away from where it was in December. How can we see precisely the same fixed stars? It is not possible unless they are at a practically infinite distance. That is the only answer that can be given. It was the tentative answer given by Copernicus. It is the correct answer. Not only from every position of the Earth, but from every planet of the solar system, the same constellations are visible, and the stars have the same aspect. The whole immensity of the solar system shrinks to practically a point when confronted with the distance of the stars. Not, however, so entirely a speck as to resist the terrific accuracy of the present century, and their microscopic relative displacement with the season of the year has now at length been detected, and the distance of many thereby measured. 3. That, if the Earth revolved round the Sun, Mercury and Venus ought to show phases like the Moon. So they ought. Any globe must show phases if it lived near the Sun than we do, and if we go round it for we shall see varying amounts of its illuminated half. The only answer that Copernicus could give to this was that they might be difficult to see without extra powers of sight. But he ventured to predict that the phases would be seen if ever our powers of vision should be enhanced. 4. That if the earth moved, or even revolved on its own axis, a stone or other dropped body ought to be left far behind. This difficulty is not a real one, like the two last and it is based on an ignorance of the laws of mechanics, which had not at that time been formulated. We know now that a ball dropped from a high tower, so far from lagging, drops a minute trifle in front of the foot of a perpendicular, because the top of the tower is moving a trace faster than the bottom, by reason of the diurnal rotation. But ignoring this, a stone dropped from the lamp of a railway carriage drops in the center of the floor, whether the carriage be moving steadily or standing still. A slant direction of fall could only be detected if the carriage were being accelerated or if the brake were applied. A body dropped from a moving carriage shares the motion of the carriage, and starts with that as its initial velocity. A ball dropped from a moving balloon does not simply drop, but starts off in whatever direction the car was moving, its motion being immediately modified by gravity, precisely in the same way as that of a thrown ball is modified. This is indeed the whole philosophy of throwing to drop a ball from a moving carriage. The carriage is the hand, and to throw far, a run is taken, and the body is jerked forward. The arm is also moved as rapidly as possible on the shoulder as a pivot. The forearm can be moved still faster, and the wrist joint gives yet another motion. The art of throwing is to bring all these to bear at the same instant, and then, just as they have all attained their maximum velocity, to let the ball go. It starts off with the initial velocity thus imparted, and is abandoned to gravity. If the vehicle were able to continue its motion steadily, as a balloon does, the ball when let go from it would appear to the occupant simply to drop, and it would strike the ground at a spot vertically under the moving vehicle, though by no means vertically below the place where it started. The resistance of the air makes observations of this kind inaccurate, except when performed inside a carriage, so that the air shares in the motion. Otherwise, a person could toss and catch a ball out of a train window just as well as if he were stationary, though to a spectator outside he would seem to be using great skill to throw the ball in a parabola adapted to bring it back to his hand. The same circumstance enhances the apparent difficulty of the circus rider's jumping feats. All he has to do is to jump up and down on the horse. The forward motion which carries him through hoops belongs to him by virtue of the motion of the horse, without effort on his part. Thus, then, it happens that a stone dropped 16 feet on the earth appears to fall straight down, although its real path in space 
is a very flat trajectory of 19 miles base and 16 feet height. 19 miles being the distance traversed by the Earth every second in the course of its annual journey round the Sun. No wonder that it was thought that bodies must be left behind if the Earth was subject to such terrific speed as this. All that Copernicus could suggest on this head was that perhaps the atmosphere might help to carry things forward, and enable them to keep pace with the Earth. There were thus several outstanding physical difficulties in the way of the acceptance of the Copernican theory, besides a biblical difficulty. It was quite natural that the idea of the Earth's motion should be repugnant, and take a long time to sink into the minds of men. And as scientific progress was vastly slower then than it is now, we find not only all priests, but even some astronomers 100 years afterwards still imagining the Earth to be at rest. And among them was a very eminent one, Tycho Brahe. It is interesting to note, moreover, that the argument about the motion of the Earth being contrary to Scripture appealed not only to ecclesiastics in those days, but to scientific men also. And Tycho Brahe, being a man of great piety, and highly superstitious also, was so much influenced by it that he endeavored to devise some scheme by which the chief practical advantage of the Copernican system could be retained, and yet the earth be kept still at the center of the whole. This was done by making all the celestial sphere, with stars and everything, rotate round the earth once a day, as in the Ptolemaic scheme, and then besides this, making all the planets revolve round the sun, and thus to revolve round the earth, such as a Tychonic system. So far as relative motion is concerned, it comes to the same thing, just as when you drop a book, you may say either that the earth rises to meet the book, or that the book falls to meet the earth. Or when a fly buzzes round your head, you may say that you are revolving round the fly. But the absurdity of making the whole gigantic system of sun and planets and stars revolve round our insignificant earth was too great to be swallowed by other astronomers after they had once had a taste of the Copernican theory. And accordingly, the Tychonic system died a speedy and an easy death at the same time as its inventor. Wherein, then, lay the magnitude of the man? Not in his theories, which were puerile, but in his observations, which were magnificent. He was the first observational astronomer, the founder of the splendid system of practical astronomy, which has culminated in the present Greenwich Observatory. Up to Tycho, the only astronomical measurements had been of the rudest kind. Copernicus even improved upon what had gone before, with measuring rules made with his own hands. Ptolemy's observations could never be trusted to half a degree. Tycho introduced accuracy before undreamed of, and though his measurements, reckoned by modern ideas, are of course almost ludicrously rough, remember no such thing as a telescope or microscope was then dreamed of, yet, estimated by the era in which they were made, they are marvels of accuracy, and not a single mistake due to carelessness has ever been detected in them. In fact, they may be depended on to almost minutes of arc, i.e., to sixteenths of a degree. For certain purposes, connected with the proper motion of stars, they are still appealed to, and they served as the certain and trustworthy data for succeeding generations of theorists to work upon. It was long indeed after Tycho's death before observations approaching in accuracy to his were made again. In every sense, therefore, he was a pioneer. Let us proceed to trace his history. Born the eldest son of a noble family, as noble and ignorant as sixteen undisputed quarterlings could make them, as one of his biographers says, in a period when, even more than at present, killing and hunting were the only natural aristocratic pursuits, when all study was regarded as something only fit for monks, and when science was looked at askance as something unsavory, useless, and semi-diabolic. There was little in his introduction to the world urging him in the direction where his genius lay. Of course he was destined for a soldier, but fortunately his uncle, George Brahe, a more educated man than his father, having no son of his own, was anxious to adopt him, and though not permitted to do so for a time, succeeded in getting his way on the birth of a second son, Steno, who, by the way, ultimately became privy counselor to the king of Denmark. Tycho's uncle gave him what he would never have got at home, a good education, and ultimately put him to study law. At the age of thirteen, he entered the University of Copenhagen, and while there occurred the determining influence of his life. An eclipse of the sun in those days was not regarded with the cold-blooded inquisitiveness or matter-of-fact apathy 
according as there is or is not anything to be learnt from it, with which such an event is now regarded. Every occurrence in the heavens was then believed to carry with it the destiny of nations and the fate of individuals, and accordingly was of surpassing interest. Ever since the time of Hipparchus, it has been possible for some capable man here and there to predict the occurrence of eclipses pretty closely. The thing is not difficult. The prediction was not indeed to the minute and second as it is now, but the day could usually be hit upon pretty accurately some time ahead much as we now manage to hit upon the return of a comet, barring accidents, and the hour could be predicted as the event approached. Well, the boy Tycho, among others, watched for this eclipse on August 21st, 1560, and when it appeared at its appointed time, every instinct for the marvelous, dormant in his strong nature, awoke to strenuous life, and he determined to understand for himself a science permitting such wonderful possibilities of prediction. He was sent to Leipzig with a tutor to go on with his study of law, but he seems to have done as little law as possible. He spent all his money on books and instruments, and set up half the night studying and watching the stars. In 1563 he observed a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, the precursor and cause, as he thought it, of the Great Plague. He found that the old planetary tables were as much as a month in error in fixing this event, and even the Copernican tables were several days out so he formed the resolve to devote his life to improving astronomical tables. This resolve he executed with a vengeance. His first instrument was a jointed ruler for sights for fixing the position of planets with respect to the stars, and observing their stations and retrogressions. By thus measuring the angles between a planet and two fixed stars, its position can be plotted down on a celestial map or globe. In 1565 his uncle George died, and made Tycho his heir. He returned to Denmark, but met with nothing but ridicule and contempt for his absurd driveling away of time over useless pursuits. So he went back to Germany, first to Wittenberg, thence, driven by the plague, to Rostock. Here his fiery nature led him into an absurd, though somewhat dangerous adventure. A quarrel at some feast, on a mathematical point, with a countryman, Mandarupius, led to the fixing of a duel and it was fought with swords at 7 p.m. at the end of December, when, if there was any light at all, it must have been of a flickering and unsatisfactory nature. The result of this insane performance was that Tycho got his nose cut clean off. He managed, however, to construct an artificial one, some say of gold and silver, some say of putty and brass, but whatever it was made of, there is no doubt that he wore it for the rest of his life, and it is a most famous feature. It excited generally far more interest than his astronomical researches. It is said, moreover, to have fairly resembled the original, but whether this remark was made by a friend or by an enemy, I cannot say. One account says that he used to carry about him a box of cement to apply whenever his nose came off, which it periodically did. About this time he visited Augsburg, met with some kindred and enlightened spirits in that town, and with much enthusiasm and spirit constructed a great quadrant. These early instruments were tremendous affairs. A great number of workmen were employed upon this quadrant, and it took twenty men to carry it to its place and erect it. It stood in the open air for five years, and was then destroyed by a storm. With it he made many observations. On his return to Denmark in 1571, his fame preceded him, and he was much better received and in order to increase his power of constructing instruments, he took up the study of alchemy, and like the rest of the persuasion, tried to make gold. The precious metals were by many old philosophers considered to be related in some way to the heavenly bodies. Silver to the moon, for instance, as we still see by the name lunar caustic applied to nitrate of silver, gold to the sun, copper to Mars, lead to Saturn. Hence astronomy and alchemy often went together. Tycho all his life combined a little alchemy with his astronomical labors, and he constructed a wonderful patent medicine to cure all disorders, which had as wide a circulation in Europe in its time as Holloway's pills. He gives a tremendous receipt for it, with liquid gold and all manner of ingredients in it. Among them, however, occurs a little antimony, a well-known sudorific, and to this, no doubt, whatever efficacy the medicine possessed was due. So he might have gone on wasting his time, 
were it not in that November, 1572, a new star made its appearance, as they have done occasionally before and since. On the average, one may say that about every fifty years, a new star of fair magnitude makes its temporary appearance. They are now known to be the result of some catastrophe or collision, whereby immense masses of incandescent gas are produced. This one, seen by Tycho, became as bright as Jupiter, and then died away in about a year and a half. Tycho observed all its changes, and endeavored to measure its distance from the Earth, with the result that it was proved to belong to the region of the fixed stars, at an immeasurable distance, and was not some nearer and more trivial phenomenon. He was asked by the University of Copenhagen to give a course of lectures on astronomy, but this was a step he felt some aristocratic aversion to, until a little friendly pressure was brought to bear upon him by a request from the king, and delivered they were. He now seems to have finally thrown off his aristocratic prejudices, and to have indulged himself in treading on the corns of nearly all the high and mighty people he came into contact with. In short, he became what we might now call a violent radical, but he was a good-hearted man nevertheless, and many are the tales told of his visits to sick peasants, of his consulting the stars as to their fate, all in perfect good faith, and of the medicines which he concocted and prescribed for them. The daughter of one of these peasants he married, and very happy the marriage seems to have been. Now comes the crowning episode in Tycho's life. Frederick II, realizing how eminent a man they had among them, and how much he could do if only he had the means, for we must understand that Tycho, though of good family and well-off, was by no means what we would call a wealthy man. Frederick II made him a splendid and enlightened offer. The offer was this, that if Tycho would agree to settle down and make his astronomical observations in Denmark, he should have an estate in Norway settled upon him, a pension of four hundred pounds a year for life, a site for a large observatory, and twenty thousand pounds to build it with. Well, if ever money was well spent, this was. By its means, Denmark before long headed the nations of Europe in the matter of science, a thing it has not done before or since. The site granted was the island of Huen, between Copenhagen and Elsinore, and here the most magnificent observatory ever built was raised, and called Uraniburg, the castle of the heavens. It was built on a hill in the center of the island, and included gardens, printing shops, laboratory, dwelling houses, and four observatories, all furnished with the most splendid instruments that Tycho could devise, and that then could be constructed. It was decorated with pictures and sculptures of eminent men, and altogether was a most gorgeous place. Twenty thousand pounds no doubt went far in those days, but the original grant was supplemented by Tycho himself, who was said to have spent another equal sum out of his own pocket on the place. For twenty years this great temple of science was continually worked in by him, and he soon became the foremost scientific man in Europe. Philosophers, statesmen, and occasionally kings came to visit the great astronomer, and to inspect his curiosities. And very wholesome for some of these great personages must have been the treatment they met with. For Tycho was no respecter of persons. His humbly born wife sat at the head of the table, whoever was there, and he would snub and contradict a chancellor just as soon as he would a serf. Whatever form his pride may have taken when a youth, in his maturity it impelled him to ignore differences of rank, not substantially justified, and he seemed to take a delight in exposing the ignorance of shallow titled persons, to whom contradiction and exposure were most unusual experiences. For sick peasants he would take no end of trouble, and went about doctoring them for nothing, till he set all the professional doctors against him, so that when his day of misfortune came, as come it did, their influence was not wanting to help to ruin one who spoilt their practice, and whom they derided as a quack. But some of the great ignorant folk who came to visit his temple of science, and to inspect its curiosities, felt themselves insulted, not always without reason. He kept a tame maniac in the house, named Lep, and he used to regard the sayings of this personage as oracular, presaging future events and far better worth listening to than ordinary conversation. Consequently, he used to have him at his banquets and feed him himself, and whenever Lep opened his mouth to speak, everyone else was peremptorily ordered to hold his tongue, so that Lep's words might be written down. In fact, it was something like an exaggerated edition of Betsy Trotwood and Mr. Dick. 
It must have been an odd dinner party, says Professor Stewart, with this strange, wild, terribly clever man, with his red hair and brazen nose, sometimes flashing with wit and knowledge, sometimes making the whole company, princes and servants alike, hold their peace and listen humbly to the ravings of a poor imbecile. To the people he despised, he did not show his serious instruments. He had other attractions, in the shape of a lot of toy machinery, little windmills and queer doors and golden globes, and all manner of ingenious tricks and automata, many of which he had made himself, and these he used to show them instead, and no doubt they were well enough pleased with them. Those of the visitors, however, who really cared to see and understand his instruments, went away enchanted with his genius and hospitality. I may, perhaps, be producing an unfair impression of imperiousness and insolence. Tycho was fiery, no doubt, but I think we should wrong him if we considered him insolent. Most of the nobles of his day were haughty persons, accustomed to deal with serfs, and very likely to sneer at and trample on any meek man of science whom they could easily despise. So Tycho was not meek. He stood up for the honor of his science, and paid them back in their own coin, with perhaps a little interest. That this behavior was not worldly wise is true enough, but I know of no commandment in joining us to be worldly wise. If we knew more about his so-called imbecile protege, we should probably find some reason for the interest which Tycho took in him. Whether he was what is now called a clairvoyant or not, Tycho evidently regarded his utterances as oracular. And, of course, when one is receiving what may be a revelation from heaven, it is natural to suppress ordinary conversation. Among the noble visitors whom he received and entertained, it is interesting to notice James I of England, who spent eight days at Uraniburg on the occasion of his marriage with Anne of Denmark in 1590 and seems to have been deeply impressed by his visit. Among other gifts, James presented Tycho with a dog, and this same animal was subsequently the cause of trouble. For it seems that one day, the Chancellor of Denmark, Walchendorf, brutally kicked the poor beast, and Tycho, who was very fond of animals, gave him a piece of his mind in no measured language. Walchendorf went home determined to ruin him. King Frederick, however, remained his true friend, doubtless partially influenced thereto by his Queen Sophia, an enlightened woman who paid many visits to Uraniburg, and knew Tycho well. But unfortunately, Frederick died, and his son, a mere boy, came to the throne. Now was the time for the people whom Tycho had offended, for those who were jealous of his great fame and importance, as well as for those who cast longing eyes on his estate and endowments. The boy king, too, unfortunately paid a visit to Tycho, and, venturing upon a decided opinion on some recondite subject, received a quiet setting down which he ill relished. Letters written by Tycho about this time are full of foreboding. He greatly dreads having to leave Uraniburg, with which his whole life has for twenty years been bound up. He tries to comfort himself with the thought that, wherever he is sent, he will have the same heavens and the same stars over his head. Gradually, his Norwegian estate and his pensions were taken away, and in five years, poverty compelled him to abandon his magnificent temple and to take a small house in Copenhagen. Not content with this, Walchendorf got a royal commission appointed to inquire into the value of his astronomical labors. This sapient body reported that his work was not only useless, but noxious, and soon after, he was attacked by the populace in the public street. Nothing was left for him now but to leave the country, and he went into Germany, leaving his wife and instruments to follow him whenever he could find a home for them. His wanderings in this dark time, some two years, are not quite clear. But at last, the enlightened emperor of Bohemia, Rudolf II, invited him to settle in Prague. Thither he repaired. A castle was given him as an observatory, a house in the city, and 3,000 crowns a year for life. So his instruments were set up once more. Students flocked to hear him and to receive work at his hands. Among them, a poor youth, John Kepler, to whom he was very kind, and who became, as you know, a still greater man than his master. But the spirit of Tycho was broken, and though some good work was done at Prague, 
more observations made, and the Rodolphine tables begun, yet the hand of death was upon him. A painful disease seized him, attended with sleeplessness and temporary delirium, during the paroxysms of which he frequently exclaimed, Ni frusha vixisi vadir. Oh, that it may not appear that I have lived in vain. Quietly, however, at last, and surrounded by his friends and relatives, this fierce, passionate soul passed away on the 24th of October, 1601. His beloved instruments, which were almost a part of himself, were stored by Rudolf in a museum with scrupulous care until the taking of Prague by the Elector Palatine's troops. In this disturbed time, they got smashed, dispersed, and converted to other purposes. One thing only was saved, the great brass globe, which some thirty years after was recognized by a later king of Denmark as having belonged to Tycho, and deposited in the library of the Academy of Sciences at Copenhagen, where I believe it is to this day. The island of Huen was overrun by the Danish nobility, and nothing now remains of Uraniburg but a mound of earth and two pits. As to the real work of Tycho, that has become immortal enough, chiefly through the labors of his friend and scholar, whose life we shall consider in the next lecture. End of Lecture 2 Recording by James Christopher J.X. Christopher at yahoo.com Lecture 3 of Pioneers of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Rodstrom. Pioneers of Science by Sir Oliver Lodge. Lecture 3 Kepler and the Laws of Planetary Motion. Summary of Facts for Lecture 3. Life and Work of Kepler Kepler was born in December 1571 at Weil in Württemberg. Father an officer in the Duke's army, mother something of a virago, both very poor. Kepler was utilized as a tavern potboy, but ultimately sent to a charity school and thence to the University of Tübingen. Health extremely delicate. He was liable to violent attacks all his life studied mathematics, and accepted an astronomical lectureship at Graz at the first post which offered, endeavored to discover some connection between the number of the planets, their times of revolution, and their distances from the sun, ultimately hit upon his fanciful regular solid hypothesis, and published his first book in 1597. In 1599 was invited by Tycho to Prague, and there appointed imperial mathematician, at a handsome but seldom paid salary. Observed the new star of 1604. Endeavored to find the law of refraction of light from Vitellio's measurements, but failed. Analyzed Tycho's observations to find the true law of motion of Mars. After incredible labor, through innumerable wrong guesses, and six years of almost incessant calculation, he at length emerged in his two laws, discoveries which swept away all epicycles, deference, equants, and other remnants of the Greek system, and ushered in the dawn of modern astronomy. Law 1. Planets move in ellipses with the sun in one focus. Law 2. The radius vector, or line joining sun and planet, sweeps out equal areas in equal times. Published his second book containing these laws in 1609, Death of Rudolph in 1612, and subsequent increased misery and misfortune of Kepler. Ultimately discovered the connection between the times and distances of the planets for which he had been groping all his mature life, and announced it in 1618. Law 3 the square of the time of revolution, or year of each planet, is proportional to the cube of its mean distance from the sun. The book in which this law was published, On Celestial Harmonies, 
was dedicated to James of England. In 1620, had to intervene to protect his mother from being tortured for witchcraft. Accepted a professorship at Linz. Published the Rudolphine Tables in 1627, embodying Tycho's observations and his own theory. Made a last effort to overcome his poverty by getting the arrears of his salary paid at Prague, but was unsuccessful, and, contracting brain fever on the journey, died in November 1630, aged 59. A man of keen imagination, indomitable perseverance, and uncompromising love of truth, Kepler overcame ill health, poverty, and misfortune, and placed himself in the very highest rank of scientific men. His laws, so extraordinarily discovered, introduced order and simplicity into what else would have been a chaos of detailed observations, and they served as a secure basis for the splendid erection made on them by Newton. Seven planets of the Ptolemaic system, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Six planets of the Copernican system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. The five regular solids in appropriate order, octahedron, icosahedron, dodecahedron, tetrahedron, cube. Table illustrating Kepler's third law. Planet. Mercury. Mean distance from Sun. D. 0. 0.3871. Length of year. T. 0. 0.24084. Cube of the distance. D cubed. 0. 0.05801. Square of the time. T squared. 0. 0.05801. Planet, Venus, mean distance from Sun, D, 0.7233. Length of year, T, 0.61519. Cube of the distance, D cubed, 0.37845. Square of the time, T squared, 0.37846. Planet, Earth, mean distance from Sun, D, 1. Length of year, T, 1. Cube of the distance, d cubed, 1. Square of the time, t squared, 1. Planet, Mars, mean distance from Sun, 1.5237. Length of year, t, 1.8808. Cube of the distance, d cubed, 3.5375. Square of the time, t squared, 3.5375. Planet, Jupiter, mean distance from Sun, D, 5.2028, length of year, T, 11.862, cube of the distance, D cubed, 140.83, square of the time, T squared, 140.70. Planet, Saturn, mean distance from Sun, D, 9.5388, length of year, T, to nine point four five seven cube of the distance d cubed eight six seven point nine two square of the time t squared eight six seven point seven oh the length of the earth's year is three six five point two five six days its mean distance from the sun taken above as unity is ninety two million miles lecture three Kepler and the Laws of Planetary Motion It is difficult to imagine a stronger contrast between two men engaged in the same branch of science than exists between Tycho Brahe, the subject of last lecture, and Kepler, our subject on the present occasion. The one, rich, noble, vigorous, passionate, strong in mechanical ingenuity and experimental skill, but not above the average in theoretical and mathematical power. The other, poor, sickly, devoid of experimental gifts, and unfitted by nature for accurate observation, but strong almost beyond competition in speculative subtlety and innate mathematical perception. The one is the complement of the other, and from the fact of their following each other so closely arose the most surprising benefits to science. 
The outward life of Kepler is to a large extent a mere record of poverty and misfortune. I shall only sketch in its broad features so that we may have more time to attend to his work. He was born, so his biographer assures us, in longitude 29 degrees 7 minutes, latitude 48 degrees 54 minutes, on the 21st of December, 1571. His parents seem to have been of fair condition, but by reason, it is said, of his becoming surety for a friend, the father lost all his slender income and was reduced to keeping a tavern. Young John Kepler was thereupon taken from school and employed as pot-boy between the ages of nine and twelve. He was a sickly lad, subject to violent illnesses from the cradle, so that his life was frequently despaired of. Ultimately, he was sent to a monastic school and thence to the University of Tübingen, where he graduated second on the list. Meanwhile, home affairs had gone to rack and ruin. His father abandoned the home and later died abroad. The mother quarreled with all her relations, including her son John, who is therefore glad to get away as soon as possible. All his connection with astronomy up to this time had been the hearing of the Copernican theory expounded in university lectures and defending it in a college debating society. An astronomical lectureship at Graz, happening to offer itself, he was urged to take it, and agreed to do so, though stipulating that it should not debar him from some more brilliant profession when there was a chance. For astronomy in those days seems to have ranked as a minor science, like mineralogy or meteorology now. It had little of the special dignity with which the labors of Kepler himself were destined so greatly to aid in endowing it. Well, he speedily became a thorough Copernican, and as he had a most singularly restless and inquisitive mind, full of appreciation of everything relating to number and magnitude, was a born speculator and thinker, just as Mozart was a born musician, or Bitter a born calculator, he was agitated by questions such as these. Why are there exactly six planets? Is there any connection between their orbital distances, or between their orbits and the times of describing them? These things tormented him, and he thought about them day and night. It is characteristic of the spirit of the times, this questioning why there should be six planets. Nowadays we should simply record the fact and look out for a seventh. Then some occult property of the number six was groped for, such as that it was equal to one plus two plus three, and likewise equal to one times two times three, and so on. Many fine reasons had been given for the seven planets of the Ptolemaic system, but for the six planets of the Copernican system the reasons were not so cogent. Again, with respect to their successive distances from the sun, some law would seem to regulate their distance, but it was not known. Parenthetically, I may remark that it is not known even now. A crude empirical statement known as Bode's Law is all that has been discovered. Once more, the further the planet, the slower it moved. There seemed to be some law connecting speed and distance. This also Kepler made continual attempts to discover. One of his ideas concerning the law of the successive distances was based on the inscription of a triangle in a circle. If you inscribe in a circle a large number of equilateral triangles, they envelop another circle bearing a definite ratio to the first. These might do for the orbits of two planets. Then try inscribing and circumscribing squares, hexagons, and other figures and see if the circles thus defined would correspond to the several planetary orbits. But they would not give any satisfactory result. Brooding over this disappointment, the idea of trying solid figures suddenly strikes him. What have plain figures to do with the celestial orbits, he cries out? Inscribe the regular solids. And then, brilliant idea, he remembers that there are but five. Euclid had shown 
that there could be only five regular solids. The number evidently corresponds to the gaps between the six planets. The reason of their being only six seems to be attained. This coincidence assures him he is on the right track, and with great enthusiasm and hope, he represents the Earth's orbit by a sphere as the norm and measure of all. Round it he circumscribes a dodecahedron, and puts another sphere round that, which is approximately the orbit of Mars. Round that, again, a tetrahedron, the corners of which mark the sphere of the orbit of Jupiter. Round that sphere, again, he places a cube, which roughly gives the orbit of Saturn. On the other hand, he inscribes in the sphere of the Earth's orbit an icosahedron, and inside the sphere, determined by that, an octahedron, which figures he takes to enclose the spheres of Venus and of Mercury, respectively. The imagined discovery is purely fictitious and accidental. First of all, eight planets are now known, and secondly, their real distances agree only very approximately with Kepler's hypothesis. Nevertheless, the idea gave him great delight. He says, The intense pleasure I have received from this discovery can never be told in words. I regretted no more the time wasted. I tired of no labor. I shun no toil of reckoning, days and nights spent in calculation, until I could see whether my hypothesis would agree with the orbits of Copernicus, or whether my joy was to vanish into air. He then went on to speculate as to the cause of the planet's motion. The old idea was that they were carried round by angels or celestial intelligences. Kepler tried to establish some propelling force emanating from the sun, like the spokes of a windmill. This first book of his brought him into notice and served as an introduction to Tycho and to Galileo. Tycho Brahe was at this time at Prague under the patronage of the Emperor Rudolf, and as he was known to have by far the best planetary observations of any man living, Kepler wrote to him to know if he might come and examine them so as to perfect his theory. Tycho immediately replied, Come, not as a stranger, but as a very welcome friend. Come and share in my observations, with such instruments as I have with me, and as a dearly beloved associate. After this visit, Tycho wrote again, offering him the post of mathematical assistant, which, after hesitation, was accepted. Part of the hesitation Kepler expresses by saying that, for observations his sight was dull, and for mechanical operations his hand was awkward. He suffered much from weak eyes, and dare not expose himself to night air. In all this he was, of course, the antipodes of Tycho, but in mathematical skill he was greatly his superior. On his way to Prague he was seized with one of his periodical illnesses, and all his means were exhausted by the time he could set forward again, so that he had to apply for help to Tycho. It is clear, indeed, that for some time now he subsisted entirely on the bounty of Tycho, and he expresses himself most deeply grateful for all the kindness he received from that noble and distinguished man, the head of the scientific world at that date. To illustrate Tycho's kindness and generosity, I must read you a letter written to him by Kepler. It seems that Kepler, on one of his absences from Prague, driven half mad with poverty and trouble, fell foul of Tycho, whom he thought to be behaving badly in money matters to him and his family, and wrote him a violent letter full of reproaches and insults. Tycho's secretary replied quietly enough, pointing out the groundlessness and ingratitude of the accusation. Kepler repents instantly and replies, Most noble Tycho, these are the words of his letter, 
how shall i enumerate or rightly estimate your benefits conferred on me for two months you have liberally and gratuitously maintained me and my whole family you have provided for all my wishes you have done me every possible kindness you have communicated to me everything you hold most dear no one by word or deed has intentionally injured me in anything in short not to your children your wife or yourself have you shown more indulgence than to me this being so as i am anxious to put on record i cannot reflect without consternation that i should have been so given up by god to my own intemperance as to shut my eyes on all these benefits that instead of modest and respectful gratitude i should indulge for three weeks in continual moroseness towards all your family in headlong passion and the utmost insolence towards yourself who possess so many claims on my veneration from your noble family your extraordinary learning and distinguished reputation whatever i have said or written against the person the fame the honor and the learning of your excellency or whatever in any other way i have injuriously spoken or written if they admit no other more favorable interpretation as to my grief i have spoken and written many things and more than i can remember all and everything i recant and freely and honestly declare and profess to be groundless false and incapable of proof tycho accepted the apology thus heartily rendered and the temporary breach was permanently healed in sixteen o one kepler was appointed imperial mathematician to assist tycho in his calculations the emperor rudolph did a good piece of work in thus maintaining these two eminent men but it is quite clear that it was as astrologers that he valued them and all he cared for in the planetary motions was limited to their supposed effect on his own and his kingdom's destiny he seems to have been politically a weak and superstitious prince who was letting his kingdom get into hopeless confusion and entangling himself in all matter of political complications while bohemia suffered however the world has benefited at his hands and the tables upon which tycho was now engaged are well called the rudolphine tables these tables of planetary motion tycho had always regarded as the main work of his life but he died before they were finished and on his deathbed he entrusted the completion of them to kepler who loyally undertook their charge the imperial funds were by this time however so taxed by wars and other difficulties that the tables could only be proceeded with very slowly a staff of calculators being out of the question in fact kepler could not get even his own salary paid he got orders and promises and drafts on estates for it but when the time came for them to be honored they were worthless and he had no power to enforce his claims so everything but brooding had to be abandoned as too expensive and he proceeded to study optics he gave a very accurate explanation of the action of the human eye and made many hypotheses some of them shrewd and close to the mark concerning the law of refraction of light in dense media but though several minor points of interest turned up nothing of the first magnitude came out of this long research the true law of refraction was discovered some years after by a dutch professor willibrod snell we must now devote a little time to the main work of kepler's life all the time he had been at prague he had been making a severe study of the motion of the planet mars analyzing minutely tycho's books of observations in order to find out if possible the true theory of his motion aristotle had taught that circular motion was the only perfect and natural motion and that the heavenly bodies therefore necessarily moved in circles so firmly had this idea become rooted in men's minds that no one ever seems to have contemplated the possibility 
of its being false or meaningless. When Hipparchus and others found that, as a matter of fact, the planets did not revolve in simple circles, they did not try other curves, as we should at once do now, but they tried combinations of circles, as we saw in Lecture 1. The small circle, carried by a bigger one, was called an epicycle. The carrying circle was called the deferent. If, for any reason, the Earth had to be placed out of the center, the main planetary orbit was called an eccentric, and so on. But, although the planetary paths might be roughly represented by a combination of circles, their speeds could not, on the hypothesis of uniform motion in each circle round the Earth as a fixed body. Hence was introduced the idea of an equant, i.e. an arbitrary point, not the Earth, about which the speed might be uniform. Copernicus, by making the sun the center, had been able to simplify a good deal of this and to abolish the equant. But now that Kepler had the accurate observations of Tycho to refer to, he found immense difficulty in obtaining the true positions of the planets for long together on any such theory. He specially attacked the motion of the planet Mars, because that was sufficiently rapid in its changes for a considerable collection of data to have accumulated with respect to it. He tried all manner of circular orbits for the Earth and for Mars, placing them in all sorts of aspects with respect to the Sun. The problem to be solved was to choose such an orbit and such a law of speed for both the Earth and Mars that a line joining them, produced out to the stars, should always mark correctly the apparent position of Mars as seen from the Earth. He had to arrange the size of the orbits that suited best, then the positions of their centers, both being supposed eccentric with respect to the sun. But he could not get any such arrangement to work with uniform motion about the sun. So he reintroduced the equant, and thus had another variable at his disposal. In fact, two, for he had an equant for the earth, and another for Mars, getting a pattern of the kind suggested in figure 29. The equants might divide the line in any arbitrary ratio. All sorts of combinations had to be tried, the relative positions of the Earth and Mars to be worked out for each, and compared with Tycho's recorded observations. It was easy to get them to agree for a short time, but sooner or later, a discrepancy showed itself. I need not say that all these attempts and gropings, thus briefly summarized, entailed enormous labor, and required not only great pertinacity, but a most singularly constituted mind, that could thus continue groping in the dark without a possible ray of theory to illuminate its search. Grope he did, however, with unexampled diligence. At length, he hit upon a point that seemed nearly right. He thought he had found the truth. But no. Before long, the position of the planet, as calculated and as recorded by Tycho, differed by eight minutes of arc, or about one-eighth of a degree. Could the observations be wrong by this small amount? No. He had known Tycho, and knew that he was never wrong eight minutes in an observation. So he set out the whole weary way again, and said that with those eight minutes he would yet find out the law of the universe. He proceeded to see if by making the planet librate, or the plane of its orbit tilt up and down, anything could be done. He was rewarded by finding that, at any rate, the plane of the orbit did not tilt up and down, it was fixed, and this was a simplification on Copernicus's theory. It is not an absolute fixture, but the changes are very small. At last he thought of giving up the idea 
of uniform circular motion and of trying varying circular motion, say inversely as its distance from the sun. To simplify calculation, he divided the orbit into triangles and tried if making the triangles equal would do. A great piece of luck, they did beautifully. The rate of description of areas, not arcs, is uniform. Over this discovery he greatly rejoices. He feels as though he had been carrying on a war against the planet and had triumphed. But his gratulation was premature. Before long, fresh little errors appeared and grew in importance. Thus he announces it himself, While thus triumphing over Mars, and preparing for him, as for one already vanquished, tabular prisons and equated eccentric fetters, it is buzzed here and there that the victory is vain, and that the war is raging anew as violently as before. For the enemy left at home a despised captive has burst all the chains of the equations and broken forth from the prisons of the tables. Still, a part of the truth had been gained and was not to be abandoned any more. The law of speed was fixed, that which is now known as his second law. But what about the shape of the orbit? Was it, after all, possible that Aristotle and every philosopher since Aristotle had been wrong? That circular motion was not the perfect and natural motion, but that planets might move in some other closed curve? Suppose he tried an oval. Well, there are a great variety of ovals, and several were tried, with the result that they could be made to answer better than a circle, but still were not right. Now, however, the geometrical and mathematical difficulties of calculation, which before had been tedious and oppressive, threatened to become overwhelming, and it is with a rising sense of despondency that Kepler sees his six years unremitting labor leading deeper and deeper into complication. One most disheartening circumstance appeared, viz., that when he made the circuit oval, his law of equable description of areas broke down. That seemed to require the circular orbit, and yet no circular orbit was quite accurate. While thinking and pondering for weeks and months over this new dilemma and complication of difficulties, till his brain reeled, an accidental ray of light broke upon him in a way not now intelligible, or barely intelligible. Half the extreme breadth intercepted between the circle and oval was 429 over 100,000 of the radius, and he remembered that the optical inequality of Mars was also about 429 over 100,000. This coincidence, in his own words, woke him out of sleep, and for some reason or other impelled him instantly to try making the planet oscillate in the diameter of its epicycle instead of revolve around it. A singular idea, but Copernicus had had a similar one to explain the motions of Mercury. Away he started through his calculations again. A long course of work, night and day, was rewarded by finding that he was now able to hit off the motions better than before. But what a singularly complicated motion it was! Could it be expressed no more simply? Yes, the curve, so described by the planet, is a comparatively simple one. It is a special kind of oval, the ellipse. Strange that he had not thought of it before. It was a famous curve, for the Greek geometers had studied it as one of the sections of a cone. But it was not so well known in Kepler's time. The fact that the planets move in it has raised it to the first importance, 
and it is familiar enough to us now. But did it satisfy the law of speed? Could the rate of description of areas be uniform with it? Well, he tried the ellipse, and to his inexpressible delight, he found that it did satisfy the condition of equable description of areas, if the sun was in one focus. So, moving the planet in a selected ellipse, with the sun in one focus, at a speed given by the equable area description, its position agreed with Tycho's observations within the limits of the error of experiment. Mars was finally conquered, and remains in his prison house to this day. The orbit was found. In a paroxysm of delight, Kepler celebrates his victory by a triumphant figure, sketched actually on his geometrical diagram, the diagram which proves that the law of equable description of areas can hold good with an ellipse. The above is a tracing of it. Such is a crude and bald sketch of the steps by which Kepler rose to his great generalizations, the two laws which have immortalized his name. All the complications of epicycle, equant, deferent, eccentric, and the like were swept at once away, and an orbit of striking and beautiful properties substituted. Well might he be called, as he was, the legislator, or law interpreter, of the heavens. He concludes his book on the motions of Mars with a half-comic appeal to the emperor to provide him with the sinews of war for an attack on Mars relations, Father Jupiter, Brother Mercury, and the rest, but the death of his unhappy patron in 1612 put an end to all these schemes, and reduced Kepler to the utmost misery. While at Prague, his salary was in continual arrear, and it was with difficulty that he could provide sustenance for his family. He had been there eleven years, but they had been hard years of poverty, and he could leave without regret were it not that he should have to leave Tycho's instruments and observations behind him. While he was hesitating what best to do, and reduced to the verge of despair, his wife, who had long been suffering from low spirits and despondency, and his three children, were taken ill. One of the sons died of smallpox, and the wife eleven days after of low fever and epilepsy. No money could be got at Prague, so after a short time he accepted a professorship at Linz, and withdrew with his two quite young remaining children. He provided for himself now partly by publishing a prophesizing almanac, a sort of Zadkiel arrangement, a thing which he despised, but the support of which he could not afford to do without. He is continually attacking and throwing sarcasm at astrology, but it was the only thing for which people would pay him, and on it, after a fashion, he lived. We do not find that his circumstances were ever prosperous, and though eight thousand crowns were due to him from Bohemia, he could not manage to get them paid. About this time occurred a singular interruption to his work. His old mother, of whose fierce temper something has already been indicated, had been engaged in a lawsuit for some years near their old home in Württemberg. A change of judge having in process of time occurred. The defendant saw his way to turn the tables on the old lady by accusing her of sorcery. She was sent to prison and contemned to the torture with the usual intelligent idea of extracting a voluntary confession. Kepler had to hurry from Linz to interpose. He succeeded in saving her from the torture, but she remained in prison for a year or so. Her spirit, however, was unbroken, for no sooner was she released than she commenced a fresh action against her accuser. But fresh trouble was averted 
by the death of the poor old dame at the age of nearly eighty. This narration renders the unflagging energy shown by her son in his mathematical wrestlings less surprising. Interspersed with these domestic troubles, and with harassing and unsuccessful attempts to get his rights, he still brooded over his old problem of some possible connection between the distances of the planets from the sun and their times of revolution, i.e. the length of their years. It might well have been that there was no connection, that it was purely imaginary, like his old idea of the law of the successive distances of the planets, and like so many others of the guesses and fancies which he entertained and spent his energies in probing. But fortunately, this time, there was a connection, and he lived to have the joy of discovering it. The connection is this, that if one compares the distance of the different planets from the sun with the length of time they take to go round him, the cube of the respective distances is proportional to the square of the corresponding times. In other words, the ratio of r cubed to t squared for every planet is the same, or again, the length of a planet's year depends on the 3 over 2 th power of its distance from the sun, or, once more, the speed of each planet in its orbit is as the inverse square root of its distance from the sun. The product of the distance into the square of the speed is the same for each planet. This, however stated, is called Kepler's third law. It welds the planets together and shows them to be one system. His rapture on detecting the law was unbounded, and he breaks out into an exulting rhapsody. What I prophesied two and twenty years ago, as soon as I discovered the five solids among the heavenly orbits, what I firmly believed long before I had seen Ptolemy's harmonies, what I had promised my friends in the title of this book, which I named before I was sure of my discovery, what sixteen years ago I urged as a thing to be sought, that for which I joined Tycho Brahe, for which I settled in Prague, for which I have devoted the best part of my life to astronomical contemplations, at length I have brought to light, and recognized its truth beyond my most sanguine expectations. It is not eighteen months since I got the first glimpse of light, three months since the dawn, very few days since the unveiled sun, most admirable to gaze upon, burst upon me. Nothing holds me. I will indulge my sacred fury. I will triumph over mankind by the honest confession that I have stolen the golden vases of the Egyptians to build up a tabernacle for my god far away from the confines of Egypt. If you forgive me, I rejoice. If you are angry, I can bear it. The die is cast, the book is written, to be read either now or by posterity. I care not which. It may well wait a century for a reader, as God has waited six thousand years for an observer. Soon after this great work, his third book appeared. It was an epitome of the Copernican theory a clear and fairly popular exposition of it, which had the honor of being at once suppressed and placed on the list of books prohibited by the Church, side by side with the work of Copernicus himself, De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium. This honor, however, gave Kepler no satisfaction. It rather occasioned him dismay especially as it deprived him of all pecuniary benefit, and made it almost impossible for him to get a publisher to undertake another book. Still he worked on at the Rudolphine tables of Tycho, and ultimately, with some small help from Vienna, completed them. But he could not get the means to print them. 
He applied to the court till he was sick of applying. They lay idle four years. At last he determined to pay for the type himself. What he paid it with, God knows, but he did pay it, and he did bring out the tables, and so was faithful to the behest of his friend. This great publication marks an era in astronomy. They were the first really accurate tables which navigators ever possessed. They were the precursors of our present nautical almanac. After this, the Grand Duke of Tuscany sent Kepler a golden chain, which is interesting inasmuch as it must really have come from Galileo, who was in high favor at the Italian court at this time. Once more Kepler made a determined attempt to get his arrears of salary paid and rescue himself and family from their bitter poverty. He traveled to Prague on purpose, attended the imperial meeting, and pleaded his own cause, but it was all fruitless, and exhausted by the journey, weakened by overstudy, and disheartened by the failure, he caught a fever and died in his fifty-ninth year. His body was buried at Ratisbon, and a century ago a proposal was made to erect a marble monument to his memory, but nothing was done. It matters little one way or the other whether Germany, having almost refused him bread during his life, should a century and a half after his death, offer him a stone. The contiguity of the lives of Kepler and Tycho furnishes a moral too obvious to need pointing out. What Kepler might have achieved, had he been relieved of those ghastly struggles for subsistence, one cannot tell. But this much is clear, that had Tycho been subjected to the same misfortune, instead of being born rich and being assisted by generous and enlightened patrons, he could have accomplished very little. His instruments, his observatory, the tools by which he did his work, would have been impossible for him. Frederick and Sophia of Denmark, and Rudolf of Bohemia, are therefore to be remembered as co-workers with him. Kepler, with his ill health and inferior physical energy, was unable to command the like advantages. Much, nevertheless, he did. More one cannot but feel he might have done had he been properly helped. Besides, the world would have been free from the reproach of accepting the fruits of his bright genius while condemning the worker to a life of misery, relieved only by the beauty of his own thoughts and the ecstasy awakened in him by the harmony and precision of nature. Concerning the method of Kepler, the mode by which he made his discoveries, we must remember that he gives us an account of all the steps, unsuccessful as well as successful, by which he traveled. He maps out his route like a traveler. In fact, he compares himself to Columbus or Magellan, voyaging into unknown lands and recording his wandering route. This being remembered, it will be found that his methods do not differ so utterly from those used by other philosophers in like case. His imagination was perhaps more luxuriant, and was allowed freer play than most men's, but it was nevertheless always controlled by rigid examination and comparison of hypotheses with fact. Brewster says of him, Ardent, restless, burning to distinguish himself by discovery, he attempted everything, and once having obtained a glimpse of a clue, no labor was too hard in following or verifying it. A few of his attempts succeeded. A multitude failed. Those which failed seem to us now fanciful. Those which succeeded appear to us sublime. But his methods were the same. When in search of what really existed, he sometimes found it. When in pursuit of a chimera, he could not but fail. But in either case, 
he displayed the same great qualities and that obstinate perseverance which must conquer all difficulties except those really insurmountable to recognize what he did for astronomy it is necessary for us now to consider some science still in its infancy astronomy is so clear and so thoroughly explored now that it is difficult to put oneself into a contemporary attitude but take some other science still barely developed meteorology for instance the science of the weather the succession of winds and rain sunshine and frost clouds and fog is now very much in the condition of astronomy before kepler we have passed through the stage of ascribing atmospheric disturbances thunderstorms cyclones earthquakes and the like to supernatural agency we have had our copernican era not perhaps brought about by a single individual but still achieved something of the laws of cyclone and anticyclone are known and rude weather predictions across the atlantic are roughly possible barometers and thermometers and anemometers and all their tribe represent the astronomical instruments in the island of huon and our numerous meteorological observations with their continual record of events represent the work of tycho brahe observation is heaped on observation tables are compiled volumes are filled with data the hours of sunshine are recorded the fall of rain the moisture in the air the kind of clouds the temperature millions of facts but where is the kepler to study and brood over them where is the man to spend his life in evolving the beginnings of law and order from the midst of all this chaos perhaps as a man he may not come but his era will come through this stage the science must pass ere it is ready for the commanding intellect of a newton but what a work it will be for the man whoever he be that undertakes it a fearful monotonous grind of calculation hypothesis hypothesis calculation a desperate and groping endeavor to reconcile theories with facts a life of such labor crowned by three brilliant discoveries the world owes and too late recognizes its obligation to the harshly treated german genius kepler end of lecture three recording by rick rodstrom Lecture 4 of Pioneers of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Megan Argo. Pioneers of Science by Sir Oliver Lodge. Lecture 4. Summary of Facts for Lectures 4 and 5. In 1564, Michelangelo died and Galileo was born. In 1642, Galileo died, and Newton was born. Milton lived from 1608 to 1674. For teaching the plurality of worlds, with other heterodox doctrines, and refusing to recant, Bruno, after six years' imprisonment in Rome, was burnt at the stake on the 16th of February, 1600 A.D. A natural death in the dungeons of the Inquisition saved Antonio de Dominis, the explainer of the rainbow, from the same fate, but his body and books were publicly burned in Rome in 1624. The persecution of Galileo began in 1615, became intense in 1632, and so lasted till his death and after. Galileo Galilei, eldest son of Vincenzo de Bonagiuti de Galilei, a noble Florentine, was born at Pisa, 18th of February, 1564. At the age of 17, was sent to the University of Pisa to study medicine. Observed the swing of a pendulum, and applied it to count pulse beats. Read Euclid and Archimedes, and could be kept at medicine no more. At twenty-six was appointed lecturer in mathematics at Pisa. Read Bruno, and became smitten with the Copernican theory. 
controverted the Aristotelians concerning falling bodies at Pisa, hence became unpopular, and accepted a chair at Padua, 1592, invented a thermometer, wrote on astronomy, adopting the Ptolemaic system provisionally, and so opened up a correspondence with Kepler, with whom he formed a friendship, lectured on the new star of 1604, and publicly renounced the old systems of astronomy, invented a calculating compass or Gunther scale, in 1609 invented a telescope, after hearing of a Dutch optician's discovery. Invented a microscope soon after. Rapidly completed a better telescope, and began a survey of the heavens. On the 8th of January, 1610, discovered Jupiter's satellites. Observed the mountains of the moon, and roughly measured their height. Explained the visibility of the new moon by earthshine. Was invited to the Grand Ducal Court of Tuscany by Cosmo de' Medici, and appointed philosopher to that personage. Discovered innumerable new stars, and the nebulae. Observed a triple appearance of Saturn. Discovered the phases of Venus, predicted by Copernicus, and spots on the sun. Wrote on floating bodies. Tried to get his satellites utilised for determining longitude at sea. Went to Rome to defend the Copernican system, then under official discussion, and as a result was formally forbidden ever to teach it. On the accession of Pope Urban VIII, in 1623, Galileo again visited Rome to pay his respects, and was well received. In 1632 appeared his dialogues on the Ptolemaic and Copernican systems. Summoned to Rome, practically imprisoned, and rigorously questioned. Was made to recount 22nd of June, 1633. Forbidden evermore to publish anything, or to teach, or to receive friends. Retired to archetry, in broken-down health. Death of his favourite daughter, Sister Maria Celeste. Wrote and meditated on the laws of motion. Discovered the moon's libration. In 1637 he became blind. The rigour was then slightly relaxed, and many visited him, among them John Milton. Died 8th of January, 1642, aged 78. As a prisoner of the Inquisition, his right to make a will, or to be buried in consecrated ground, was disputed. Many of his manuscripts were destroyed. Galileo, besides being a singularly clear-headed thinker and experimental genius, was also something of a musician, a poet, and an artist. He was full of humour, as well as of solid common sense, and his literary style is brilliant. Of his scientific achievements, those now reckoned most weighty, are the discovery of the laws of motion, and the laying of the foundations of mechanics. Particulars of Jupiter satellites illustrating their obedience to Kepler's third law. Satellite 1 Diameter 2,437 miles. Time of revolution, 42.47 hours. Distance from Jupiter, 6.049 Jovian radii. Period squared, 1,803.7. Distance cubed, 221.44. Period squared divided by distance cubed, 8.149. Satellite 2. Diameter 2,188 miles. Time of revolution, 85.23 hours. Distance from Jupiter, 9.623 Jovian radii. Period squared, 7,264.1. Distance cubed, 891.11. Period squared divided by distance cubed, 8.152. Satellite 3. Diameter, 3,575 miles. Time of revolution, 177.72 hours. Distance from Jupiter, 15.350 Jovian radii. Period squared, 29,488. Distance cubed, 3,916.8. Period squared divided by distance cubed, 8.153. Satellite 4. Diameter, 3,059 miles. Time of revolution, 400.53 hours. Distance from Jupiter, 26.998 Jovian radii. Period squared, 160,426. Distance cubed, 19,679. Period squared divided by distance cubed, 8.152. The diameter of Jupiter is 85,823 miles. Falling bodies. Since all bodies fall at the same rate, except for the disturbing effect of the resistance of the air, a statement of their rates of fall is of interest. 
In one second, a freely falling body near the earth is found to drop sixteen feet. In two seconds, it drops sixty-four feet altogether. There's sixteen feet in the first, and forty-eight feet in the second, because at the beginning of every second after the first, it has the accumulated velocity of preceding seconds. The height fallen by a dropped body is not proportional to the time simply, but to what is rather absurdly called the square of the time, i.e. the time multiplied by itself. For instance, in three seconds it drops nine times sixteen equals one hundred and forty-four feet. In four seconds, sixteen times sixteen, or two hundred and fifty-six feet, and so on. The distance is travelled in one, two, three, four, etc. seconds, by a body dropped from rest, and not appreciably resisted by the air, or one, four, nine, sixteen, twenty-five, etc., respectively, each multiplied by the constant sixteen feet. Another way of stating the law is to say that the heights travelled in successive seconds proceed in the proportion one, three, five, seven, nine, and so on, again multiplied by sixteen feet in each case. All this was experimentally established by Galileo. A body takes half a second to drop four feet, and a quarter of a second to drop one foot. The easiest way of estimating a quarter of a second with some accuracy is to drop a bullet one foot. A bullet thrown or shot in any direction falls just as much as if it merely dropped, but instead of falling from the starting point, it drops vertically from the line of fire. See figure 35. The rate of fall depends on the intensity of gravity. If it could be doubled, a body would fall twice as far in the same time. But to make it fall a given distance in half the time, the intensity of gravity would have to be quadrupled. At a place where the intensity of gravity is one three thousand six hundredths of what it is here, a body would fall as far in a minute as it now falls in a second. Such a place occurs at about the distance of the moon. The fact that the height fallen through is proportional to the square of the time proves that the attraction of the earth, or the intensity of gravity, is sensibly constant throughout ordinary small ranges. Over great distances of fall, gravity cannot be considered constant. So for things falling through great spaces, the Galilean law of the square of the time does not hold. The fact that things near the earth fall sixteen feet in the first second proves that the intensity of ordinary terrestrial gravity is thirty-two British units of force per pound of matter. The fact that all bodies fall at the same rate, when the resistance of the air is eliminated, proves that weight is proportional to mass, or, more explicitly, that the gravitative attraction of the earth on matter near its surface depends on the amount of that matter, as estimated by its inertia, and on nothing else. Lecture 4. Galileo and the Invention of the Telescope Contemporary with the life of Kepler, but overlapping it at both ends, comes the great and eventful life of Galileo Galilei, a man whose influence on the development of human thought has been greater than that of any man whom we have yet considered, and upon whom, therefore, it is necessary for us, in order to carry out the plan of these lectures, to bestow much time. A man of great and wide culture, a so-called universal genius, it is as an experimental philosopher that he takes the first rank. In this capacity he must be placed alongside of Archimedes, and it is pretty certain that between the two there was no man of magnitude equal to either in experimental philosophy. It is perhaps too bold a speculation, but I venture to doubt whether in succeeding generations we will find his equal in the domain of purely experimental science until we come to Faraday. Faraday was no doubt his superior, but I know of no other of whom the like can unhesitatingly be said. In mathematical and deductive science, of course, it is quite otherwise. Kepler, for instance, and many men before and since, have far excelled Galileo in mathematical skill and power, though at the same time his achievements in this department are by no means to be despised. Born at Pisa three centuries ago, on the very day that Michelangelo lay dying in Rome, he inherited from his father a noble name, cultivated tastes, a keen love of truth, and an impoverished patrimony. Vincenzo de Galilei, a descendant of the important Bonaduti family, was himself a mathematician and a musician, and in a book of his still extant he declares himself in favour of free and open inquiry into scientific matters, unrestrained by the weight of authority and tradition. In all probability the son imbibed these precepts, certainly he acted on them. Vincenzo, having himself experienced the unremunerative character of scientific work, had a horror of his son's taking to it, especially as, in his boyhood, he was always constructing ingenious mechanical toys, and exhibiting other marks of precocity. So the son was destined for business, to be, in fact, a cloth dealer. 
but he was to receive a good education first, and was sent to an excellent convent school. Here he made rapid progress, and soon excelled in all branches of classics and literature. He delighted in poetry, and in later years wrote several essays on Dante, Tasso, and Ariosto, besides composing some tolerable poems himself. He played skilfully on several musical instruments, especially on the lute, of which indeed he became a master, and on which he solaced himself when quite an old man. Besides this, he seems to have had some skill as an artist, which was useful afterwards in illustrating his discoveries, and to have had a fine sensibility as an art critic, for we find several eminent painters of that day acknowledging the value of the opinion of the young Galileo. Perceiving all this display of ability, the father wisely came to the conclusion that the selling of woollen stuffs would hardly satisfy his aspirations for long, and that it was worth a sacrifice to send him to the university. So to the university of his native town he went, with the avowed object of studying medicine, that career seeming the most likely to be profitable. Old Vincenzo's horror of mathematics or science as a means of obtaining a livelihood is justified by the fact that while the university professor of medicine received two thousand scudi a year, the professor of mathematics had only sixty, that is, thirteen pounds a year, or seven and a half pence a day. So the son had been kept properly ignorant of such poverty-stricken subjects, and to study medicine he went. But his natural bent showed itself even here, for praying one day in the cathedral like a good Catholic as he was all his life, his attention was arrested by some great lamp, which, after lighting it, the verger had left swinging to and fro. Galileo proceeded to time its swings by the only watch he possessed, viz. his own pulse. He noticed that the time of swing remained as near as he could tell the same, notwithstanding the fact that the swings were getting smaller and smaller. By subsequent experiment he verified the law, and the isochronism of the pendulum was discovered. An immensely important practical discovery this, for upon it all modern clocks are based, and Huygens soon applied it to the astronomical clock, which, up to that time, had been a crude and quite untrustworthy instrument. The best clock which Tycho Brahe could get for his observatory was inferior to one that may now be purchased for a few shillings, and this change is owing to the discovery of the pendulum by Galileo. Not that he applied it to clocks, he was not thinking of astronomy, he was thinking of medicine, and wanted to count people's pulses. The pendulum served, and pulsilogies, as they were called, were thus introduced to, and used by medical practitioners. The Tuscan court came to Pisa for the summer months, for it was then a seaside place, and among the suite was Ostilio Ricci, a distinguished mathematician, an old friend of the Galileo family. The youth visited him, and one day, it is said, had a lesson in Euclid being given by Ricci to the pages, while he stood outside the door entranced. Anyhow, he implored Ricci to help him into some knowledge of mathematics, and the old man willingly consented. So he mastered Euclid, and passed on to Archimedes, for whom he acquired a great veneration. His father soon heard of this obnoxious proclivity, and did what he could to divert him back to medicine again. But it was no use. Underneath his Galen and Hippocrates were secreted copies of Euclid and Archimedes, to be studied at every available opportunity. Old Vincenzo perceived the bent of genius to be too strong for him, and at last gave way. With prodigious rapidity, the released philosopher now assimilated the elements of mathematics and physics, and at twenty-six we find him appointed for three years to the university chair of mathematics, and enjoying the paternally dreaded stipend of seven and a half pence a day. Now it was that he pondered over the laws of falling bodies. He verified, by experiment, the fact that the velocity acquired by falling down any slope of given height was independent of the angle of the slope. Also that the height fallen through was proportional to the square of the time. Another thing he found experimentally was that all bodies, heavy and light, fell at the same rate, striking the ground at the same time. Now this was clean contrary to what had been taught. The physics of those days were a simple reproduction of statements in old books. Aristotle had asserted certain things to be true, and these were universally believed. No one thought of trying the thing to see if it really were so. The idea of making an experiment would have savoured of impiety, because it seemed to tend towards scepticism and to cast a doubt on a reverend authority. Young Galileo, with all the energy and imprudence of youth, what a blessing that youth has a little imprudence and disregard of consequences in pursuing a high ideal, as soon as he perceived that his instructors were wrong on the subject of falling bodies, instantly informed them of the fact. Whether he expected them to be pleased or not is a question. Anyhow, they were not pleased, but were much annoyed by his impertinent arrogance. 
it is, perhaps, difficult for us now to appreciate precisely their position. These doctrines of antiquity, which had come down hoary with age, and the discovery of which had reawakened learning and quickened intellectual life, were accepted less as a science or a philosophy than as a religion. Had they regarded Aristotle as a verbally inspired writer, they could not have received his statements with more unhesitating conviction. In any dispute as to a question of fact, such as the one before us concerning the laws of falling bodies, the method was not to make an experiment, but to turn over the pages of Aristotle, and he who could quote chapter and verse of this great writer was held to settle the question, and raise it above the reach of controversy. It is very necessary for us to realise this state of things clearly, because otherwise the attitude of the learned of these days towards every new discovery seems stupid and almost insane. They had a crystallised system of truth, perfect, symmetrical. It wanted no novelty, no additions. Every additional growth was an imperfection, an excrescence, a deformity. Progress was unnecessary and undesired. The Church had a rigid system of dogma, which must be accepted in its entirety on pain of being treated as a heretic. Philosophers had a cast-iron system of truth to match, a system founded upon Aristotle, and so interwoven with the great theological dogmas that to question one was almost equivalent to casting doubt upon the other. In such an atmosphere true science was impossible. The lifeblood of science is growth, expansion, freedom, development. Before it could appear it must throw off those old shackles of centuries. It must burst its old skin and emerge, worn with the struggle, weakly and unprotected but free and able to grow and to expand. The conflict was inevitable, and it was severe. Is it over yet? I fear not quite, though so nearly as to disturb science hardly at all. Then it was different, it was terrible. Honour to the men who bore the first shock of the battle. Now Aristotle had said that bodies fell at rates depending on their weight. A five-pound weight would fall five times as quick as a one-pound weight a fifty-pound weight fifty times as quick, and so on. Why he said so nobody knows. He cannot have tried. He was not above trying experiments, like his smaller disciples, but probably it never occurred to him to doubt the fact. It seemed so natural that a heavy body should fall quicker than a light one, and perhaps he thought of a stone and a feather, and was satisfied. Galileo, however, asserted that the weight did not matter a bit, that everything fell at the same rate, even a stone and a feather, but for the resistance of the air and would reach the ground in the same time. And he was not content to be pooh-poohed and snubbed. He knew he was right, and he was determined to make everyone see the facts as he saw them. So one morning, before the assembled university, he ascended the famous leaning tower, taking with him a one hundred pound shot and a one pound shot. He balanced them on the edge of the tower, and let them drop together. Together they fell, and together they struck the ground. The simultaneous clang of those two weights sounded the death knell of the old system of philosophy, and heralded the birth of the new. But was the change sudden? Were his opponents convinced? Not a jot. Though they had seen with their eyes, and heard with their ears, the full light of heaven shining upon them, they went back muttering and discontented to their musty old volumes and their garrets, there to invent occult reasons for denying the validity of the observation, and for referring it to some unknown disturbing cause. They saw that if they gave way on this one point, they would be letting go their anchorage, and henceforward would be liable to drift along with the tide, not knowing whither. They dared not do this. No, they must cling to the old traditions. They could not cast away their rotting ropes and sail out onto the free ocean of God's truth in a spirit of fearless faith. Yet they had received a shock, as by a breath of fresh salt breeze and a dash of spray in their faces, they had been awakened out of their comfortable lethargy. They felt the approach of a new era. Yes, it was a shock, and they hated the young Galileo for giving it them, hated him with the sullen hatred of men who fight for a lost and dying cause. We need scarcely blame these men, at least we need not blame them over much. To say that they acted as they did is to say that they were human, were narrow-minded, and were the apostles of a lost cause. But they could not know this, they had no experience of the past to guide them. The conditions under which they found themselves were novel, and had to be met for the first time. Conduct which was excusable then would be unpardonable now, in the light of all this experience to guide us. Are there any now who practically repeat their error, and resist new truth, who cling to any old anchorage of dogma, and refuse to rise with the tide of advancing knowledge? There may be some even now. 
Well, the unpopularity of Galileo smouldered for a time, until, by another noble imprudence, he managed to offend a semi-royal personage, Giovanni de' Medici, by giving his real opinion, when consulted, about a machine which de' Medici had invented for cleaning out the harbour of Leghorn. He said it was as useless as it in fact turned out to be. Through the influence of the mortified inventor he lost favour at court, and his enemies took advantage of the fact to render his chair untenable. He resigned before his three years were up, and retired to Florence. His father at this time died, and the family were left in narrow circumstances. He had a brother and three sisters to provide for. He was offered a professorship at Padua for six years by the Senate of Venice, and willingly accepted it. Now began a very successful career. His introductory address was marked by brilliant eloquence, and his lectures soon acquired fame. He wrote for his pupils on the laws of motion, on fortifications, on sundials, on mechanics, and on the celestial globe. Some of these papers are now lost, others have been printed during the present century. Kepler sent him a copy of his new book, Mysterium Cosmographicum, and Galileo, in thanking him for it, writes in the following letter. I count myself happy, in the search after truth, to have so great an ally as yourself, and one who is so great a friend of the truth itself. It is really pitiful that there are so few who seek truth, and who do not pursue a perverse method of philosophizing. But this is not the place to mourn over the miseries of our times, but to congratulate you on your splendid discoveries in confirmation of truth. I shall read your book to the end, sure of finding much that is excellent in it. I shall do so with the more pleasure, because I have been for many years an adherent of the Copernican system, and it explains to me the causes of many of the appearances of nature which are quite unintelligible on the commonly accepted hypothesis. I have collected many arguments for the purpose of refuting the latter, but I do not venture to bring them to the light of publicity, for fear of sharing the fate of our master, Copernicus, who, although he has earned immortal fame with some, yet with very many, so great is the number of fools, has become an object of ridicule and scorn. I should certainly venture to publish my speculations, if there were more people like you. But this not being the case, I refrain from such an undertaking." Kepler urged him to publish his arguments in favour of the Copernican theory, but he hesitated for the present, knowing that his declaration would be received with ridicule and opposition, and thinking it wiser to get rather more firmly seated in his chair before encountering the storm of controversy. The six years passed away, and the Venetian Senate, anxious not to lose so bright an ornament, renewed his appointment for another six years at a largely increased salary. Soon after this appeared a new star, the Stella Nova of 1604. Not the one Tycho had seen, that was in 1572, but the same that Kepler was so much interested in. Galileo gave a course of three lectures upon it to a great audience. At the first the lecture was overcrowded, so he had to adjourn to a hall holding one thousand persons. At the next he had to lecture in the open air. He took occasion to rebuke his hearers for thronging to hear about an ephemeral novelty, while for the much more wonderful and important truths about the permanent stars and facts of nature they had but deaf ears. But the main point he brought out concerning the new star was that it upset the received Aristotelian doctrine of the immutability of the heavens. According to that doctrine the heavens were unchangeable, perfect, subject neither to growth nor to decay. Here was a body, not a meteor, but a real distant star, which had not been visible, and which would shortly fade away again, but which, meanwhile, was brighter than Jupiter. The staff of petrified professorial wisdom were annoyed at the appearance of the star, still more at Galileo's calling public attention to it, and controversy began at Padua. However, he accepted it, and now boldly threw down the gauntlet in favour of the Copernican theory, utterly repudiating the old Ptolemaic system which up to that time he had taught in the schools, according to established custom. The earth, no longer the only world to which all else in the firmament were obsequious attendants, but a mere insignificant speck among the host of heaven. Man, no longer the centre and synosia of creation, but, as it were, an insect crawling on the surface of this little speck. All this not set down in crab Latin, in dry folios for a few learned monks, as in Copernicus's time but promulgated and argued in rich Italian, illustrated by analogy, by experiment, and with cultured wit, taught not to a few scholars here and there in musty libraries, 
but proclaimed in the vernacular to the whole populace with all the energy and enthusiasm of a recent convert and a master of language had a bombshell been exploded amongst the fossilized professors it had been less disturbing but there was worse in store for them a dutch optician hans lippergy by name of middleburg had in his shop a curious toy rigged up it is said by an apprentice and made out of a couple of spectacle lenses whereby if one looked through it the weathercock of a neighbouring church spire was seen nearer and upside down the tale goes that the marquis spinola happening to call at the shop was struck with the toy and bought it he showed it to prince maurice of nassau who thought of using it for military reconnoitring all this is trivial what is important is that some faint and inaccurate echo of this news found its way to padua and into the ears of galileo the seed fell on good soil all that night he sat up and pondered he knew about lenses and magnifying glasses he had read kepler's theory of the eye and had himself lectured on optics could he not hit on the device and make an instrument capable of bringing the heavenly bodies nearer who knew what marvels he might not so perceive by morning he had some schemes ready to try and one of them was successful singularly enough it was not the same plan as the dutch opticians it was another mode of achieving the same end he took an old small organ pipe jammed a suitably chosen spectacle glass into either end one convex and the other concave and behold he had the half of a wretchedly bad opera glass capable of magnifying three times it was better than the dutchman's however it did not invert it is easy to understand the general principle of a telescope a general knowledge of the common magnifying glass may be assumed roger bacon knew about lenses and the ancients often refer to them though usually as burning glasses the magnifying power of globes of water must have been noticed soon after the discovery of glass and the art of working it a magnifying glass is most simply thought of as an additional lens to the eye the eye has a lens by which ordinary vision is accomplished an extra glass lens strengthens it and enables objects to be seen nearer and therefore apparently bigger but to apply a magnifying glass to distant objects is impossible in order to magnify distant objects another function of lenses has also to be employed viz their power of forming real images the power on which their use as burning glasses depends for the best focus is an image of the sun although the object itself is inaccessible the image of it is by no means so and to the image a magnifier can be applied this is exactly what is done in the telescope the object glass or large lens forms an image which is then looked at through a magnifying glass or eyepiece of course the image is nothing like so big as the object for astronomical objects it is almost infinitely less still it is an exact representation at an accessible place and no one expects a telescope to show distant bodies as big as they really are all it does is to show them bigger than they could be seen without it but if the objects are not distant the same principle may still be applied and two lenses may be used one to form an image the other to magnify it only if the object can be put where we please we can easily place it so that its image is already much bigger than the object even before magnification by the eye lens this is the compound microscope the invention of which soon followed the telescope in fact the two instruments shade off into one another so that the reading telescope or a reading microscope of a laboratory reading thermometers and small divisions generally goes by either name at random the arrangement so far described depicts things on the retina the unaccustomed way up by using a concave glass instead of a convex and placing it so as to prevent any image being formed except on the retina direct this inconvenience is avoided such a thing as galileo made may now be bought at a toy shop for i suppose half a crown and yet what a potentiality lay in that glazed optic tube as milton called it away he went with it to venice and showed it to the signoria to their great astonishment many noblemen and senators says galileo though of advanced age mounted to the top of one of the highest towers to watch the ships which were visible through my glass two hours before they were seen entering the harbour for it makes a thing fifty miles off as near and clear as if it were only five among the people too the instrument excited the greatest astonishment and interest so that he was nearly mobbed the senate hinted to him that a present of the instrument would not be unacceptable so galileo took the hint and made another for them they immediately doubled his salary at padua making it one thousand florins and confirmed him in the enjoyment of it for life he now eagerly began the construction of a larger and better instrument 
grinding the lenses with his own hands with consummate skill, he succeeded in making a telescope magnifying thirty times. Thus equipped, he was ready to begin a survey of the heavens. The first object he carefully examined was naturally the moon. He found there everything at first sight very like the earth, mountains and valleys, craters and plains, rocks, and apparently seas. You may imagine the hostility excited amongst the Aristotelian philosophers, especially, no doubt, those he had left behind at Pisa, on the ground of his spoiling the pure, smooth, crystalline, celestial face of the moon as they had thought it, and making it harsh and rugged, unlike so vile and ignoble a body as the earth. He went further, however, into heterodoxy than this. He not only made the moon like the earth, but he made the earth shine like the moon. The visibility of the old moon in the new moon's arms, he explained by earthshine. Leonardo had given the same explanation a century before. Now one of the many stock arguments against Copernican theory of the earth being a planet like the rest was that the earth was dull and dark and did not shine. Galileo argued that it shone just as much as the moon does, and in fact rather more, especially if it be covered with clouds. One reason of the peculiar brilliancy of Venus is that she is a very cloudy planet. Seen from the moon, the earth would look exactly as the moon does to us, only a little brighter, and sixteen times as big, four times the diameter. Wherever Galileo turned his telescope, new stars appeared. The Milky Way, which had so puzzled the ancients, was found to be composed of stars. Stars that appeared single to the eye, were some of them found to be double, and at intervals were found hazy nebulous wisps, some of which seemed to be star clusters, while others seemed only a fleecy cloud. Now we come to his most brilliant, at least his most sensational, discovery. Examining Jupiter minutely on January the 7th, 1610, he noticed three little stars near it, which he noted down as fixing its then position. On the following night, Jupiter had moved to the other side of the three stars. This was natural enough, but was it moving the right way? On examination it appeared not. Was it possible the tables were wrong? The next evening was cloudy, and he had to curb his feverish impatience. On the tenth there were only two, and those on the other side. On the eleventh, two again, but one bigger than the other. On the twelfth the three reappeared, and on the thirteenth there were four. No more appeared. Jupiter, then, had moons like the earth, four of them, in fact, and they revolved round him in periods which were soon determined. The reason why they were not all visible at first, and why their visibility so rapidly changes, is because they revolve around him almost in the plane of our vision, so that sometimes they are in front, and sometimes behind him, while again at other times they plunge into his shadow, and are thus eclipsed from the light of the sun which enables us to see them. A large modern telescope will show the moons when in front of Jupiter, but small telescopes will only show them when clear of the disk and shadow. Often all four can thus be seen but three or two is a very common amount of visibility. Quite a small telescope, such as a ship's telescope, if held steadily, suffices to show the satellites of Jupiter, and very interesting objects they are. They are of habitable size, and may be important worlds for all we know to the contrary. The news of the discovery soon spread, and excited the greatest interest and astonishment. Many, of course, refused to believe it. Some there were, who, having been shown them, refused to believe their eyes, and asserted that although the telescope acted well enough for terrestrial objects, it was altogether false and illusory when applied to the heavens. Others took the safer ground of refusing to look through the glass. One of these who would not look at the satellites happened to die soon afterward. I hope, says Galileo, that he saw them on his way to heaven. The way in which Kepler received the news is characteristic, though by adding four to the supposed number of planets it might have seemed to upset his notions about the five regular solids. He says, I was sitting idle at home thinking of you, most excellent Galileo, and your letters, when the news was brought me of the discovery of four planets by the help of the double eyeglass. Watchenfels stopped his carriage at my door to tell me, when such a fit of wonder seized me at a report which seemed so very absurd, and I was thrown into such agitation at seeing an old dispute between us decided in this way, that between his joy, my colouring, and the laughter of us both, confounded as we were by such a novelty, we were hardly capable, he of speaking, or I of listening. On our separating, I immediately fell into thinking how there could be any addition to the number of planets without overturning my Mysterium Cosmographicon, 
published thirteen years ago, according to which Euclid's five regular solids do not allow more than six planets round the sun. But I am so far from disbelieving the existence of the four circumjovial planets, that I long for a telescope to anticipate you, if possible, in discovering two around Mars, as the proportion seems to me to require, six or eight around Saturn, and one each around Mercury and Venus. As an illustration of the opposite school, I will take the following extract from Francesco Sizzi, a Florentine astronomer, who argues against the discovery thus. There are seven windows in the head, two nostrils, two eyes, two ears, and a mouth. So in the heavens there are two favourable stars, two unpropitious, two luminaries, and Mercury alone undecided and indifferent, from which, and many other similar phenomena of nature, such as the seven metals, etc., which it were tedious to enumerate, we gather that the number of planets is necessarily seven. Moreover, the satellites are invisible to the naked eye, and therefore can have no influence on the earth, and therefore would be useless, and therefore do not exist. Besides, the Jews and other ancient nations, as well as modern Europeans, have adopted the division of the week into seven days, and have named them for the seven planets. Now if we increase the number of planets, this whole system falls to the ground. To these arguments, Galileo replied that whatever their force might be as a reason for believing beforehand, that no more than seven planets would be discovered, they hardly seemed of sufficient weight to destroy the new ones when actually seen. Writing to Kepler at this time, Galileo ejaculates, "'Oh, my dear Kepler, how I wish that we could have one hearty laugh together! Here at Padua is the principal professor of philosophy, whom I have repeatedly and urgently requested to look at the moon and planets through my glass, which he pertinaciously refuses to do.' Why are you not here? What shouts of laughter we should have at this glorious folly! And to hear the professor of philosophy at Pisa labouring before the Grand Duke with logical arguments, as if with magical incantations, to charm the new planets out of the sky! A young German protégé of Kepler, Martin Hawkey, was travelling in Italy, and meeting Galileo at Bologna, was favoured with a view through his telescope. But supposing that Kepler must necessarily be jealous of such great discoveries, and thinking to please him, he writes, I cannot tell what to think about these observations. They are stupendous, they are wonderful, but whether they are true or false I cannot tell. He concludes, I will never concede his four new planets to that Italian from Padua, though I die for it. So he published a pamphlet asserting that reflected rays and optical illusions were the sole cause of the appearance, and that the only use of the imaginary planets was to gratify Galileo's thirst for gold and notoriety. When, after this performance, he paid a visit to his old instructor Kepler, he got a reception which astonished him. However, he pleaded so hard to be forgiven that Kepler restored him to partial favour, on this condition, that he was to look again at the satellites, and this time to see them, and own that they were there. By degrees, the enemies of Galileo were compelled to confess to the truth of the discovery, and the next step was to outdo him. Shiner counted five, Wright and nine, and others went as high as twelve. Some of these were imaginary, some were fixed stars, and four satellites only are known to this day. Here, close to the summit of his greatness, we must leave him for a time. A few steps more, and he will be on the brow of the hill, a short piece of table-land, and then the descent begins. End of Lecture 4 Read by Maganago Lecture 5 of Pioneers of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Megan Argo. Pioneers of Science by Sir Oliver Lodge. Lecture 5 Galileo and the Inquisition. One sinister event occurred while Galileo was at Padua, some time before the era we have now arrived at, before the invention of the telescope two years, indeed, after he had first gone to Padua, an event not directly concerning Galileo, but which I must mention, because it must have shadowed his life, both at the time and long afterwards. It was the execution of Giordano Bruno for heresy. This eminent philosopher had travelled largely, had lived some time in England, and had acquired new and heterodox views on a variety of subjects, and did not hesitate to propound them, even after he had returned to Italy. The Copernican doctrine of the motion of the earth was one of his obnoxious heresies. Being persecuted to some extent by the Church, Bruno took refuge in Venice, 
a free republic almost independent of the papacy, where he felt himself safe. Galileo was at Padua hard by. The University of Padua was under the government of the Senate of Venice. The two men must, in all probability, have met. Well, the Inquisition at Rome sent messengers to Venice, with a demand for the extradition of Bruno. They wanted him at Rome to try him for heresy. In a moment of miserable weakness, the Venetian Republic gave him up, and Bruno was taken to Rome. There he was tried, and cast into the dungeons for six years, and because he entirely refused to recant, was at length delivered over to the secular arm and burned at the stake on the 16th of February, Anno Domini, 1600. This event could not but have cast a gloom over the mind of lovers and expounders of truth, and the lesson probably sank deep into Galileo's soul. In dealing with these historic events, will you allow me to repudiate once for all the slightest sectarian bias or meaning? I have nothing to do with Catholic or Protestant as such. I have nothing to do with the Church of Rome as such. I am dealing with the history of science. But historically, at one period, science and the Church came into conflict. It was not specially one Church rather than another. It was the Church in general, the only one that then existed in those countries. Historically, I say, they came into conflict, and historically the Church was the conqueror. It got its way, and science, in the persons of Bruno, Galileo, and several others, was vanquished. Such being the facts, there is no help but to mention them in dealing with the history of science. Doubtless now the Church regards it as an unhappy victory, and gladly would ignore this painful struggle. This, however, is impossible. With their creed the churchmen of that day could act in no other way. They were bound to prosecute heresy, and they were bound to conquer in the struggle, or be themselves shattered. But let me insist on the fact that no one accuses the ecclesiastical courts of crime or evil motives. They attacked heresy after their manner, as the civil courts attacked witchcraft after their manner. Both erred grievously, but both acted with the best intentions. We must remember, moreover, that his doctrines were scientifically heterodox, and the university professors of that day were probably quite as ready to condemn them as the church was. To realise the position, we must think of some subjects which, to-day, are scientifically heterodox, and of the customary attitude adopted towards them by persons of widely differing creeds. If it be contended now, as it is, that the ecclesiastics treated Galileo well, I admit it freely, they treated him as well as they possibly could. They overcame him, and he recanted, but if he had not recanted, if he had persisted in his heresy, they would, well, they would still have treated his soul well, but they would have set fire to his body. Their mistake consisted not in cruelty, but in supposing themselves the arbiters of eternal truth, and by no amount of slurring and glossing over facts can they evade the responsibility assumed by them on account of this mistaken attitude. I am not here attacking the dogma of papal infallibility. It is, historically, I believe, quite unaffected by the controversy respecting the motion of the earth, no papal edict ex cathedra having been promulgated on the subject. We left Galileo standing at his telescope and beginning his survey of the heavens. We followed him, indeed, through a few of his first great discoveries, the discovery of the mountains and other variety of surface on the moon, of the nebulae and a multitude of faint stars, and lastly of the four satellites of Jupiter. This latter discovery made an immense sensation, and contributed its share to his removal from Padua, which quickly followed it, as I shall shortly narrate. But first I think it will be best to continue our survey of his astronomical discoveries, without regard to the place whence they were made. Before the end of the year, Galileo had made another discovery, this time on Saturn. But to guard against the host of plagiarists and impostors, he published it in the form of an anagram, which, at the request of the Emperor Rudolf, a request probably inspired by Kepler, he interpreted. It ran thus. The furthest planet is triple. Very soon after, he found that Venus was changing from a full moon to a half moon appearance. He announced this also by an anagram and waited till it should become a crescent, which it did. This was a dreadful blow to the anti-Copernicans, for it removed the last lingering difficulty to the reception of the Copernican doctrine. Copernicus had predicted, indeed, a hundred years before, that, if ever our powers of sight were sufficiently enhanced, Venus and Mercury would be seen to have phases like the moon, and now Galileo, with his telescope, verifies the prediction to the letter. Here was a triumph for the grand old monk, and a bitter morsel for his opponents. Castelli writes, This must now convince the most obstinate. But Galileo, with more experience, replies, 
you almost make me laugh by saying that these clear observations are sufficient to convince the most obstinate. It seems you have yet to learn that long ago the observations were enough to convince those who are capable of reasoning, and those who wish to learn the truth, but that to convince the obstinate, and those who care for nothing beyond the vain applause of the senseless vulgar, not even the testimony of the stars would suffice, were they to descend on earth to speak for themselves. Let us, then, endeavour to procure some knowledge for ourselves, and rest contented with this sole satisfaction, but of advancing in popular opinion, or of gaining the assent of the book philosophers, let us abandon both the hope and the desire. What a year's work it had been! In twelve months observational astronomy had made such a bound as it has never made before or since. Why did not others make any of these observations? Because no one could make telescopes like Galileo. He gathered pupils round him, however, and taught them how to work the lenses, so that gradually these instruments penetrated Europe, and astronomers everywhere verified his splendid discoveries. But still he worked on, and by March in the very next year he saw something still more hateful to the Aristotelian philosophers, viz. spots on the sun. If anything was pure and perfect it was the sun, they said. Was this impostor going to blacken its face too? Well, there they were. They slowly formed and changed, and by moving altogether showed him that the sun rotated about once a month. Before taking leave of Galileo's astronomical researches, I must mention an observation made at the end of 1612, that the apparent triplicity of Saturn, figure 46, had vanished. Looking on Saturn within these few days, I found it solitary, without the assistance of its accustomed stars, and in short perfectly round and defined, like Jupiter, and such it still remains. Now what can be said of so strange a metamorphosis? Are perhaps the two smaller stars consumed like spots on the sun? Have they suddenly vanished and fled, or has Saturn devoured his own children? Or was the appearance indeed fraud and illusion, with which the glasses have so long time mocked me, and so many others who have so often observed with me? Now perhaps the time is come to revive the withering hopes of those who, guided by more profound contemplations, have fathomed all the fallacies of the new observations, and recognised their impossibility. I cannot resolve what to say in a chance so strange, so new, so unexpected. The shortness of time, the unexampled occurrence, the weakness of my intellect, the terror of being mistaken, have greatly confounded me. However, he plucked up courage, and conjectured that the two attendants would reappear, by revolving round the planet. The real reason of their disappearance is well known to us now. The plane of Saturn's rings oscillates slowly about our line of sight, and so we sometimes see them edgeways, and sometimes with a moderate amount of obliquity. The rings are so thin, that when turned precisely edgeways, they become invisible. The two imaginary attendants were the most conspicuous portions of the ring, subsequently called Anse. I have thought it better not to interrupt this catalogue of brilliant discoveries by any biographical details, but we must now retrace our steps to the years 1609 and 1610, the era of the invention of the telescope. By this time Galileo had been eighteen years at Padua, and like many another man in like case, was getting rather tired of continual lecturing. Moreover, he felt so full of ideas that he longed to have a better opportunity of following them up, and more time for thinking them out. Now in the holidays he had been accustomed to return to his family home at Pisa, and there to come a good deal into contact with the Grand Ducal House of Tuscany. Young Cosmo de' Medici became, in fact, his pupil, and arrived at man's estate with the highest opinion of the philosopher. This young man had now come to the throne as Cosmo II, and to him Galileo wrote, saying how much he should like more time and leisure, how full he was of discoveries if only he had the chance of a reasonable income without the necessity of consuming so large a portion of his time in elementary teaching, and practically asking to be removed to some position in the court. Nothing was done for a time, but negotiations proceeded, and soon after the discovery of Jupiter's satellites, Cosmo wrote, making a generous offer, which Galileo gladly and enthusiastically accepted, and at once left Padua for Florence. All his subsequent discoveries date from Florence. Thus closed his brilliant and happy career as professor at the University of Padua. He had been treated well, his pay had become larger than that of any professor of mathematics up to that time, and, as you know, immediately after his invention of the telescope, the Venetian Senate, in a fit of enthusiasm, had doubled it, and secured it to him for life wherever he was. To throw up his chair, and leave the place the very next year, scarcely seems a strictly honourable procedure. It was legal enough, no doubt, and it is easy for small men to criticise a great one, 
but nevertheless I think we must admit that it is a step such as a man with a keen sense of honour would hardly have taken. One quite feels and sympathises with the temptation. Not emolument, but leisure, freedom from harassing engagements and constant teaching, and liberty to prosecute his studies day and night without interference. This was the golden prospect before him. He yielded, but one cannot help wishing he had not. As it turned out, it was a false step, the first false step of his public career. When made, it was irretrievable, and it led to great misery. At first it seemed brilliant enough. The great philosopher of the Tuscan court was courted and flattered by princes and nobles. He enjoyed a world-wide reputation, lived as luxuriously as he cared for, had his time all to himself, and lectured but very seldom, on great occasions, or to a few crowned heads. His position was, in fact, analogous to that of Tycho Brahe, in his island of Huon. Misfortune overtook both. In Tycho's case it arose mainly from the death of his patron. In Galileo's it was due to a more insidious cause. To understand which cause are right, we must remember the political divisions of Italy at that date. Tuscany was a papal state, and thought there was by no means free. Venice was a free republic, and even hostile to the papacy. In 1606 the Pope had placed it under an interdict. In reply it had ejected every Jesuit. Out of this atmosphere of comparative enlightenment and freedom, into that hotbed of medievalism and superstition, went Galileo, with his eyes open. Keen was the regret of his Paduan and Venetian friends. Bitter were their remonstrances and exhortations. But he was determined to go, and, not without turning some of his old friends into enemies, he went. Seldom has such a man made so great a mistake. Never, I suppose, has one been so cruelly punished for it. We must remember, however, that Galileo, though by no means a saint, was yet a really religious man, a devout Catholic, and thorough adherent of the Church, so that he would have no dislike to place himself under her sway. Moreover, he had been born a Tuscan, his family had lived at Florence or Pisa, and it felt like going home. His theological attitude is worthy of notice, for he was not in the least a sceptic. He quite acquiesces in the authority of the Bible, especially in all matters concerning faith and conduct. As to its statements in scientific matters, he argues that we are so liable to misinterpret their meaning, that it is really easier to examine nature for truth in scientific matters, and that when direct observation and scripture seem to clash, it is because of our fallacious interpretation of one or both of them. He is, in fact, what one now calls a reconciler. It is curious to find such a man prosecuted for heresy, when to-day his opinions are those of the orthodox among the orthodox. But so it ever is, and the heresy of one generation becomes the commonplace of the next. He accepts Joshua's miracle, for instance, not as a striking poem, but as a literal fact, and he points out how much more simply it could be done on the Copernican system, by stopping the earth's rotation for a short time, than by stopping the sun and moon and all the host of heaven, as on the old Ptolemaic system, or again by stopping only the sun and not any of the other bodies and so throwing astronomy all wrong. This reads to us like satire, but no doubt it was his genuine opinion. These scriptural reconciliations of his, however, angered the religious authorities still more. They said it was bad enough for this heretic to try and upset old scientific beliefs, and to spoil the face of nature with his infidel discoveries, but at least he might leave the Bible alone, and they address an indignant remonstrance to Rome, to protect it from the hands of ignorant laymen. Thus, wherever he turned, he encountered hostility. Of course he had many friends, some of them powerful, like Cosmo, all of them faithful and sincere. But against the power of Rome, what could they do? Cosmo dared no more than remonstrate, and ultimately his successor had to refrain from even this. So enchained and bound was the spirit of the rulers of those days, and so when his day of tribulation came, he stood alone and helpless in the midst of his enemies. You may wonder, perhaps, why this man should excite so much more hostility than many another man who was suffered to believe and teach much the same doctrines unmolested. But no other man had made such brilliant and exciting discoveries. No man stood so prominently forward in the eyes of all Christendom as the champion of the new doctrines. No other man stated them so clearly and forcibly, nor drove them home with such brilliant and telling illustrations. And again there was the memory of his early conflict with the Aristotelians at Pisa, of his scornful and successful refutation of their absurdities. All this made him specially obnoxious to the Aristotelian Jesuits in their double capacity, both of priests and of philosophers, and they singled him out for relentless official persecution. 
Not yet, however, is he much troubled by them. The chief men at Rome have not yet moved. Messages, however, keep going up from Tuscany to Rome, respecting the teachings of this man, and of the harm he is doing by his pertinacious preaching of the Copernican doctrine that the earth moves. At length, in 1615, Pope Paul V wrote, requesting him to come to Rome to explain his views. He went, was well received, made a special friend of Cardinal Barberino, an accomplished man in high position, who became, in fact, the next Pope. Galileo showed cardinals and others his telescope, and to as many as would look through it, he showed Jupiter's satellites, and his other discoveries. He had a most successful visit. He talked, he harangued, he held forth in the midst of fifteen or twenty disputants at once, confounding his opponents and putting them to shame. His method was to let the opposite arguments be stated as fully and completely as possible, himself aiding, and often adducing the most forcible and plausible arguments against his own views, and then, all having been well stated, he would proceed to utterly undermine and demolish the whole fabric, and bring out the truth in such a way as to convince all honest minds. It was this habit that made him such a formidable antagonist. He never shrank from meeting an opposing argument, never sought to ignore it, or cloak it in a cloud of words. Every hostile argument he seemed to delight in, as a foe to be crushed, and the better and stronger they sounded, the more he liked them. He knew many of them well, he invented a number more, and had he chosen, could have out-argued the stoutest Aristotelian on his own grounds. Thus did he lead his adversaries on, almost like Socrates, only to ultimately overwhelm them in a more hopeless rout. All this in Rome too, in the heart of the Catholic world. Had he been worldly wise, he would certainly have kept silent and unobtrusive till he had leave to go away again. But he felt like an apostle of the new doctrines, whose mission it was to proclaim them even in the centre of the world and of the church. Well, he had an audience with the Pope, a chat an hour long, and the two parted good friends, mutually pleased with each other. He writes that he is all right now, and might return home when he liked, but the question began to be agitated whether the whole system of Copernicus ought not to be condemned as impious and heretical. This view was persistently urged upon the Pope and the College of Cardinals, and it was soon to be decided upon. Had Galileo been unfaithful to the Church, he could have left them to stultify themselves in any way they thought proper, and himself have gone. But he felt supremely interested in the result, and he stayed. He writes, "'So far as concerns the clearing of my own character,' I might return home immediately. But although this new question regards me no more than all those who, for the last eighty years, have supported those opinions, both in public and private, yet, as perhaps I may be of some assistance in that part of the discussion which depends upon the knowledge of truths ascertained by means of the sciences which I profess, I, as a zealous and Catholic Christian, neither can nor ought to withhold that assistance which my knowledge affords, and this business keeps me sufficiently employed." It is possible that his stay was the worst thing for the cause he had at heart. Anyhow, the result was that the system was condemned, and both the Book of Copernicus and the epitome of it by Kepler were placed on the forbidden list, and Galileo himself was formally ordered never to teach or to believe the motion of the earth. He quitted Rome in disgust, which before long broke out in satire. The only way in which he could safely speak of these views now was as if they were hypothetical and uncertain and so we find him writing to the Archduke Leopold, with a presentation copy of his book on the tides, the following. This theory occurred to me when in Rome, whilst the theologians were debating on the prohibition of Copernicus's book, and of the opinion maintained in it of the motion of the earth, which I at that time believed, until it pleased those gentlemen to suspend the book, and declare the opinion false and repugnant to the Holy Scriptures. Now, as I know how well it becomes me to obey and believe the decisions of my superiors, which proceed out of more knowledge than the weakness of my intellect can attain to, this theory which I send you, which is founded on the motion of the earth, I now look upon as a fiction and a dream, and beg your highness to receive it as such. But as poets often learn to prize the creations of their fancy, so in like manner do I set some value on this absurdity of mine. It is true that when I sketched this little work, I did hope that Copernicus would not, after eighty years, be convicted of error, and I had intended to develop and amplify it further. But a voice from heaven suddenly awakened me, and at once annihilated all my confused and entangled fancies. This sarcasm, if it had been in print, would probably have been dangerous. It was safe in a private letter, but it shows us his real feelings. 
However, he was left comparatively quiet for a time. He was getting an old man now, and passed the time studiously enough, partly at his house in Florence, partly at his villa in Architree, a mile or so out of the town. Here was a convent, and in it his two daughters were nuns. One of them, who passed under the name of Sister Maria Celeste, seems to have been a woman of considerable capacity. Certainly she was of a most affectionate disposition, and loved and honoured her father in the most dutiful way. This was a quiet period of his life, spoiled only by occasional fits of illness, and severe rheumatic pains, to which the old man was always liable. Many little circumstances are known of his peaceful time. For instance, the convent clock won't go, and Galileo mends it for them. He is always doing little things for them, and sending presents to the lady superior, and his two daughters. He was occupied now with problems in hydrostatics, and on other matters unconnected with astronomy, a large piece of work which I must pass over. Most interesting and acute it is, however. In 1623, when the old Pope died, there was elected to the papal throne, as Urban VIII, Cardinal Barberino, a man of very considerable enlightenment, and a personal friend of Galileo's, so that both he and his daughters rejoice greatly, and hope that things will come all right, and the forbidding edict be withdrawn. The year after this election he manages to make another journey to Rome, to compliment his friend on his elevation to the pontifical chair. He had many talks with Urban, and made himself very agreeable. Urban wrote to the Grand Duke Ferdinand, son of Cosmo, for we find in him not only literary distinction, but also love of piety, and he is strong in those qualities by which pontifical good will is easily obtainable. And now, when he has been brought to this city to congratulate us on our elevation, we have very lovingly embraced him, nor can we suffer him to return to the country whither your liberality recalls him without an ample provision of pontifical love, and that you may know how dear he is to us, we have willed to give him this honourable testimonial of virtue and piety. And we further signify that every benefit which you shall confer upon him, imitating or even surpassing your father's liberality, will conduce to our gratification." Encouraged, doubtless, by these marks of approbation, and reposing too much confidence in the individual good will of the Pope, without heeding the crowd of half-declared enemies who were seeking to undermine his reputation, he set about, after his return to Florence, his greatest literary and most popular work, Dialogues on the Ptolemaic and Copernican Systems. This purports to be a series of four conversations between three characters. Salviati, a Copernican philosopher, Sagredo, a wit and scholar, not specially learned, but keen and critical, and who lightens the talk with chaff. Simplicio, an Aristotelian philosopher who propounds the stock absurdities which served instead of arguments to the majority of men. The conversations are something between Plato's dialogues and Sir Arthur Help's friends in council. The whole is conducted with great good temper and fairness, and, discreetly enough, no definite conclusion is arrived at, the whole being left in abeyance as if for a fifth and decisive dialogue, which, however, was never written and perhaps was only intended in case the reception was favourable. The preface also sets forth that the object of the writer is to show that the Roman edict forbidding the Copernican doctrine was not issued in ignorance of the facts of the case, as had been maliciously reported, and that he wishes to show how well and clearly it was all known beforehand. So he says the dialogue on the Copernican side takes up the question purely as a mathematical hypothesis or speculative figment, and gives it every artificial advantage of which the theory is capable. This piece of caution was insufficient to blind the eyes of the cardinals, for in it the arguments in favour of the earth's motion are so cogent and unanswerable, and are so popularly stated, as to do more in a few years to undermine the old system than all that he had written and spoken before. He could not get it printed for two years after he had written it, and then only got consent through a piece of carelessness or laziness on the part of the ecclesiastical censor through whose hands the manuscript passed, for which he was afterwards dismissed. However, it did appear, and was eagerly read, the more, perhaps, as the Church at once sought to suppress it. The Aristotelians were furious, and represented to the Pope that he himself was the character intended by Simplicio, the philosopher whose opinions get alternately refuted and ridiculed by the other two, till he is reduced to an abject state of impotence. The idea that Galileo had thus cast ridicule upon his friend and patron is no doubt a gratuitous and insulting libel. There is no telling whether or not Urban believed it, but certainly his countenance changed to Galileo henceforward, and whether overruled by his cardinals, or actuated by some other motive, his favour was completely withdrawn. The infirm old man was instantly summoned to Rome. His friends pleaded his age. He was now seventy. His ill health, the time of year, the state of the roads, 
the quarantine existing on account of the plague. It was all of no avail. To Rome he must go, and on the 14th of February he arrived. His daughter at Archetree was in despair, and anxiety and fastings and penances self-inflicted on his account dangerously reduced her health. At Rome he was not imprisoned, but he was told to keep indoors, and show himself as little as possible. He was allowed, however, to stay at the house of the Tuscan ambassador, instead of in jail. By April he was removed to the chambers of the Inquisition, and examined several times. Here, however, the anxiety was too much, and his health began to give way seriously. So, before long, he was allowed to return to the ambassador's house, and, after application had been made, was allowed to drive in the public garden in a half-closed carriage. Thus, in every way, the Inquisition dealt with him as leniently as they could. He was now their prisoner, and they might have cast him into their dungeons, as many another had been cast. By whatever they were influenced, perhaps the Pope's old friendship, perhaps his advanced age and infirmities, he was not so cruelly used. Still, they had their rules. He must be made to recant, and abjure his heresy, and, if necessary, torture must be applied. This he knew well enough, and his daughter knew it, and her distress may be imagined. Moreover, it is not as if they had really been heretics, as if they had hated or despised the Church of Rome. On the contrary, they loved and honoured the Church, they were sincere and devout worshippers, and only on a few scientific matters did Galileo presume to differ from his ecclesiastical superiors. His disagreement with them occasioned him real sorrow, and his dearest hope was that they could be brought to his way of thinking, and embrace the truth. Every time he was sent for by the Inquisition, he was in danger of torture, unless he recanted. All his friends urged him repeatedly to submit. They said resistance was hopeless and fatal. Within the memory of men still young, Giordano Bruno had been burnt alive for a similar heresy. This had happened while Galileo was at Padua. Venice was full of it, and since that, only eight years ago indeed, Antonio de Dominis, Archbishop of Salpetria, had been sentenced to the same fate, to be handed over to the secular arm to be dealt with as mercifully as possible, without the shedding of blood. So ran the hideous formula condemning a man to the stake. After his sentence, this unfortunate man died in the dungeons in which he had been incarcerated six years, died what is called a natural death, but the sentence was carried out notwithstanding on his lifeless body and his writings, his writings for which he had been willing to die. These were the tender mercies of the Inquisition, and this was the kind of meaning lurking behind many of their well-sounding and merciful phrases. For instance, what they call rigorous examination, we call torture. Let us, however, remember, in our horror at this mode of compelling a prisoner to say anything they wished, that they were a legally constituted tribunal, that they acted with well-established rules, and not in passion, and that torture was a recognised mode of extracting evidence, not only in ecclesiastical, but in civil courts, at that date. All this, however, was but poor solace to the pitiable old philosopher, thus ruthlessly hailed up and down, questioned and threatened, threatened and questioned, receiving agonising letters from his daughter week by week, and trying to keep up a little spirit to reply as happily and hopefully as he could. This condition of things could not go on. From February to June the suspense lasted. On the 20th of June he was summoned again, and told he would be wanted all next day for rigorous examination. Early in the morning of the 21st he repaired thither, and the doors were shut. Out of those chambers of horror he did not reappear till the 24th. What went on all those three days no one knows. He himself was bound to secrecy. No outsider was present. The records of the Inquisition are jealously guarded. That he was technically tortured is certain. That he actually underwent the torment of the rack is doubtful. Much learning has been expended upon the question, especially in Germany. Several eminent scholars have held the fact of actual torture to be indisputable, geometrically certain, one says, and they confirm it by the hernia from which he afterwards suffered, this being a well-known and frequent consequence. Other equally learned commentators, however, deny that the last stage was reached, for there are five stages all laid down in the rules of the Inquisition, and steadily adhered to in a rigorous examination, at each stage an opportunity being given for recantation, every utterance, groan, or sigh being strictly recorded. The recantation so given has to be confirmed a day or two later, under pain of a precisely similar ordeal. The five stages are, first, 
the official threat in the court, second, the taking to the door of the torture chamber and renewing the official threat, third, the taking inside and showing the instruments, fourth, undressing and binding upon the rack, fifth, teritia realis. Through how many of these ghastly acts Galileo passed, I do not know. I hope and believe not the last. There are those who lament that he did not hold out, and accept the crown of martyrdom thus offered to him. Had he done so, we know his fate, a few years languishing in the dungeons, and then the flames. Whatever he ought to have done, he did not hold out, he gave way. At one stage or another of the dread ordeal, he said, I am in your hands, I will say whatever you wish. Then he was removed to a cell where his special form of perjury was drawn up. The next day, clothed as a penitent, the venerable old man was taken to the convent of Minerva, where the cardinals and prelates were assembled for the purpose of passing judgment upon him. The text of the judgment I have here, but it is too long to read. It sentences him, first, to the abjuration, second, to formal imprisonment for life, third, to recite the seven penitential psalms every week. Ten cardinals were present, but, to their honour be it said, three refused to sign, and this blasphemous record of intolerance and bigoted folly goes down the ages with the names of seven cardinals immortalised upon it. This having been read, he next had to read word for word the abjuration which had been drawn up for him, and then sign it. THE ABJURATION OF GALILEO I, Galileo Galilei, son of the late Vincenzo Galilei, of Florence, aged seventy years, being brought personally to judgment, and kneeling before you most eminent and most revered lords, cardinals, general inquisitors of the universal Christian republic, against heretical depravity, having before my eyes the holy gospels, which I touch with my own hands, swear that I have always believed, and now believe, and with the help of God will in future believe, every article which the holy Catholic and apostolic Church of Rome holds, teaches, and preaches. But because I have been enjoined by this holy office altogether to abandon the false opinion which maintains that the sun is the centre and immovable, and forbidden to hold, defend, or teach the said false doctrine in any manner, and after it hath been signified to me that the said doctrine is repugnant with the holy scripture, I have written and printed a book, in which I treat of the same doctrine now condemned, and adduce reasons with great force in support of the same, without giving any solution, and therefore have been judged grievously suspected of heresy, that is to say, that I held and believe that the sun is the centre of the universe, and is immovable, and that the earth is not the centre, and is movable, willing, therefore, to remove from the minds of your eminences, and of every Catholic Christian, this vehement suspicion rightfully entertained towards me. With a sincere heart and unfeigned faith, I abjure, curse, and detest the said errors and heresies, and generally every other error and sect contrary to the Holy Church, and I swear that I will never more in future say or assert anything verbally or in writing, which may give rise to a similar suspicion of me. But if I shall know any heretic, or any one suspected of heresy, that I will denounce him to this holy office, or to the inquisitor, or ordinary of the place where I may be, I swear, moreover, and promise that I will fulfil and observe fully all the penances which have been, or shall be laid on me by this holy office. But if it shall happen that I violate any of my said promises, oaths, and protestations, which God avert, I subject myself to all the pains and punishments which have been decreed and promulgated by the sacred canons, and other general and particular constitutions, against delinquents of this description. So may God help me, and his holy gospels which I touched with my own hands. I, the above-named Galileo Galilei, have abjured, sworn, promised, and bound myself as above, and in witness thereof with my own hand have subscribed this present writing of my abjuration, which I have recited word for word, at Rome, in the convent of Minerva, 22nd June, 1633. I, Galileo Galilei, have abjured as above with my own hand. Those who believe the story about his muttering to a friend as he rose from his knees, a per si muove, do not realise the scene. First, there was no friend in the place. Second, it would have been fatally dangerous to mutter anything before such an assemblage. Third, he was by this time an utterly broken and disgraced old man, wishful, of all things, to get away and hide himself and his miseries from the public gaze, probably with his senses deadened and stupefied by the mental sufferings he had undergone, and no longer able to think or care about anything, except perhaps his daughter, certainly not about any motion of this wretched earth. Far and wide the news of the recantation spread. Copies of the abjuration were immediately sent to all universities, with instructions to the professors to read it publicly. 
at Florence, his home, it was read out in the cathedral church, all his friends and adherents being specially summoned to hear it. For a short time more he was imprisoned in Rome, but at length was permitted to depart, never more of his own will to return. He was allowed to go to Siena. Here his daughter wrote consolingly, rejoicing at his escape, and saying how joyfully she already recited the penitential psalms for him, and so relieved him of that part of his sentence. But the poor girl was herself by this time ill, thoroughly worn out with anxiety and terror. She lay, in fact, on what proved to be her deathbed. Her one wish was to see her dearest lord and father, so she calls him, once more. The wish was granted. His prison was changed, by orders from Rome, from Siena to Architry, and once more father and daughter embraced. Six days after this she died. The broken-hearted old man now asks for permission to go to live in Florence, but is met with the stern answer that he is to stay at Architry, is not to go out of the house, is not to receive visitors, and that if he asks for more favours, or transgresses the commands laid upon him, he is liable to be hailed back to Rome and cast into a dungeon. These harsh measures were dictated, not by cruelty, but by the fear of his still spreading heresy by conversation, and so he was to be kept isolated. Idle, however, he was not, and could not be. He often complains that his head is too busy for his body. In the enforced solitude of archery, he was composing those dialogues on motion which are now reckoned his greatest and most solid achievement. In these the true laws of motion are set forth for the first time. One more astronomical discovery also he was to make, that of the moon's libration. And then there came one more crushing blow. His eyes became inflamed and painful, the sight of one of them failed, the other soon went, he became totally blind. But this, being a heaven-sent infliction, he could bear with resignation, though it must have been keenly painful to a solitary man of his activity. Alas, says he, in one of his letters, your dear friend and servant is totally blind. Henceforth this heaven, this universe, which by wonderful observations I had enlarged a hundred and a thousand times beyond the conception of former ages, is shrunk for me into the narrow space which I myself fill in it. So it pleases God. It shall therefore please me also. He was now allowed an amanuensis, and the help of his pupils Torricelli, Castelli, and Viviani, all devotedly attached to him, and Torricelli very famous after him. Visitors also were permitted, after approval by a Jesuit supervisor, and under these circumstances many visited him, among them a man as immortal as himself, John Milton, then only twenty-nine, travelling in Italy. Surely a pathetic incident, this meeting of these two great men, the one already blind, the other destined to become so. No wonder that, as in his old age he dictated his masterpiece, the thoughts of the English poet should run on the blind sage of Tuscany, and the reminiscence of their conversation should lend colour to the poem. Well, it were tedious to follow the petty annoyances and troubles to which Galileo was still subject, how his own son was set to see that no unauthorised procedure took place, and that no heretic visitors were admitted, how it was impossible to get his new book printed till long afterwards, and how one form of illness after another took possession of him. The merciful end came at last, and at the age of seventy-eight he was released from the Inquisition. They wanted to deny him burial. They did deny him a monument. They threatened to cart his bones away from Florence if his friends attempted one, and so they hoped that he and his work might be forgotten. Poor schemers! Before the year was out, an infant was born in Lincolnshire, whose destiny it was to round and complete and carry forward the work of their victim, so that, until man shall cease from the planet, neither the work nor its author shall have need of a monument. Here might I end, were it not that the same kind of struggle as went on fiercely in the seventeenth century is still smouldering even now. Not in astronomy, indeed, as then, nor yet in geology as some fifty years ago, but in biology mainly, perhaps in other subjects. I myself have heard Charles Darwin spoken of as an atheist and an infidel, the theory of evolution assailed as unscriptural, and the doctrine of the ascent of man from a lower state of being, as opposed to the fall of man from some higher condition, denied as impious and unchristian. Men will not learn by the past. Still they brandish their feeble weapons against the truths of nature, as if assertions one way or another could alter fact, or make the thing other than it really is. As Galileo said before his spirit was broken, in these and other positions certainly no man doubts, but his holiness the Pope hath always an absolute power of admitting or condemning them, 
but it is not in the power of any creature to make them to be true or false, or otherwise than of their own nature, and in fact they are. I know nothing of the views of any here present, but I have met educated persons who, while they might laugh at the men who refused to look through a telescope lest they should learn something they did not like, yet also themselves commit the very same folly. I have met persons who utterly refuse to listen to any view concerning the origin of man, other than that of a perfect primeval pair in a garden, and I am constrained to say this much. Take heed lest some prophet, after having excited your indignation at the follies and bigotry of a bygone generation, does not turn upon you with the sentence, Thou art the man. End of Lecture 5 Read by Megan Argo Lecture 6 of Pioneers of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hawaii in June 2010. Pioneers of Science by Sir Oliver Lodge. Lecture 6. Summary of Facts for Lecture 6. Science Before Newton. Dr. Gilbert of Colchester, physician to Queen Elizabeth, was an excellent experimenter and made many discoveries in magnetism and electricity. He was contemporary with Tycho Brahe and lived from 1540 to 1603. Francis Bacon, Lord Verulam, 1561 to 1626, though a brilliant writer, is not specially important as regards science. He was not a scientific man, and his rules for making discoveries or methods of induction have never been consciously, nor often indeed unconsciously, followed by discoverers. They are not in fact practical rules at all, though they were so intended. His really strong doctrines are that phenomena must be studied direct, and that variations in the ordinary course of nature must be induced by aid of experiment but he lacked the scientific instinct for pursuing these great truths into detail and special cases. He sneered at the work and methods of both Gilbert and Galileo, and rejected the Copernican theory as absurd. His literary gifts have conferred on him an artificially high scientific reputation, especially in England. At the same time, his writings undoubtedly helped to make popular the idea of there being new methods for investigating nature, and, by insisting on the necessity for freedom from preconceived ideas and opinions, they did much to release men from the bondage of Aristotelian authority and scholastic tradition. The greatest name between Galileo and Newton is that of Descartes. René Descartes was born at La Haye in Turenne, 1596, and died at Stockholm in 1650. He did important work in mathematics, physics, anatomy, and philosophy, was greatest as a philosopher and mathematician. At the age of 21, he served as a volunteer under Prince Maurice of Nassau, but spent most of his later life in Holland. His famous discourse on method appeared at Leiden in 1637, and his Principia at Amsterdam in 1644, great pains being taken to avoid the condemnation of the church. Descartes' main scientific achievement was the application of algebra to geometry. His most famous speculation was the theory of vortices, invented to account for the motion of planets. He also made many discoveries in optics and physiology. His best-known immediate pupils were the Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia and Christina, Queen of Sweden. He founded a distinct school of thought, the Cartesian, and was the precursor of the modern mathematical method of investigating science, just as Galileo and Gilbert were the originators of the modern experimental method. Lecture 6. Descartes and his theory of vortices. After the dramatic life we have been considering in the last two lectures, it is well to have a breathing space, to look round on what has been accomplished and to review the state of scientific thought before proceeding to the next great era, for we are still in the early morning of scientific discovery, 
the dawn of the modern period faintly heralded by copernicus brought nearer by the work of tycho and kepler and introduced by the discoveries of galileo the dawn has occurred but the sun is not yet visible it is hidden by the clouds and mists of the long night of ignorance and prejudice the light is sufficient indeed to render these earth-born vapours more visible it is not sufficient to dispel them a generation of slow and doubtful progress must pass before the first ray of sunlight can break through the eastern clouds and the full orb of day itself appear it is this period of hesitating progress and slow leavening of men's ideas that we have to pass through in this week's lecture it always happens thus the assimilation of great and new ideas is always a slow and gradual process there is no haste either here or in any other department of nature die zeit ist unendlich lang steadily the forces work sometimes seeming to accomplish nothing sometimes even the motion appears retrograde but in the long run the destined end is reached and the course whether of a planet or of men's thoughts about the universe is permanently altered then the controversy was about the earth's place in the universe now if there be any controversy of the same kind it is about man's place in the universe but the process is the same a startling statement by a great genius or prophet general disbelief and it may be an attitude of hostility gradual acceptance by a few slow spreading among the many ending in universal acceptance and faith often as unquestioning and unreasoning as the old state of unfaith had been now the process is comparatively speedy twenty years accomplishes a great deal then it was tediously slow and a century seemed to accomplish very little periodical literature may be responsible for some waste of time but it certainly assists the rapid spread of ideas the rate with which ideas are assimilated by the general public cannot even now be considered excessive but how much faster it is than it was a few centuries ago may be illustrated by the attitude of the public to darwinism now twenty years after the origin of species as compared with their attitude to the copernican system a century after the revolutionibus by the way it is i know presumptuous for me to have an opinion but i cannot hear darwin compared to or mentioned along with newton without a shudder the stage in which he found biology seems to me far more comparable with the ptolemaic era in astronomy and he himself to be quite fairly comparable to copernicus let us proceed to summarize the stage at which the human race had arrived at the epoch with which we are now dealing the copernican view of the solar system had been stated restated fought and insisted on a chain of brilliant telescopic discoveries had made it popular and accessible to all men of any intelligence henceforth it must be left to slowly percolate and sink into the minds of the people for the nations were waking up now and were accessible to new ideas england especially was in some sort at the zenith of its glory or if not at the zenith was in that full flush of youth and expectation and hope which is stronger and more prolific of great deeds and thoughts than a maturer period a common cause against a common and detested enemy had roused in the hearts of englishmen a passion of enthusiasm and patriotism so that the mean elements of trade their cheating yard ones were forgotten for a time the armada was defeated and the nation's true and conscious adult life began commerce was now no mere struggle for profit and hard bargains it was full of the spirit of adventure and discovery a new world had been opened up who could tell what more remained unexplored men awoke to the splendour of their inheritance and away sailed drake and frobisher and raleigh into the lands of the west for literature you know what time it was the author of hamlet and othello was alive it is needless to say more and what about science the atmosphere of science is a more quiet and less stirring one it thrives best when the fever of excitement is allayed it is necessarily a later growth than literature already however 
our second great man of science was at work in a quiet country town second in point of time i mean roger bacon being the first dr gilbert of colchester was the second in point of time and the age was ripening for the time when england was to be honoured with such a galaxy of scientific luminaries hook and boyle and newton as the world had not yet known yes the nations were awake in all directions as draper says nature was investigated in all directions new methods of examination were yielding unexpected and beautiful results on the ruins of its ivy-grown cathedrals ecclesiasticism or scholasticism surprised and blinded by the breaking day sat solemnly blinking at the light and life about it absorbed in the recollection of the night that had passed dreaming of new phantoms and delusions in its wished-for return and vindictively striking its talons at any derisive assailant who incautiously approached too near of the work of gilbert there is much to say so there is also of roger bacon whose life i am by no means sure i did write in omitting but neither of them had much to do with astronomy and since it is in astronomy that the most startling progress was during these centuries being made i have judged it wiser to adhere mainly to the pioneers in this particular department only for this reason i do pass gilbert with but slight mention he knew of the copernican theory and thoroughly accepted it it is convenient to speak of it as the copernican theory though you know that it has been considerably improved in detail since the first crude statement by copernicus but he made in it no changes he was a cultivated scientific man and an acute experimental philosopher his main work lay in the domain of magnetism and electricity the phenomena connected with the mariner's compass had been studied somewhat by roger bacon and they were now examined still more thoroughly by gilbert whose treatise de magnete marks the beginning of the science of magnetism as an appendix to that work he studied the phenomenon of amber which had been mentioned by thales he resuscitated this little fact after its burial of two thousand two hundred years and greatly extended it he it was who invented the name electricity i wish it had been a shorter one mankind invents names much better than do philosophers what can be better than heat light sound how favourably they compare with electricity magnetism galvanism electromagnetism and magnetoelectricity the only long-established monosyllabic name i know invented by a philosopher is gas an excellent attempt which ought to be imitated of lord bacon who flourished about the same time a little later it is necessary to say something because many persons are under the impression that to him and his novum organon the reawakening of the world and the overthrow of aristotelian tradition are mainly due his influence however has been exaggerated i am not going to enter into a discussion of the novum organon and the mechanical methods which he propounded as certain to evolve truth if patiently pursued for this is what he thought he was doing giving to the world an infallible recipe for discovering truth with which any ordinarily industrious man could make discoveries by means of collection and discrimination of instances you will take my statement for what it is worth but i assert this that many of the methods which bacon lays down are not those which the experience of mankind has found to be serviceable nor are they such as a scientific man would have thought of devising true it is that a real love and faculty for science are born in a man and that to the man of scientific capacity rules of procedure are unnecessary his own intuition is sufficient or he has mistaken his vocation but that is not my point it is not that bacon's methods are useless because the best men do not need them if they had been founded on a careful study of the methods actually employed though it might be unconsciously employed by scientific men as the means of induction stated long after by john stuart mill were founded then no doubt their statement would have been a valuable service and a great thing to accomplish but they were not this 
they are the ideas of a brilliant man of letters writing in an age when scientific research was almost unknown about a subject in which he was an amateur i confess i do not see how he or john stuart mill or any one else writing in that age could have formulated the true rules of philosophizing because the materials and information were scarcely to hand science and its methods were only beginning to grow no doubt it was a brilliant attempt no doubt also there are many good and true points in the statement especially in his insistence on the attitude of free and open candor with which the investigation of nature should be approached no doubt there was much beauty in his allegories of the errors into which men were apt to fall the idola of the market-place of the tribe of the theatre and of the den but all this is literature and on the solid progress of science may be said to have had little or no effect descartes discourse on method was a much more solid production you will understand that i speak of bacon purely as a scientific man as a man of letters as a lawyer a man of the world and a statesman he is beyond any criticism of mine i speak only of the purely scientific aspect of the novum organon the essays and the advancements of learning are masterly productions and as a literary man he takes high rank the overpraise which in the british isles has been lavished upon his scientific importance is being followed abroad by what may be an unnecessary amount of detraction this is always the worst of setting up a man on too high a pinnacle some one has to undertake the ungrateful task of pulling him down again justus von liebig addressed himself to this task with some vigour in his reden und abhandlung leipzig eighteen seventy four where he quotes from bacon a number of suggestions for absurd experimentation the next paragraph i read not because i endorse it but because it is always well to hear both sides of a question you have probably been long accustomed to read over estimates of bacon's importance and extravagant laudation of his writings as making an epoch in science hear what draper says on the opposite side Quote, the more closely we examine the writings of lord bacon the more unworthy does he seem to have been of the great reputation which has been awarded to him the popular delusion to which he owes so much originated at a time when the history of science was unknown they who first brought him into notice knew nothing of the old school of alexandria this boasted founder of a new philosophy could not comprehend and would not accept the greatest of all scientific doctrines when it was plainly set before his eyes it has been represented that the invention of the true method of physical science was an amusement of bacon's hours of relaxation from the more laborious studies of law and duties of a court his chief admirers have been persons of a literary turn who have an idea that scientific discoveries are accomplished by a mechanical mental operation bacon never produced any great practical result himself no great physicist has ever made any use of his method he has had the same to do with the development of modern science that the inventor of the orrery has to do with the discovery of the mechanism of the world of all the important physical discoveries there is not one which shows that its author made it by the baconian instrument newton never seems to have been aware that he was under any obligation to bacon archimedes and the alexandrians and the arabians and leonardo da vinci did very well before he was born the discovery of america by columbus and the circumnavigation by magellan can hardly be attributed to him yet they were the consequences of a truly philosophical reasoning but the investigation of nature is an affair of genius not of rules no man can invent an organon for writing tragedies and epic poems bacon's system is in its own terms an idol of the theatre it would scarcely guide a man to a solution of the riddle of elia lelia crispus or to that of the charade of sir hilary few scientific pretenders have made more mistakes than lord bacon 
he rejected the copernican system and spoke insolently of its great author he undertook to criticize adversely gilbert's treatise the magnete he was occupied in the condemnation of any investigation of final causes while harvey was deducing the circulation of the blood from aqua pendente's discovery of the valves in the veins he was doubtful whether instruments were of any advantage while galileo was investigating the heavens with the telescope ignorant himself of every branch of mathematics he presumed that they were useless in science but a few years before newton achieved by their aid his immortal discoveries it is time that the sacred name of philosophy should be severed from its long connection with that of one who was a pretender in science a time-serving politician an insidious lawyer a corrupt judge a treacherous friend a bad man End quote. this seems to me a deprecation as excessive as are the eulogies commonly current the truth probably lies somewhere between the two extremes it is unfair to judge bacon's methods by thinking of physical science in its present stage to realize his position we must think of a subject still in its very early infancy one in which the adversability of applying experimental methods is still doubted one which has been studied by means of books and words and discussion of normal instances instead of by collection and observation of the unusual and irregular and by experimental production of variety if we think of a subject still in this infantile and almost pre-scientific stage bacon's words and formulae are far from inapplicable they are within their limitations quite necessary and wholesome a subject in this stage strange to say exists psychology now hesitatingly beginning to assume its experimental weapons amid a stifling atmosphere of distrust and suspicion bacon's lack of the modern scientific instinct must be admitted but he rendered humanity a powerful service in directing it from books to nature herself and his genius is indubitable a judicious account of his life and work is given by professor adamson in the encyclopedia britannica and to this article i now refer you who then was the man of first magnitude filling up the gap in scientific history between the death of galileo and the maturity of newton unknown and mysterious are the laws regulating the appearance of genius we have passed in review a pole a dane a german and an italian the great man is now a frenchman rené descartes born in touraine on the thirty first of march fifteen ninety six his mother died at his birth the father was of no importance save as the owner of some landed property the boy was reared luxuriously and inherited a fair fortune nearly all the men of first rank you notice were born well off genius born to poverty might indeed even then achieve name and fame as we see in the case of kepler but it was terribly handicapped handicapped it is still but far less than of old and we may hope it will become gradually still less so as enlightenment proceeds and the tremendous moment of great men to a nation is more clearly and actively perceived it is possible for genius when combined with strong character to overcome all obstacles and reach the highest eminence but the struggle must be severe and the absence of early training and refinement during the receptive years of youth must be a lifelong drawback the cart had none of these drawbacks life came easily to him and as a consequence perhaps he never seems to have taken it quite seriously great movements and stirring events were to him opportunities for the study of men and manners he was not the man to court persecution nor to show enthusiasm for a losing or struggling cause in this as in many other things he was imbued with a very modern spirit a cynical and sceptical spirit which to an outside and superficial observer like myself seems rather rife just now he was also imbued with a face of scientific spirit which you sometimes still meet with though i believe it is passing away that is an uncultured absorption in his own pursuits and some feeling of contempt for classical and literary and aesthetic studies 
in politics art and history he seems to have had no interest he was a spectator rather than an actor on the stage of the world and though he joined the army of that great military commander prince maurice of nassau he did it not as a man with a cause at heart worth fighting for but precisely in the spirit in which one of our own gilded youths would volunteer in a similar case as a good opportunity for frolic and for seeing life he soon tired of it and withdrew at first to gay society in paris here he might naturally have sunk into the gutter with his companions but for a great mental shock which became the main epoch and turning point of his life the crisis which diverted him from frivolity to seriousness it was a purely intellectual emotion not excited by anything in the visible or tangible world nor could it be called conversion in the common acceptation of the term he tells us that on the eleventh of november sixteen nineteen at the age of twenty four a brilliant idea flashed upon him the first idea namely of his great and powerful mathematical method of which i will speak directly and in the flush of it he foresaw that just as geometers starting with a few simple and evident propositions or axioms ascended by a long and intricate ladder of reasoning to propositions more and more abstruse so it might be possible to ascend from a few data to all the secrets and facts of the universe by a process of mathematical reasoning comparing the mysteries of nature with the laws of mathematics he dared to hope that the secrets of both could be unlocked with the same key that night he lapsed gradually into a state of enthusiasm in which he saw three dreams or visions which he interpreted at that time even before waking to be revelations from the spirit of truth to direct his future course as well as to warn him from the sins he had already committed his account of the dreams is on record but is not very easy to follow nor is it likely that a man should be able to convey to others any adequate idea of the deepest spiritual or mental agitation which has shaken him to his foundations his associates in paris were now abandoned and he withdrew after some wanderings to holland where he abode the best part of his life and did his real work even now however he took life easily he recommends idleness as necessary to the production of good mental work he worked and meditated but a few hours a day and most of those in bed he used to think best in bed he said the afternoon he devoted to society and recreation after supper he wrote letters to various persons all plainly intended for publication and scrupulously preserved he kept himself free from care and was most cautious about his health regarding himself no doubt as a subject of experiment and wishful to see how long he could prolong his life at one time he writes to a friend that he shall be seriously disappointed if he does not manage to see one hundred years this plan of not overworking himself and limiting the hours devoted to serious thought is one that might perhaps advantageously be followed by some over-laborious students of the present day at any rate it conveys a lesson for the amount of ground covered by descartes in a life not very long is extraordinary he must however have had a singular aptitude for scientific work and the judicious leaven of selfishness whereby he was able to keep himself free from care and embarrassments must have been a great help to him and what did this versatile genius accomplish during his fifty-four years of life in philosophy using the term as meaning mental or moral philosophy and metaphysics as opposed to natural philosophy or physics he takes a very high rank and it is on this that perhaps his greatest fame rests he is the author you may remember of the famous aphorism cogito ergo sum in biology i believe he may be considered almost equally great certainly he spent a great deal of time in dissecting and he made out a good deal of what is now known of the structure of the body and of the theory of vision he eagerly accepted the doctrine of the circulation of the blood then being taught by harvey and was an excellent anatomist you doubtless know professor huxley's article on descartes in the lay sermons and you perceive in what high estimation he is there held 
he originated the hypothesis that animals are automata for which indeed there is much to be said from some points of view but he unfortunately believed that they were unconscious and non-sentient automata and this belief led his disciples into acts of abominable cruelty professor huxley lectured on this hypothesis and partially upheld it not many years since the article is included in his volume called science and culture concerning his work in mathematics and physics i can speak with more confidence he is the author of the cartesian system of algebraic or analytic geometry which has been so powerful an engine of research far easier to wield than the old synthetic geometry without it newton could never have written the principia or made his greatest discoveries he might indeed have invented it for himself but it would have consumed some of his life to have brought it to the necessary perfection the principle of it is the specification of the position of a point in a plane by two numbers indicating say its distance from two lines of reference in the plane like the latitude and longitude of a place on the globe for instance the two lines of reference might be the bottom edge and the left-hand vertical edge of a wall then a point on the wall stated as being for instance six feet along and two feet up is precisely determined these two distances are called coordinates horizontal ones are usually denoted by x and vertical ones by y if instead of specifying two things only one statement is made such as y equals two it is satisfied by a whole row of points all the points in a horizontal line two feet above the ground hence y equals two may be said to represent that straight line and is called the equation to that straight line similarly x equals six represents a vertical straight line six feet or inches or some other unit from the left-hand edge if it is asserted that x equals six and y equals two only one point can be found to satisfy both conditions that is the crossing point of the above two straight lines suppose an equation such as x equals y to be given this also is satisfied by a row of points that is by all those that are equidistant from bottom and left-hand edges in other words x equals y represents a straight line slanting upwards at forty five degrees the equation x equals two y represents another straight line with a different angle of slope and so on the equation x squared plus y squared equals thirty six represents a circle of radius six the equation three x squared plus four y squared equals twenty five represents an ellipse and in general every algebraic equation that can be written down provided it involve only two variables x and y represents some curve in a plane a curve moreover that can be drawn or its properties completely investigated without drawing from the equation thus algebra is wedded to geometry and the investigation of geometric relations by means of algebraic equations is called analytical geometry as opposed to the old euclidean or synthetic mode of treating the subject by reasoning consciously directed to the subject by help of figures if there be three variables x y and z instead of only two an equation among them represents not a curve in a plane but a surface in space the three variables corresponding to the three dimensions of space length breadth and thickness an equation with four variables usually requires space of four dimensions for its geometrical interpretation and so on thus geometry can not only be reasoned about in a more mechanical and therefore much easier manner but it can be extended into regions of which we have and can have no direct conception because we are deficient in sense organs for accumulating any kind of experience in connection with such ideas in physics proper descartes tract on optics is of considerable historical interest 
he treats all the subjects he takes up in an able and original manner in astronomy he is the author of that famous and long upheld theory the doctrine of vortices he regarded space as a plenum full of an all-pervading fluid certain portions of this fluid were in a state of whirling motion as in a whirlpool or eddy of water and each planet had its own eddy in which it was whirled round and round as a straw is caught and whirled in a common whirlpool this idea he works out and elaborates very fully applying it to the system of the world and to the explanation of all the motions of the planets this system evidently supplied a void in men's minds left vacant by the overthrow of the ptolemaic system and it was rapidly accepted in the english universities it held for a long time almost undisputed sway it was in this faith that newton was brought up something was felt to be necessary to keep the planets moving on their endless round the primum mobile of ptolemy had been stopped an angel was sometimes assigned to each planet to carry it round but though a widely diffused belief this was a fantastic and not a serious scientific one the cart's vortices seemed to do exactly what was wanted it is true they had no connection with the laws of kepler i doubt whether he knew about the laws of kepler he had not much opinion of other people's work he read very little found it easier to think he travelled through florence once when galileo was at the height of his renown without calling upon or seeing him in so far as the motion of a planet was not circular it had to be accounted for by the jostling and crowding and distortion of the vortices gravitation he explained by a settling down of bodies toward the centre of each vortex and cohesion by an absence of relative motion tending to separate particles of matter he can imagine no stronger cement the vortices as descartes imagined them are not now believed in are we then to regard the system as absurd and wholly false i do not see how we can do this when to this day philosophers are agreed in believing space to be completely full of fluid which fluid is certainly capable of vortex motion and perhaps everywhere does possess that motion true the now imagined vortices are not the large worlds of planetary size they are rather infinitesimal worlds of less than atomic dimensions still a whirling fluid is believed in to this day and many are seeking to deduce all the properties of matter rigidity elasticity cohesion gravitation and the rest from it further although we talk glibly about gravitation and magnetism and so on we do not really know what they are progress is being made but we do not yet properly know much overwhelmingly much remains to be discovered and it ill behoves us to reject any well-founded and long-held theory as utterly and intrinsically false and absurd the more one gets to know the more one perceives a kernel of truth even in the most singular statements and scientific men have learned by experience to be very careful how they lop off any branch of the tree of knowledge lest as they cut away the dead wood they lose also some green shoot some healthy bud of unperceived truth however it may be admitted that the idea of a cartesian vortex in connection with the solar system applies if at all rather to an earlier its nebulous stage when the whole thing was one great whirl ready to split or shrink off planetary rings at their appropriate distances soon after he had written his great work the principia mathematica and before he printed it news reached him of the persecution and recantation of galileo he seems to have been quite thunderstruck at the tidings says mr mahaffey in his life of descartes he had started on his scientific journeys with the firm determination to enter into no conflict with the church and to carry out his system of pure mathematics and physics without ever meddling with matters of faith he was rudely disillusioned as to the possibility of this severance he wrote at once apparently november twentieth sixteen thirty three to mersenne to say he would on no account publish his work 
nay that he had at first resolved to burn all his papers for that he would never prosecute philosophy at the risk of being censored by his church Quote, i could hardly have believed he says that an italian and in favour with the pope as i hear could be considered criminal for nothing else than for seeking to establish the earth's motion though i know it has formerly been censored by some cardinals but i thought i had heard that since then it was constantly being taught even at rome and i confess that if the opinion of the earth's movement is false all the foundations of my philosophy are so also because it is demonstrated clearly by them it is so bound up with every part of my treatise that i could not sever it without making the remainder faulty and although i consider all my conclusions based on very certain and clear demonstrations i would not for all the world sustain them against the authority of the church ten years later however he did publish the book for he had by this time hit on an ingenious compromise he formally denied that the earth moved and only asserted that it was carried along with its water and air in one of those larger motions of the celestial ether which produced the diurnal and annual revolutions of the solar system so just as a passenger on the deck of a ship might be called stationary so was the earth he gives himself out therefore as a follower of tycho rather than of copernicus and says if the church won't accept this compromise he must return to the ptolemaic system but he hopes they won't compel him to do that seeing that it is manifestly untrue this elaborate deference to the powers that be did not indeed save the work from being ultimately placed upon the forbidden list by the church but it saved himself at any rate from annoying persecution he was not indeed at all willing to be persecuted and would no doubt have at once withdrawn anything they wished i should be sorry to call him a time server but he certainly had plenty of that worldly wisdom in which some of his predecessors had been so lamentably deficient moreover he was really a sceptic and cared nothing at all about the church or its dogmas he knew the church's power however and the advisability of standing well with it he therefore professed himself a catholic and studiously kept his science and his christianity distinct in saying that he was a sceptic you must not understand that he was in the least an atheist very few men are certainly descartes never thought of being one the term is indeed ludicrously inapplicable to him for a great part of his philosophy is occupied with what he considers a rigorous proof of the existence of the deity at the age of fifty-three he was sent for to stockholm by christina queen of sweden a young lady enthusiastically devoted to study of all kinds and determined to surround her court with all that was most famous in literature and science thither after hesitation the cart went he greatly liked royalty but he dreaded the cold climate born in terrain a swedish winter was peculiarly trying to him especially as the energetic queen would have lessons given her at five o'clock in the morning she intended to treat him well and was immensely taken with him but this getting up at five o'clock on a november morning to a man accustomed all his life to lie in bed till eleven was a cruel hardship he was too much of a courtier however to murmur and the early morning audience continued his health began to break down he thought of retreating but suddenly he gave way and became delirious the queen's physician attended him and of course wanted to bleed him this knowing all he knew of physiology sent him furious and they could do nothing with him after some days he became quiet was bled twice and gradually sank discoursing with great calmness on his approaching death and duly fortified with all the rites of the catholic church his general method of research was as nearly as possible a purely deductive one that is after the manner of euclid he starts with a few simple principles and then by a chain of reasoning endeavours to deduce from them their consequences and so to build up bit by bit an edifice of connected knowledge in this he was the precursor of newton 
this method when rigorously pursued is the most powerful and satisfactory of all and results in an ordered province of science far superior to the fragmentary conquests of experiment but few indeed are the men who can handle it safely and satisfactorily and none without continual appeals to experiment for verification it was through not perceiving the necessity for verification that he erred his importance to science lies not so much in what he actually discovered as in his anticipation of the right conditions for the solution of problems in physical science he in fact made the discovery that nature could after all be interrogated mathematically a fact that was in great danger of remaining unknown for observe that the mathematical study of nature the discovery of truth with a piece of paper and a pen has a perilous similarity at first sight to the straw thrashing subtleties of the greeks whose methods of investigating nature by discussing the meaning of words and the usage of language and the necessities of thought had proved to be so futile and unproductive a reaction had set in led by galileo gilbert and the whole modern school of experimental philosophers lasting down to the present day men who teach that the only right way of investigating nature is by experiment and observation it is indeed a very right and an absolutely necessary way but it is not the only way a foundation of experimental fact there must be but upon this a great structure of theoretical deduction can be based all rigidly connected together by pure reasoning and all necessarily as true as the premises provided no mistake is made to guard against the possibility of mistake and oversight especially oversight all conclusions must sooner or later be brought to the test of experiment and if disagreeing therewith the theory itself must be re-examined and the flaw discovered or else the theory must be abandoned of this grand method quite different from the gropings in the dark of kepler this method which in combination with experiment has made science what it now is this which in the hands of newton was to lead to such stupendous results we owe the beginning and early stages to rené descartes end of lecture six Lecture 7. The Pioneers of Science by Oliver Lodge. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Pioneers of Science by Oliver Lodge. Lecture 7. Sir Isaac Newton. Summary of Facts for Lectures 7 and 8. Otto Gurick, 1602 to 1686 the honorable robert boyle sixteen twenty six to sixteen ninety one huygens sixteen twenty nine to sixteen ninety five christopher wren sixteen thirty two to seventeen twenty three robert hooke sixteen thirty five to seventeen o two newton sixteen forty two to seventeen twenty seven edmund haley sixteen fifty six to seventeen forty two james bradley sixteen ninety two to seventeen sixty two chronology of newton's life isaac newton was born at woolsthorpe near grantham lincolnshire on christmas day sixteen forty two his father a small freehold farmer also named isaac died before his birth his mother knee hannah ayscow in two years married a mr smith rector of north witham but was again left a widow in sixteen fifty six his uncle w ayscow was rector of a near parish and a graduate of trinity college cambridge at the age of fifteen isaac was removed from school at grantham to be made a farmer of but as it seemed he would not make a good one his uncle arranged for him to return to school and thence to cambridge where he entered trinity college as a subsizer in sixteen sixty one studied descartes geometry found out a method of infinite series in sixteen sixty five and began the invention of fluxions in the same year and the next he was driven from cambridge by the plague in sixteen sixty six at woolsthorpe the apple fell in 1667 he was elected a fellow of his college, and in 1669 was specially noted as possessing an unparalleled genius by Dr. Barrow, 
first Lucasian professor of mathematics. The same year, Dr. Barrow retired from his chair in favor of Newton, who was thus elected at the age of twenty-six. He lectured first on optics with great success. Early in 1672, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society, and communicated his researches in optics, his reflecting telescope, and his discovery of the compound nature of white light. Annoying controversies arose, but he nevertheless contributed good many other most important papers in optics, including observations in diffraction and colors of thin plates. He also invented the modern sextant. In 1672, a letter from Paris was read at the Royal Society concerning a new and accurate determination of the size of the earth by Picard. When Newton heard of it, he began the Principia, working in silence. In 1684 arose a discussion between Wren, Hooke, and Halley concerning the law of inverse square as applied to gravity and the path that would cause the planets to describe. Hooke asserted that he had a solution, but he would not produce it. After waiting some time for it, Halley went to Cambridge to consult Newton on the subject, and thus discovered the existence of the first part of the Principia, wherein all this and much more was thoroughly worked out. On his representations to the Royal Society, the manuscript was asked for, and when complete was printed and published in 1687 at Halley's expense. While it was being completed, Newton and seven others were sent to uphold the dignity of the university before the Court of High Commission and Judge Jeffreys, against a high-handed action of James II. In 1682 he was sent to Parliament, and was present at the coronation of William and Mary, made friends with Locke, in 1692 Montague, Lord Halifax, made him warden, and in 1697 master of the mint. Whiston succeeded him as Lucasian professor. In 1693 the method of Fluxions was published. In 1703 Newton was made president of the Royal Society, and held the office to the end of his life. In 1705 he was knighted by Anne. In 1713 Cody's helped him to bring out a new edition of the Principia, completed as we now have it. On the 20th of March, 1727, he died, having lived from Charles I to George II. The Laws of Motion Discovered by Galileo Stated by Newton Law 1. If no force acts on a body in motion, it continues to move uniformly in a straight line. Law 2. If force acts on a body, it produces a change of motion proportional to the force and in the same direction. Law 3. When one body exerts force on another, that other reacts with equal force upon the one. Lecture 7. Sir Isaac Newton The little hamlet of Woolsthorpe lies close to the village of Colsterworth, about six miles south of Grantham, in the county of Lincoln. In the manor house of Woolsthorpe, on Christmas Day, 1642, was born to a widowed mother a sickly infant who seemed not long for this world. Two women were sent to North Witham to get some medicine for him, scarcely expecting to find him alive on their return. However, the child lived, became fairly robust, and was named Isaac after his father. What sort of man this father was, we do not know. He was what we may call a yeoman, that most wholesome and natural of all classes. He owned the soil he tilled, and his little estate had already been in the family for some hundred years. He was thirty-six when he died, and had only been married a few months. Of the mother, unfortunately, we know almost as little. We hear that she was recommended by a parishioner to the Reverend Barnabas Smith, an old bachelor in search of a wife, as the widow Newton, an extraordinary good woman, and so I expect she was a thoroughly sensible, practical, homely, industrious, middle-class, mill-on-the-floss sort of woman. However, on her second marriage she went to live at North Witham, and her mother, old Mrs. Ayscow, came to superintend the farm at Woolsthorpe and take care of young Isaac. By her second marriage, his mother acquired another piece of land, which she settled on her first son. So Isaac found himself heir to two little properties, bringing in a rental of about eighty pounds a year. He had been sent to a couple of village schools to acquire the ordinary accomplishments taught at those places, and for three years to the grammar school at Grantham, then conducted by an old gentleman named Mr. Stokes. He had not been very industrious at school, nor did he feel keenly the fascinations of the Latin grammar for he tells us that he was the last boy in the lowest class but one. He used to pay much more attention to the construction of kites and windmills and water-wheels, all of which he made to work very well. He also used to tie paper lanterns to the tail of his kite, so as to make the country folk fancy they saw a comet, and in general to disport himself as a boy should. 
It so happened, however, that he succeeded in thrashing in fair fight a bigger boy who was higher in the school, and who had given him a kick. His success awakened a spirit of emulation in other things than boxing, and young Newton speedily rose to be top of the school. Under these circumstances, at the age of fifteen, his mother, who had now returned to Woolsthorpe, which had been rebuilt, thought it was time to train him for the management of his land, and to make a farmer and grazier of him. The boy was doubtless glad to get away from school, but he did not take kindly to the farm, especially not to the marketing at Grantham. He and an old servant were sent to Grantham every week to buy and sell produce, but young Isaac used to leave his old mentor to do all the business, and himself retired to an attic in the house he had lodged in when at school, and there bury himself in books. After a time he didn't even go through the farce of visiting Grantham at all, but stopped on the road and sat under a hedge reading or making some model until his companion returned. We hear of him now in the great storm of 1658, the storm on the day Cromwell died, measuring the force of the wind by seeing how far he could jump with it and against it. He also made a water clock and set it up in the house at Grantham, where it kept fairly good time so long as he was in the neighborhood to look after it occasionally. At his own home, he made a couple of sundials on the side of the wall. He began by marking the position of the sun by the shadow of a peg driven into the wall, but this gradually developed in a regular dial, one of which remained for use for some time, and was still to be seen in the same place during the first half of the present century, only with the gnomon gone. In 1844 the stone on which it was carved was carefully extracted and presented to the Royal Society, who preserve it in their library. The letters W-T-O-N, roughly carved on it, are barely visible. All these pursuits must have been rather trying to his poor mother, and she probably complained to her brother, the rector of Burton Coggles. At any rate, this gentleman found Master Newton one morning under a hedge when he ought to have been farming, but as he found him working away at mathematics, like a wise man, he persuaded his sister to send the boy back to school for a short time, and then to Cambridge. On the day of his finally leaving school, old Mr. Stokes assembled the boys, made them a speech in praise of Newton's character and ability, and then dismissed him to Cambridge. At Trinity College a new world opened out before the country-bred lad. He knew his classics passably, but of mathematics and science he was ignorant, except through the smatterings he had picked up for himself. He devoured a book on logic and another on Kepler's optics, so fast that his attendance at lectures on these subjects became unnecessary. He also got hold of Euclid and of Descartes' geometry. The Euclid seemed childishly easy and was thrown aside, but the Descartes baffled him for a time. However, he set to it again and again, and before long mastered it. He threw himself heart and soul into mathematics, and very soon made some remarkable discoveries. First he discovered the binomial theorem, familiar now to all who have done any algebra, unintelligible to others, and therefore I say nothing about it. By the age of twenty-one or two he had begun his great mathematical discovery of infinite series and fluxions, now known by the name of differential calculus. He wrote these things out and must have been quite absorbed in them, but it never seems to have occurred to him to publish them or to tell anyone about them. In 1664 he noticed some halos round the moon, and as his manner was he measured their angles, the small ones three and five degrees each, the larger one twenty-two degrees thirty-five minutes. Later he gave their theory. Small colored halos round the moon are often seen, and are said to be a sign of rain. They are produced by the action of minute globules of water, or cloud particles, upon light, and are brightest when the particles are nearly equal in size. They are not like the rainbow, every part of which is due to light that has entered a raindrop, and been refracted and reflected with prismatic separation of colors. A halo is caused by particles so small as to be almost comparable with the size of waves of light, in a way which is explained in optics, under the head diffraction. It may be easily imitated by dusting an ordinary piece of window glass over with lycopodium, placing a candle near it, and then looking at the candle flame through the dusty glass from a fair distance. Or you may look at the image of a candle in a dusted looking glass. Lycopodium dust is specially suitable, for its granules are remarkably equal in size. The large halo, more rarely seen, of angular radius 22 degrees 35 minutes, is due to another cause again and is a prismatic effect, although it exhibits hardly any color. The angle twenty-two and a half degrees is characteristic of refraction in crystals with angles of sixty degrees, and refractive index about the same as water, 
In other words, this halo is caused by ice crystals in the higher regions of the atmosphere. He almost the same year observed a comet, and sat up so late watching it that he made himself ill. By the end of the year he was elected to a scholarship and took his B.A. degree. The order of merit for that year never existed or has not been kept. It would have been interesting, not as a testimony to Newton, but to the sense or nonsense of the examiners. The oldest professorship of mathematics at the University of Cambridge, the Lucasian, had not then been long founded, and its first occupant was Dr. Isaac Barrow, an eminent mathematician, and a kind old man. With him, Newton made good friends, and was helpful in preparing a treatise on optics for the press. His help is acknowledged by Dr. Barrow in the preface which states that he had corrected several errors and made some capital additions of his own. Thus we see that, although the chief part of his time was devoted to mathematics, his attention was already directed to both optics and astronomy. Kepler, Descartes, Galileo all combined some optics with astronomy. Tycho and the old ones combined alchemy. Newton dabbled in this also. Newton reached the age of twenty-three in 1665, the year of the Great Plague. The plague broke out in Cambridge as well as in London, and the whole college was sent down. Newton went back to Woolsthorpe, his mind teeming with ideas, and spent the rest of this year and part of the next in quiet pondering. Somehow or other he had got hold of the notion of centrifugal force. It was six years before Hagen's discovered and published the laws of centrifugal force, but in some quiet way of his own Newton knew about it and applied the idea to the motion of the planets. We can almost follow the course of his thoughts as he brooded and meditated on the great problem which had taxed so many previous thinkers. What makes the planets move round the sun? Kepler had discovered how they moved, but why did they so move? What urged them? Even the how took a long time. All the time of the Greeks, through Ptolemy, the Arabs, Copernicus, Tycho, circular motion, epicycles, and eccentrics had been the prevailing theory. Kepler, with his marvellous industry, had wrested from Tycho's observations the secret of their orbits. They moved in ellipses with the sun in one focus. Their rate of description of area, not their speed, was uniform and proportional to time. Yes, and a third law, a mysterious law of unintelligible import, had also yielded itself to his penetrating industry, a law the discovery of which had given him the keenest delight, and excited an outburst of rapture, viz., that there was a relation between the distances and the periodic times of the several planets. The cubes of the distances were proportional to the squares of the times for the whole system. This law, first found true for the six primary planets, he had also extended, after Galileo's discovery, to the four secondary planets, or satellites, of Jupiter. But all this was working in the dark. It was only the first step. This empirical discovery of facts, the facts were so, but how came they so? What made the planets move in this particular way? Descartes' vortices was an attempt, a poor and imperfect attempt, at an explanation. It had been hailed and adopted throughout Europe for want of a better, but it did not satisfy Newton. No, it proceeded on a wrong tack, and Kepler had proceeded on a wrong tack in imagining spokes or rays sticking out from the sun and driving the planets round like a piece of mechanism or millwork. For note that all these theories are based on a wrong idea. The idea these, that some force is necessary to maintain a body in motion. But this was contrary to the laws of motion as discovered by Galileo. You know that during his last years of blind helplessness at Arcetri, Galileo had pondered and written much on the laws of motion, foundation of mechanics. In his early youth at Pisa, he had been similarly occupied. He had discovered the pendulum. He had refuted the Aristotelians by dropping weights from the leaning tower, which we must rejoice that no earthquake has yet injured. And he had returned to mechanics at intervals all his life. And now, when his eyes were useless for astronomy, when the outer world has become to him only a prison to be broken by death, he returns once more to the laws of motion, and produces the most solid and substantial work of his life. For this is Galileo's main glory, not his brilliant exposition of the Copernican system, not his flashes of wit at the expense of a moribund philosophy, not his experiments on floating bodies, not even his telescope and astronomical discoveries, though these are the most taking and dazzling at first sight. No, his main glory and title to immortality consists in this, that he first laid the foundation of mechanics on a firm and secure basis of experiment, reasoning, and observation. He first discovered the true laws of motion. I said little of this achievement in my lecture on him, for the work was written towards the end of his life, and I had no time then. 
but I knew I should have to return to it before we came to Newton, and here we are. You may wonder how the work got published when so many of his manuscripts were destroyed. Horrible to say, Galileo's own son destroyed a great bundle of his father's manuscripts, thinking, no doubt, thereby to save his own soul. This book on mechanics was not burnt, however. The fact is it was rescued by one or other of his pupils, Torricelli or Viviani, who were allowed to visit him in his last two or three years. It was kept by them for some time, and then published surreptitiously in Holland. Not that there is anything in it bearing in any visible way on any theological controversy, but it is unlikely that the Inquisition would have suffered it to pass notwithstanding. I have appended to the summary preceding this lecture the three axioms or laws of motion discovered by Galileo. They are stated by Newton with unexampled clearness and accuracy, and are hence known as Newton's laws, but they are based on Galileo's work. The first is the simplest, though ignorance of it gave the ancients a deal of trouble. It is simply a statement that force is needed to change the motion of a body, i.e., that if no force act on a body, it will continue to move uniformly both in speed and direction, in other words, steadily in a straight line. The old idea had been that some force was needed to maintain motion. On the contrary, the first law asserts some force is needed to destroy it, leave a body alone, free from all friction or other retarding forces, and it will go on forever. The planetary motion through empty space therefore wants no keeping up. It is not the motion that demands a force to maintain it, it is the curvature of the path that needs a force to produce it continually. The motion of a planet is approximately uniform so far as speed is concerned, but it is not constant in direction. It is nearly a circle. The real force needed is not a propelling but a deflecting force. The second law asserts that when a force acts, the motion changes, either in speed or in direction, or both. At a pace proportional to the magnitude of the force, and in the same direction as that in which the force acts. Now since it is almost solely in direction that planetary motion alters, a deflexing force only is needed. A force at right angles to the direction of motion, a force normal to the path. Considering the motion as circular, a force along the radius, a radial or centripetal force, must be acting continually. Whirl a weight round and around by a bit of elastic, the elastic is stretched. Whirl it faster, it is stretched more. The moving mass pulls at the elastic, that is its centrifugal force. The hand at the center pulls also, that is centripetal force. The third law asserts that these two forces are equal, and together constitute the tension in the elastic. It is impossible to have one force alone, there must be a pair. You can't push hard against a body that offers no resistance. Whatever force you exert upon a body, with that same force the body must react upon you. Action and reaction are always equal and opposite. Sometimes an absurd difficulty is felt with respect to this. Even by engineers, they say, if the cart pulls against the horse with precisely the same force as the horse pulls the cart, why should the cart move? Why on earth not? The cart moves because the horse pulls it, and because nothing else is pulling it back. Yes, they say, the cart is pulling back. But what is it pulling back? Not itself, surely. No, the horse. Yes, certainly the cart is pulling at the horse. If the cart offered no resistance, what would be the good of the horse? That is what he's for, to overcome the pullback of the cart. But nothing is pulling the cart back, except, of course, a little friction. And the horse is pulling it forward, hence it goes forward. There's no puzzle at all, when once you realize that there are two bodies and two forces acting, and that one force acts on each body. If indeed two balanced forces acted on one body, that would be an equilibrium. But the two equal forces contemplated in the third law act on two different bodies, and neither is an equilibrium. So much for the third law, which is extremely simple, though it is extraordinarily far-reaching consequences, and when combined with a denial of action at a distance, is precisely the principle of the conservation of energy. Attempts at perpetual motion may all be regarded as attempts to get around this third law, on the subject of the second law, a great deal more has to be said before it can be, in any proper sense, even partially appreciated. But a complete discussion of it would involve a treatise on mechanics. It is the law of mechanics. One aspect of it we must attend to now in order to deal with the motion of the planets, and that is the fact that the change of motion of a body depends solely and simply on the force acting, and not at all upon what the body happens to be doing at the time it acts. It may be stationary, or it may be moving in any direction, that makes no difference. Thus referring back to the summary preceding Lecture 4, it is there stated that a dropped body falls 16 feet in the first second, that in two seconds it falls 64 feet, and so on, in proportion to the square of the time. 
so also will it be the case with a thrown body but the drop must be reckoned from its line of motion the straight line which but for gravity it would describe thus the stone thrown from o with the velocity the product of o and a would in one second find itself at a and two seconds at b and three seconds at c and so on in accordance with the first law of motion if no force acted but if gravity acts it will have fallen sixteen feet by the time it would have got to a and so will find itself at p in two seconds it will be at q having fallen a vertical height of sixty-four feet in three seconds it will be at r one hundred and forty-four feet below c and so on its actual path will be a curve which in this case is a parabola if a cannon is pointed horizontally over a level plane the cannon ball will be just as much affected by gravity as if it were dropped and so will strike the plane at the same instance as another which was simply dropped where it started one ball may have gone a mile, and the other only dropped a hundred feet or so. But the time needed by both for the vertical drop will be the same. The horizontal motion of one is an extra, and is due to the powder. As a matter of fact, the path of a projectile in vacuo is only approximately a parabola. It is instructive to remember that it is really an ellipse with one focus very distant, but not at infinity. One of its foci is the center of the Earth. A projectile is really a minute satellite of the Earth's and in vacuo it accurately obeys all Kepler's laws. It happens not to be able to complete its orbit, because it was started inconveniently close to the Earth, whose bulk gets in its way. But in that respect the Earth is to be reckoned as a gratuitous obstruction, like a target, but a target that differs from most targets in being hard to miss. Now consider circular motion in the same way. Say a ball whirled round by a string. Attending to the body at O, it is for an instant moving towards A and if no force acted it would get to A, in a time which for brevity we may call a second. But a force, the pull of the string, is continually drawing it towards S, and so it really finds itself at P, having described the circular arc OP, which may be considered to be compounded of and analyzable into the rectilinear motion OA and the drop AP. At P it is for an instant moving towards B, and the same process therefore carries it to Q, in the third second it gets to R, and so on, always falling, so to speak, from its natural rectilinear path towards the center, but never getting any nearer to the center. The force with which it has thus to be constantly pulled in towards the center, or which is the same thing, the force with which it is tugging at whatever constraint it is that holds it in, is the product of M and V squared divided by R, where M is the mass of the particle, V its velocity, and R the radius of its circle of movement. This is the formula first given by Hagen's for centrifugal force. We may find it convenient to express it in terms of the time of the one revolution, say, capital T. It is easily done, since plainly capital T equals circumference divided by speed, which equals the product of 2 pi r divided by v. So the above expression for centrifugal force becomes the product 4 pi squared m r divided by capital T squared. As to the fall of the body towards the center, every microscopic unit of time is easily reckoned. For by Euclid 3.36 and figure 58, AP, A, A prime equals A, O squared. Take A, very near O, then A, O equals V, T. And A, A prime equals 2, R. So AP equals the product of V squared and T squared divided by 2, R, which equals the product of 2, pi squared r t squared divided by capital T squared, or the fall per second is the product of 2 pi squared r divided by capital T squared, r being its distance from the center and capital T its time of going once round. In the case of the moon, for instance, r is 60 earth radii, more exactly 60.2, and capital T is a lunar month, or more precisely 27 days, 7 hours, 43 minutes, and 11 and a half seconds. Hence the moon's deflection from the tangential or rectilinear path every minute comes out as very closely sixteen feet, the true size of the earth being used. Returning now to the case of a small body revolving around a big one, and assuming a force directly proportional to the mass of both bodies, and then inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, i.e., assuming the known force of gravity, it is the product of gamma, capital M, and M, divided by R squared, or gamma is a constant called the gravitational constant, to be determined by experiment. If this is the centripetal force pulling a planet or satellite in, it must be equal to the centrifugal force of this latter, viz. 
the product of four pi squared m r divided by capital t squared equate the two together and at once we get r cubed divided by capital t squared equals gamma divided by four pi squared times capital m or in the words the cube of the distance divided by the square of the periodic time for every planet or satellite of the system under consideration will be constant and proportional to the mass of the central body this is kepler's third law with a notable addition it is stated above for circular motion only so as to avoid geometrical difficulties but even so it is very instructive the reason of this proportion between r cubed and capital t squared is at once manifest and as soon as the constant gamma became known the mass of the central body the sun in the case of a planet the earth in the case of the moon jupiter in the case of his satellites was at once determined newton's reasoning at this time might however be better displayed perhaps by altering the order of these steps a little as thus the centrifugal force of a body is proportional to r cubed divided by capital t squared but by kepler's third law r cubed divided by capital t squared is constant for all planets reckoning r from the sun hence the centripetal force needed to hold in all the planets will be a single force emanating from the sun and varying inversely with the square of the distance from that body such a force is at once necessary and sufficient such a force would explain the motion of the planets but then all this proceeds on a wrong assumption that the planetary motion is circular will it hold for elliptic orbits will an inverse square law of force keep a body moving in an elliptic orbit or about the sun in one focus this is a far more difficult question newton solved it but i do not believe that even he could have solved it except that he had at his disposal two mathematical engines of great power the cartesian method of treating geometry and his own method of fluxions one can explain the elliptic motion now mathematically but hardly otherwise and i must be content to state that the double fact is true viz that an inverse square law will move the body in an ellipse or other conic section with the sun in one focus and that if a body so moves it must be acted on by an inverse square law this then is the meaning of the first and third laws of kepler what about the second what is the meaning of the equable description of areas well that rigorously proves that a planet is acted on by a force directed to the centre about which the rate of description of area is equable it proves in fact that the sun is the attracting body and that no other force acts but first of all if the first law of motion is obeyed i e if no force acts and if the path be equally subdivided to represent equal times and straight lines be drawn from the divisions to any point whatever all these areas thus enclosed will be equal because they are triangles on equal base and of the same height euclid one see figure fifty nine s being any point whatever and a b c successive positions of a body now at each of the successive instants let the body receive a sudden blow in the direction of that same point s sufficient to carry it from a to d in the same time as it would have got to b if left alone the result will be that there will be a compromise and it will really arrive at p traveling along the diagonal of the parallelogram a p the area its radius vector sweeps out is therefore s a p instead of what it would have been s a b but then these two areas are equal because they are triangles on the same base a s and between the same parallels b p a s for by the parallelogram law b p is parallel to a d hence the area that would have been described is described and as all the areas were equal in the case of no force they remain equal when the body receives a blow at the end of every equal interval of time provided that every blow is actually directed to s the point to which radii vectors are drawn it is instructive to see that it does not hold if the blow is any otherwise directed for instance as in figure sixty one when the blow is along a e the body finds itself at p at the end of the second interval but the area s a p is by no means equal to s a b and therefore not equal to s o a the area swept out in the first interval in order to modify figure sixty so as to represent continuous motion and steady forces we have to take the sides of the polygon o a p q very numerous and very small in the limit infinitely numerous and infinitely small the path then becomes a curve and the series of blows becomes a steady force directed towards s about whatever point therefore the rate of description of areas is uniform that point and no other must be the centre of all the force there is if there be no force as in figure fifty nine well and good but if there be any force however small not directed towards s then the rate of description of areas about s cannot be uniform 
Kepler, however, says that the rate of description of areas of each planet about the sun is, by Tycho's observations, uniform. Hence the sun is the center of all the force that acts on them, and there is no other force, not even friction. That is the moral of Kepler's second law. We may also see from it that gravity does not travel like light, so as to take time on its journey from sun to planet. For, if it did, there would be a sort of aberration, and the force on its arrival could no longer be accurately directed to the center of the sun. See Nature, Volume 46, page 497. It is a matter for accuracy of observation, therefore, to decide whether the minutest trace of such deviation can be detected, i.e., within what limits of accuracy Kepler's second law is now known to be obeyed. I will content myself by saying that the limits are extremely narrow. Reference may be made also to page 208. Thus, then, it became clear to Newton that the whole solar system depended on a central force emanating from the sun, and varying inversely with the square of the distance from him. For by that hypothesis all the laws of Kepler concerning these motions were completely accounted for, and, in fact, the laws necessitated the hypothesis and established it as in theory. Similarly, the satellites of Jupiter were controlled by a force emanating from Jupiter and varying according to the same law, and again our moon must be controlled by a force from the earth, decreasing with the distance according to the same law. Grant this hypothetical attracting force pulling the planets towards the sun, pulling the moon towards the earth, and the whole mechanism of the solar system is beautifully explained. If only one could be sure there was such a force. It was one thing to calculate out what the effects of such a force would be, it was another to be able to put one's finger upon it and say, this is the force that actually exists and is known to exist. We must picture him meditating in the garden on this want, an attractive force towards the earth. If only such an attractive force pulling down bodies to the earth existed, an apple falls from a tree. Why, it does exist. There is gravitation, common gravity that makes bodies fall and gives them their weight. Wanted a force tending towards the center of the earth, it is to hand. It is common old gravity that has been known so long, that was perfectly familiar to Galileo, and probably to Archimedes. Gravity that regulates the motion of projectiles. Why should it only pull stones and apples? Why should it not reach as high as the moon? Why should it not be the gravitation of the sun that is the central force acting on all the planets? Surely the secret of the universe is discovered. But wait a bit. Is it discovered? Is this force of gravity sufficient for the purpose? It must vary inversely with the square of the distance from the center of the earth. How far is the moon away? Sixty earth radii. Hence the force of gravity at the moon's distance can only be one thirty-sixth hundredth of what it is on the earth's surface. So instead of pulling it sixteen feet per second, it should pull it sixteen thirty-six hundredths feet per second, or sixteen feet a minute. How can one decide whether such a force is able to pull the moon the actual amount required? To Newton this would seem only like a sum in arithmetic. Out with the pencil and paper, and reckon how much the moon falls towards the earth in every second of its motion. Is it sixteen thirty-six hundredths? That is what it ought to be, but is it? The size of the earth comes into the calculation. Sixty miles makes a degree. Three hundred sixty degrees is circumference. This gives, as the earth's diameter, six thousand eight hundred seventy-three miles. Work it out. The answer is not sixteen feet a minute. It is thirteen point nine feet. Surely a mistake of calculation. No, it is no mistake. There is something wrong in the theory. Gravity is too strong. Instead of falling towards the earth, five and a third hundredths of an inch every second, as it would under gravity, the moon only falls four and two third hundredths of an inch per second. With such a discovery in his grasp at the age of twenty-three, he is disappointed. The figures do not agree, and he cannot make them agree. Either gravity is not the force in action, or else something interferes with it. Possibly gravity does part of the work, and the vortices of Descartes interfere with it. He must abandon the fascinating idea for the time. In his own words, he laid aside at that time any further thought of the matter. So far as it is known, he never mentioned his disappointment to a soul. He might, perhaps, if he had been at Cambridge, but he was a shy and solitary youth, and just as likely he might not. Up in Lincolnshire in the seventeenth century, who was there for him to consult? True, he might have rushed into a premature publication, after our nineteenth-century fashion, but that was not his method. Publication never seemed to have occurred to him. His reticence now is noteworthy, but later on it is perfectly astonishing. He is so absorbed in making discoveries that he actually has to be reminded to tell anyone about them, and someone else always has to see to the printing and publishing for him. 
I have entered thus fully into what I conjecture to be the stages of this early discovery of the law of gravitation as applicable to the heavenly bodies, because it is frequently and commonly misunderstood. It is sometimes thought that he discovered the force of gravity. I hope I have made it clear that he did no such thing. Every educated man long before his time, if asked why bodies fell, would reply just as glibly as they do now, because the earth attracts them, or because of the force of gravity. His discovery was that the motions of the solar system were due to the action of a central force, directed to the body at that center of the system, and varying inversely with the square of the distance from it. This discovery was based upon Kepler's laws. It was clear and certain. It might have been published had he so chosen. But he did not like hypothetical and unknown forces. He tried to see whether the known force of gravity would serve. This discovery at that time he failed to make, owing to a wrong numerical datum. The size of the earth he only knew from the common doctrine of sailors that sixty miles make a degree, and that threw him out. Instead of falling sixteen feet a minute, as it ought under gravity, it only fell thirteen point nine feet, so he abandoned the idea. We do not find that he returned to it for sixteen years. End of Lecture 7、Lecture、Eight of Pioneers of Science By Sir Oliver Lodge, Lecture Eight. Newton and the Law of Gravitation. We left Newton at the age of twenty-three on the verge of discovering the mechanism of the solar system, deterred therefrom only by an error in the then imagined size of the Earth. He had proved from Kepler's laws that the centripetal force directed to the sun, and varying as the inverse square of the distance from that body. Would account for the observed planetary motions, and that a similar force directed to the Earth would account for the lunar motions. And it had struck him that this force might be the very same as the familiar force of gravitation, which gave to bodies their weight. But in attempting a numerical verification of this idea in the case of the moon, he was led by the then received notion that sixty miles made a degree on the Earth's surface into an erroneous estimate of the size of the moon's orbit. Being thus baffled in obtaining such verification, he laid the matter aside for a time. The anecdote of the apple we learn from Voltaire, who had it from Newton's favorite niece, who, with her husband, lived and kept house for him all his later life. It is very like one of those anecdotes which are easily invented and believed in, and very often turn out on scrutiny to have no foundation. Fortunately, this anecdote is well authenticated, and moreover is intrinsically probable. I say fortunately because it is always painful to have to give up these child-learnt anecdotes, like Alfred and the cakes, and so on. This anecdote of the apple we need not resign. The tree was blown down in 1820, and part of its wood is preserved. I have mentioned Voltaire in connection with Newton's philosophy. This acute critic, at a later stage, did a good deal to popularize it throughout Europe, and to overturn that of his own countryman Descartes. Cambridge rapidly became Newtonian, but Oxford remained Cartesian for fifty years or more. It is curious what little hold science and mathematics have ever secured in the older and more ecclesiastical university. The pride of possessing Newton has, however, no doubt been the main stimulus to the special pursuits of Cambridge. He now began to turn his attention to optics, and as was usual with him, his whole mind became absorbed in this subject. As if nothing else had ever occupied him, his cash book for this time had been discovered, and the entries show that he is buying prisms and lenses and polishing powder at the beginning of 1667. He was anxious to improve telescopes by making more perfect lenses than had ever been used before. Accordingly, he calculated out their proper curves, just as Descartes had also done, and then proceeded to grind them as near as he could to those figures. But the images did not please him. They were always blurred and rather indistinct. At length, it struck him that perhaps it was not the lenses, but the light, which was at fault. Perhaps light was so composed that it could not be focused accurately to a sharp and definite point. Perhaps the law of refraction, 
was not quite accurate, but only an approximation. So he bought a prism to try the law. He let the sunlight through a small round hole and a window shutter, inserted the prism in the light, and received the deflected beam on a white screen. Turning the prism about till it was deviated as little as possible, the patch on the screen was not a round disk, as it would have been without the prism, but was an elongated oval, and was colored at its extremities. Evidently refraction was not a simple geometrical deflection of a ray. There was a spreading out as well. Why did the image thus spread out? If it were due to irregularities in the glass, a second prism should rather increase them. But a second prism, when held in appropriate position, was able to neutralize the dispersion and to reproduce the simple round white spot without deviation. Evidently the spreading out of the beam was connected in some definite way with its refraction. Could it be that the light particles after passing through the prism traveled in variously curved lines, as spinning racket balls do? To examine this he measured the length of the oval patch when the screen was at different distances from the prism, and found that the two things were directly proportional to each other. Doubling the distance of the screen doubled the length of the patch. Hence the rays traveled in straight lines from the prism, and the spreading out was due to something that occurred within its substance. Could it be that white light was compound, was a mixture of several constituents, and that its different constituents were differently bent? No sooner thought than tried. Pierce the screen to let one of the constituents through, and interpose a second prism in its path. If the spreading out depended on the prism only, it should spread out just as much as before. But if it depended on the complex character of white light, this isolated simple constituent should be able to spread out no more. It did not spread out any more. A prism had no more dispersive power over it. It was deflected by the appropriate amount, but it was not analyzed into constituents. It differed from sunlight in being simple. With many ingenious and beautifully simple experiments, which are quoted in full in several books on optics, he clinched the argument and established his discovery. White light was not simple but compound. It could be sorted out by a prism into an infinite number of constituent parts, which were differently refracted, and the most striking of which Newton named violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. At once the true nature of color became manifest. Color resided not in the colored object, as had till now been thought, but in the light which illuminated it. Red glass, for instance, adds nothing to sunlight. The light does not get dyed red by passing through the glass. All that the red glass does is to stop and absorb a large part of the sunlight. It is opaque to the larger portion, but it is transparent to that particular portion which affects our eyes with the sensation of red. The prism acts as a sieve, sorting out the different kinds of light. Colored media act like filters, stopping certain kinds but allowing the rest to go through. Leonardo's and all the ancient doctrines of color had been singularly wrong. Color is not in the object, but in the light. Goethe, in his Farbenlehre, endeavored to controvert Newton and to reinstate something more like the old views, but his failure was complete. Refraction analyzed out the various constituents of white light and displayed them in the form of a series of overlapping images of the aperture, each of a different color. This series of images we call a spectrum, and the operation we now call spectrum analysis. The reason of the defect of lenses was now plain. It was not so much a defect in the lens as a defect of light. A lens acts by refraction and brings rays into a focus. If light be simple, it acts well. But if ordinary white light fall upon a lens, its different constituents have different foci. Every bright object is fringed with color, and nothing like a clear image can be obtained. A parallel beam passing through a lens becomes conical. But instead of a single cone, it is a sheaf or nest of cones, all having the edge of the lens as base, but each having a different vertex. The violet cone is innermost, near the lens, the red cone outermost, while the others lie in between. Beyond the crossing point or focus, the order of cones is reversed, as the above figure shows. Only the two marginal rays of the beam are depicted. If a screen be held anywhere nearer the lens, in the place marked 1, there will be a whitish center to the patch of light, and a red and orange fringe or border. 
held anywhere beyond the region two, the border of the patch will be blue and violet. Held about three, the color will be less marked than elsewhere. But nowhere can it be got rid of. Each point of an object will be represented in the image not by a point, but by a colored patch, a fact which amply explains the observed blurring and indistinctness. Newton measured and calculated the distance between violet and red foci, VR, in the diagram, and showed that it was one-fiftieth the diameter of the lens. To overcome this difficulty, called chromatic aberration, telescope glasses were made small in a very long focus, some of them so long that they had no tube, all of them egregiously cumbrous, yet it was with such instruments that all the early discoveries were made. With such an instrument, for instance, Huygens discovered the real shape of Saturn's rings. The defects of refractors seemed irremediable, being founded on the nature of light itself, so he gave up his glass works and proceeded to think of reflection from metal specula. A concave mirror forms an image just as a lens does, but since it does so without refraction or transmission through any substance, there is no accompanying dispersion or chromatic aberration. The first reflecting telescope he made was one inch diameter and six inches long, and magnified forty times. It acted as well as a three or four feet refractor of that day, and showed Jupiter's moons. So he made a larger one, now in the library of the Royal Society, London, with an inscription the first reflecting telescope invented by Sir Isaac Newton and made with his own hands. This has been the parent of most of the gigantic telescopes of the present day. Fifty years elapsed before it was much improved on, and then, first by Hadley and afterwards by Herschel and others, large and good reflectors were constructed. The largest telescope ever made, that of Lord Ross, is a Newtonian reflector, fifty feet long, six feet diameter, with a mirror weighing four tons. The sextant, as used by navigators, was also invented by Newton. The year after the plague, in 1667, Newton returned to Trinity College, and there continued his experiments on optics. It is specially to be noted that at this time, at the age of 24, Newton had laid the foundations of all his greatest discoveries. The theory of fluxions, or the differential calculus, the law of gravitation, or the complete theory of astronomy, the compound nature of white light, or the beginning of spectrum analysis. His later life was to be occupied in working these incipient discoveries out, but the most remarkable thing is that no one knew about any one of them. However, he was known as an accomplished young mathematician, and was made a fellow of his college. You remember that he had a friend there in the person of Dr. Isaac Barrow, first Lucasian professor of mathematics in the university. It happened about 1669 that a mathematical discovery of some interest was being much discussed, and Dr. Barrow happened to mention it to Newton, who said yes, he had worked out that and a few other similar things some time ago. He accordingly went and fetched some papers to Dr. Barrow, who forwarded them to other distinguished mathematicians, and it thus appeared that Newton had discovered theorems much more general than this special case that was exciting so much interest. Dr. Barrow, being anxious to devote his time more particularly to theology, resigned his chair the same year in favor of Newton, who was accordingly elected the Lucasian professorship, which he held for thirty years. This chair is now the most famous in the university, and is commonly referred to as the chair of Newton. Still, however, his method of fluxions was unknown, and still he did not publish it. He lectured first on optics, giving an account of his experiments. His lectures were afterwards published both in Latin and English, and are highly valued to this day. The fame of his mathematical genius came to the ears of the Royal Society, and a motion was made to get him elected a fellow of that body. The Royal Society, the oldest and most famous of all scientific societies, with a continuous existence, took its origin in some private meetings, got up in London by the Honorable Robert Boyle and a few scientific friends, during all the trouble of the Commonwealth. After the Restoration, Charles II in 1662 incorporated it under the Royal Charter, among the original members being Boyle, Hooke, Christopher Wren, and other less famous names. Boyle was a great experimenter, a worthy follower of Dr. Gilbert. Hooke began as his assistant, but being of a most extraordinary ingenuity, 
He rapidly rose so as to exceed his master in importance. Fate has been a little unkind to Hook in placing him so near to Newton. Had he lived in an ordinary age, he would undoubtedly have shone as a star of the first magnitude. With great ingenuity, remarkable scientific insight, and consummate experimental skill, he stands in many respects almost on a level with Galileo. But it is difficult to see stars, even of the first magnitude, when the sun is up, and thus it happens that the name and fame of this brilliant man are almost lost in the blaze of Newton. Of Christopher Wren I need not say much. He is well known as an architect, but he was a most accomplished all-round man, and had a considerable taste and faculty for science. These, then, were the luminaries of the Royal Society at the time we are speaking of, and to them Newton's first scientific publication was submitted. He communicated to them an account of his reflecting telescope, and presented them with the instrument. Their reception of it surprised him. They were greatly delighted with it, and wrote specially thanking him for the communication, and assuring him that all right should be done him in the matter of the invention. The Bishop of Salisbury, Bishop Burnett, proposed him for election as a fellow, and elected he was. In reply he expressed his surprise at the value they set on the telescope, and offered, if they cared for it, to send them an account of a discovery which he doubts not will prove much more grateful than the communication of that instrument. Quote, being in my judgment the oddest, if not the most considerable detection, that has recently been made into the operations of nature. Unquote. So he tells them about his optical researches and his discovery of the nature of white light, writing them a series of papers which were long afterwards incorporated and published as his optics, a magnificent work which of itself suffices to place its author in the first rank of the world's men of science. The nature of white light, the true doctrine of color, and the differential calculus, besides a good number of minor results, binomial theorem, reflecting telescopes, sextant, and the like, one would think it enough for one man's life work, but the masterpieces remain still to be mentioned. It is as when one is considering Shakespeare, King Lear, Macbeth, Othello, surely a sufficient achievement, but the masterpiece remains. Comparisons in different departments are but little help, perhaps. Nevertheless, it seems to me that in his own department, and considered simply as a man of science, Newton towers head and shoulders over not only his contemporaries, that is a small matter, but over every other scientific man who has ever lived, in a way that we can find no parallel for in other departments. Other nations admit his scientific preeminence with as much alacrity as we do. Well, we have arrived at the year 1672 in his election to the Royal Society. During the first year of his membership there, there was read at one of the meetings a paper giving an account of a very careful determination of the length of a degree, i.e. of the size of the earth, which had been made by Picard near Paris. The length of the degree turned out to be not sixty miles, but nearly seventy miles. How soon Newton heard of this we do not learn, probably not for some years. Cambridge was not so near London then as it is now, but ultimately it was brought to his notice. Armed with this new datum, his old speculation concerning gravity occurred to him. He had worked out the mechanics of the solar system on a certain hypothesis, but it remained a hypothesis somewhat out of harmony with the apparent fact. What if it should turn out to be true, after all? He took out his old papers and began again the calculation. If gravity were the force keeping the moon in its orbit, it would fall toward the earth sixteen feet every minute. How far did it fall? The newly known size of the earth would modify the figures. With intense excitement, he runs through the working, his mind leaps before his hand, and as he perceives the answer to be coming out right, all the infinite meaning and scope of his mighty discovery flashes upon him, and he can no longer see the paper. He throws down the pen, and the secret of the universe is, to one man, known. But of course it had to be worked out. The meaning might flash upon him, but its full detail required years of elaboration. The deeper and deeper consequences revealed themselves to him as he proceeded. For two years he devoted himself solely to this one object. During those years he lived but to calculate and think, and the most ludicrous stories are told concerning his entire absorption and inattention to ordinary affairs of life. Thus, for instance, when getting up in the morning, he would sit on the side of the bed half-dressed and remain like that till dinner-time. Often he would stay at home for days together, eating what was taken to him, but without apparently noticing what he was doing. 
One day an intimate friend, Dr. Stukely, called on him and found on the table a cover laid for his solitary dinner. After waiting a long time, Dr. Stukely removed the cover and ate the chicken underneath it, replacing and covering up the bones again. At length Newton appeared, and after greeting his friends, sat down to dinner. Upon lifting the cover, he said in surprise, "'Dear me, I thought I had not dined, but I see I have.' It was by this continuous application that the Principia was accomplished. Probably nothing of the first magnitude can be accomplished without something of the same absorbed unconsciousness and freedom from interruption. But though desirable and essential for the work, it was a severe tax upon the powers of the man. There is, in fact, no doubt that Newton's brain suffered temporary aberration after this effort for a short time. The attack was slight, and it has been denied. But there are letters extant which are inexplicable otherwise, and moreover, after a year or two he writes to his friends apologizing for strange and disjointed epistles, which he believed had been written without understanding clearly what he wrote. The derangement was, however, both slight and temporary, and it is only instructive to us, showing at what cost such a work as the Principia must be produced, even by so mighty a mind as that of Newton. The first part of the work, having been done, any ordinary mortal would have proceeded to publish it, but the fact is that after he had sent to the Royal Society his papers on optics, there had arisen controversies and objections, most of them rather paltry, to which he felt compelled to find answers. Many men would have enjoyed this part of the work, and taken it as evidence of interest and success, but to Newton's shy and retiring disposition these discussions were merely painful. He writes, indeed, his answers with great patience and ability, and ultimately converts the more reasonable of his opponents but he relieves his mind in the following letter to the secretary of the Royal Society. Quote, I see I have made myself a slave to philosophy, but if I get free of this present business, I will resolutely bid adieu to it eternally, except what I do for my private satisfaction, or leave to come out after me, for I see a man must either resolve to put out nothing new, or to become a slave to defend it. Unquote. And again in a letter to Leibniz. Quote, I have been so persecuted with discussions arising out of my theory of light that I blamed my own imprudence for parting with so substantial a blessing as my quiet to run after a shadow. Unquote. This shows how much he cared for contemporary fame. So he locked up the first part of the Principia in his desk, doubtless intending it to be published after his death, but fortunately this was not to be so. In 1683, among the leading lights of the Royal Society, the same sort of notions about gravity and the solar system began independently to be brooded. The theory of gravitation seemed to be in the air, and Wren, Hooke, and Halley had many a talk about it. Hooke showed an experiment with a pendulum, which he likened to a planet going around the sun. The analogy is more superficial than real. It does not obey Kepler's laws. Still, it was a striking experiment. They had guessed at a law of inverse squares, and their difficulty was to prove what curve a body subject to it would describe. They knew it ought to be an ellipse if it was to serve to explain the planetary motion, and Hooke said he could prove that an ellipse it was, but he was nothing of a mathematician, and the others scarcely believed him. Undoubtedly he had shrewd inklings of the truth, though his guesses were based on little else than a most sagacious intuition. He surmised also that gravity was the force concerned, and asserted that the path of an ordinary projectile was an ellipse, like the path of a planet, which is quite right. In fact, the beginnings of the discovery were beginning to dawn upon him in the well-known way in which things do dawn upon ordinary men of genius, and had Newton not lived, we should doubtless by the labors of a long chain of distinguished men, beginning with Hooke, Wren, and Halley, have been now in possession of all the truths revealed by the Principia. We should never have had them stated in the same form, nor proved with the same marvelous lucidity and simplicity, but the facts themselves we should by this time have arrived at. Their developments and completions, due to such men as Clairot, Euler, D'Alembert, Lagrange, Laplace, Airy, Le Verrier, Adams, we should of course not have had to the same extent, because the lives and energies of these great men would have been partially consumed in obtaining the main facts themselves. The youngest of the three questioners at the time we are speaking of was Edmund Halley, an able and a remarkable man. He had been at Cambridge, doubtless had heard Newton lecture, 
and had acquired a great veneration for him. In January 1684 we find Wren offering Hook and Halley a prize, in the shape of a book worth forty shillings. If they would either of them bring him within two months a demonstration that the path of a planet subject to an inverse square law would be an ellipse. Not in two months, nor yet in seven, was there any proof forthcoming. So at last in August Halley went over to Cambridge to speak to Newton about the difficult problem and secure his aid. Arriving at his rooms, he went straight to the point. He said, What path will a body describe if it be attracted by a center with a force varying as the inverse square of the distance, to which Newton at once replied, an ellipse. How on earth do you know? said Halley in amazement. Why, I have calculated it, and began hunting about for the paper. He actually couldn't find it just then, but sent it him shortly by post, and with it much more, in fact what appeared to be a complete treatise on motion in general. With his valuable burden, Halley hastened to the Royal Society and told them what he had discovered. The Society, at his representation, wrote to Mr. Newton asking leave that it might be printed. To this he consented, but the Royal Society wisely appointed Mr. Halley to see after him and jog his memory, in case he forgot about it. However, he set to work to polish it up and finish it, and added to it a great number of later developments and embellishments, especially the part concerning the lunar theory, which gave him a deal of trouble, and no wonder, for in the way he has put it, there never was a man yet living who could have done the same thing. Mathematicians regard the achievement now as men might stare at the work of some demigod of a bygone age, wondering what manner of man this was, able to wield such ponderous implements with such apparent ease. To Halley the world owes a great debt of gratitude, first for discovering the Principia, second for seeing it through the press, and third for defraying the cost of its publication out of his own scanty purse. For though he ultimately suffered no pecuniary loss, rather the contrary, yet there was considerable risk in bringing out a book which not a dozen men living could at the time comprehend. It is no small part of the merit of Halley that he recognized the transcendent value of the yet unfinished work, that he brought it to light and assisted in its becoming understood to the best of his ability. Though Halley afterwards became astronomer royal, lived to the ripe old age of eighty-six, and made many striking observations. Yet he would be the first to admit that nothing he ever did was at all comparable in importance to his discovery of the Principia, and he always used to regard his part in it with peculiar pride and pleasure. And how was the Principia received? Considering the abstruse nature of its subject, it was received with great interest and enthusiasm. In less than twenty years the edition was sold out, and copies fetched large sums. We hear of poor students copying out the whole in manuscript in order to possess a copy. Not by any means a bad thing to do, however many copies one may possess. The only useful way, really, to read a book like that is to pore over every sentence. It is no book to be skimmed. While the Principia was preparing for the press, a curious incident of contact between English history and the university occurred. It seems that James the Second, in his policy of Catholicizing the country, ordered both universities to elect certain priests to degrees without the ordinary oaths. Oxford had given way, and the dean of Christ Church was a creature of James' choosing. Cambridge rebelled, and sent eight of its members, among them Mr. Newton, to plead their cause before the court of high commission. Judge Jeffreys presided over the court, and threatened and bullied with his usual insolence. The vice-chancellor of Cambridge was deprived of office, the other deputies were silenced and ordered away. From the precincts of this court of justice, Newton returned to Trinity College to complete the Principia. By this time Newton was only forty-five years old, but his main work was done. His method of fluxions was still unpublished. His optics was published, only imperfectly. A second edition of the Principia, with additions and improvements, had yet to appear, but fame had now come upon him and with fame worries of all kinds. By some fatality, principally, no doubt, because of the interest they excited, every discovery he published was the signal for an outburst of criticism and sometimes of attack. I shall not go into these matters. They are now trivial enough, but it is necessary to mention them, because to Newton they evidently loomed large and terrible, and occasioned him acute torment. 
No sooner was the Principia put than Hook put in his claims for priority, and indeed his claims were not altogether negligible, for vague ideas of the same sort had been floating in his comprehensive mind, and he doubtless felt indistinctly conscious of a great deal more than he could really state or prove. By indiscreet friends these two great men were set somewhat at loggerheads, and worse might have happened had they not managed to come to close quarters and correspond privately in a quite friendly manner, instead of acting through the mischievous medium of third parties. In the next edition, Newton liberally recognizes the claims of both Hook and Wren. However, he takes warning betimes of what he has to expect, and writes to Halley that he will only publish the first two books, those containing general theorems on motion. The third book, concerning the system of the world, i.e., the application to the solar system, he says, quote, I now design to suppress. Philosophy is such an impertinently litigious lady that a man had as good be engaged in lawsuits as have to do with her. I found it so formerly, and now I am no sooner come near her again, but she gives me warning. The two books without the third will not so well bear the title Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, and therefore I had altered it to this, On the Free Motion of Two Bodies, but on second thoughts I retain the former title. Twill help the sales of the book, which I ought not to diminish, now tis yours. Unquote. However, fortunately, Halley was able to prevail upon him to publish the third book also. It is indeed the most interesting and popular of the three, as it contains all the direct applications to astronomy of the truths established in the other two. Some years later, when his method of fluxions was published, another and a worse controversy arose, this time with Leibniz, who had also independently invented the differential calculus. It was not so well recognized then how frequently it happens that two men independently and unknowingly work at the very same thing at the same time. The history of science is now full of such instances. But then the friends of each accused the other of plagiarism. I will not go into the controversy. It is painful and useless. It only served to embitter the later years of two great men, and it continued long after Newton's death, long after both their deaths, and can hardly be called ancient history even now. But fame brought other and less unpleasant distractions than controversies. We are a curious, practical, and rather stupid people, and our one idea of honoring a man is to vote for him in some way or other. So they sent Newton to Parliament. He went, I believe, as a Whig, but it is not recorded that he spoke. It is, in fact, recorded that he was once expected to speak when on a royal commission about some question of chronometers, but that he would not. However, I dare say he made a good average member. Then a little later it was realized that Newton was poor, that he still had to teach for his livelihood, and that though the Crown had continued his fellowship to him as Lucasian professor, without the necessity of taking orders, yet it was rather disgraceful that he should not be better off. So an appeal was made to the government on his behalf, and Lord Halifax, who exerted himself strongly in the matter, succeeding to office on the accession of William the Third, was able to make him ultimately master of the mint with a salary of some one thousand two hundred pounds a year. I believe he made rather a good master, and turned out excellent coins. Certainly he devoted his attention to his work there in a most exemplary manner. But what a pitiful business it all is. Here is a man sent by heaven to do certain things which no man else could do, and so long as he is comparatively unknown, he does them. But so soon as he is found out, he is clapped into a routine office with a big salary, and there is, comparatively speaking, an end of him. It is not to be supposed that he had lost his power, for he frequently solved problems very quickly, which had been given out by great continental mathematicians as a challenge to the world. We may ask why Newton allowed himself to be thus bandied about, instead of settling himself down to the work in which he was so preeminently great. Well, I expect your truly great man never realizes how great he is, and seldom knows where his real strength lies. Certainly Newton did not know it. He several times talks of giving up philosophy altogether, and though he never really does it, and perhaps the feeling is one only born of some temporary overwork, yet he does not sacrifice everything else to it, as he surely must had he been conscious of his own greatness. No, self-consciousness was the last thing that affected him. It is for a great man's contemporaries to discover him to make much of him, and to put him in surroundings where he may flourish luxuriantly in his own heaven-intended way. However, it is difficult for us to judge of these things, 
perhaps, if he had been maintained at the national expense, to do that for which he was preternaturally fitted, he might have worn himself out prematurely, whereas by giving him routine work the scientific world got the benefit of his matured wisdom and experience. It was no small matter to the young royal society to be able to have him as their president for twenty-four years. His portrait has hung over the president's chair ever since, and there I suppose it will continue to hang until the royal society becomes extinct. The events of his later life I shall pass over lightly. He lived a calm, benevolent life, universally respected and beloved. His silver-white hair, when he removed his peruke, was a venerable spectacle. A lock of it is still preserved, with many other relics, in the library of Trinity College. He died quietly, after a painful illness, at the ripe age of eighty-five. His body lay in state in the Jerusalem chamber, and he was buried in Westminster Abbey, six peers bearing the pall. These things are to be mentioned to the credit of the time and the country, for after we have seen the calamitous spectacle of the way Tycho and Kepler and Galileo were treated by their ungrateful and unworthy countries, it is pleasant to reflect that England, with all its mistakes, yet recognized her great man when she received him, and honored him with the best she knew how to give. Concerning his character, one need only say that it was what one would expect and wish. It was characterized by a modest, calm, dignified simplicity. He lived frugally with his niece and her husband, Mr. Conduit, who succeeded him as master of the mint. He never married, nor apparently did he ever think of doing so. The idea perhaps did not naturally occur to him any more than the idea of publishing his work did. He was always a deeply religious man and a sincere Christian, though somewhat of the Arian or Unitarian persuasion, so at least it is asserted by Orthodox divines who understand these matters. He studied theology more or less all his life, and towards the end was greatly interested in questions of biblical criticism and chronology. By some ancient eclipse or other he altered the recognized system of dates a few hundred years and his book on the prophecies of Daniel and the revelation of St. John, wherein he identifies the beast with the Church of Rome, in quite the orthodox way, is still by some admired. But in all these matters it is probable that he was a merely ordinary man, with natural acumen and ability doubtless, but nothing in the least superhuman. In science the impression he makes upon me is only expressible by words inspired, superhuman. And yet, if one realizes his method of work, and the calm, uninterrupted flow of all his earlier life, perhaps his achievements become more intelligible. When asked how he made his discoveries, he replied, quote, By always thinking unto them, I keep the subject constantly before me, and wait till the first dawnings open slowly by little and little into a full and clear light, unquote. That is the way, quiet, steady, continuous thinking, uninterrupted, and unharassed brooding. Much may be done under those conditions. Much ought to be sacrificed to obtain those conditions. All the best thinking work of the world has thus been done. Buffon said, Genius is patience. So says Newton, quote, If I have done the public any service this way, it is due to nothing but industry and patient thought. Unquote. Genius patience? No. It is not quite that. Or rather, it is much more than that. But genius without patience is like fire without fuel. It will soon burn itself out. End of Lecture 8 Lecture 9 of Pioneers of Science this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To learn more about LibriVox or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Thomas Kuzmorski. Pioneers of Science by Sir Oliver Lodge. Lecture number nine. Notes for Lecture nine. The Principia published 1687. Newton died 1727. The law of gravitation. Every particle of matter attracts every other particle of matter with a force proportional to the mass of each and to the inverse square of the distance between them. Some of Newton's deductions. 1. Kepler's second law, equable description of areas, proves that each planet is acted on by a force directed towards the sun as a center of force. 2. 
Kepler's first law proves that this central force diminishes in the same proportion as the square of the distance increases. 3. Kepler's third law proves that all the planets are acted on by the same kind of force, of an intensity depending on the mass of the sun. 4. So by knowing the length of year and distance of any planet from the sun, the sun's mass can be calculated in terms of of that of the earth five for the satellites the force acting depends on their mass and their central body a planet hence the mass of any planet possessing a satellite becomes known six the force constraining the moon in her orbit is the same gravity as gives terrestrial bodies their weight and regulates the motion of projectiles. Because, while a stone drops 16 feet in a second, the moon, which is 60 times as far from the center of the earth, drops 16 feet in a minute. 7. The moon is attracted not only by the earth, but also by the sun. Hence, its orbit is perturbed, and Newton calculated out the chief of these perturbations. Vis -vis the equation of the center, discovered by Hipparchus. A. The evection, discovered by Hipparchus and Ptolemy. B. The variation, discovered by Tycho Brahe. 7. The annual equation, discovered by Tycho Brahe. D. The retrogression of the nodes, then being observed at Greenwich by Flamsteed, E, the variation of inclination, then being observed at Greenwich by Flamsteed, F, the progression of the apses with an error of one half, G, the inequality of apogee previously unknown, H, the inequality of nodes previously unknown, 8, each planet is attracted not only by the sun, but by the other planets. Hence, their orbits are slightly affected by each other. Newton began the theory of planetary perturbations. He recognized the comets as members of the solar system, obedient to the same law of gravity, and moving in very elongated ellipses, so their return could be predicted. Example, Halley's Comet. 10. Applying the idea of centrifugal force to the Earth considered as a rotating body, he perceived that it could not be a true sphere, and calculated its oblateness, obtaining 28 miles greater equatorial than polar diameter. 11. Conversely, from the observed shape of Jupiter, or any planet, the length of its day could be estimated. 12. The so calculated shape of the Earth in combination with centrifugal force, causes the weight of bodies to vary with latitude, and Newton calculated the amount of this variation, 194 pounds, at pole balance, 195 pounds at equator. 13. A homogeneous sphere attracts as if its mass were concentrated at its center. For any other figure, such as an oblate spheroid, this is not exactly true. A hollow, concentric spherical shell exerts no force on small bodies inside it. 14. The Earth's equatorial protuberance, being acted on by the attraction of the sun and moon, must disturb its axis of rotation in a calculated manner, and thus is produced the precession of the equinoxes. The attraction of the planets on the same protuberance causes a smaller and rather different kind of precession. 15. The waters of the ocean are attracted towards the sun and moon on one side, and whirled a little further away than the solid earth on the other side. Hence, Newton explained all the main phenomena of the tides. 16. The sun's mass being known, he calculated the height of the solar tide. 17. From the observed heights of spring and neap tides, he determined the lunar tide and thence made an estimate of the mass of the moon. Reference table of numerical data. Masses in solar systems. Mercury, 0 0.065. Venus, 0 0.885. Earth, 1. Mars, 0 0.108. Jupiter, 300.8. Saturn, 89.7. The Sun... 316,000, the moon about 0 0.012.
height dropped by a stone in first second. Mercury, 7 feet. Venus, 15.8 feet. Earth, 16.1 feet. Mars, 6.2 feet. Jupiter, 45.0 feet. Saturn, 18.4 feet. The Sun, 436.0 feet. The Moon, 3.7 feet. Length of day or time of rotation. Mercury, 24 hours. Venus, 23 and a half hours. Earth, 24 hours. Mars, 24 and a half hours. Jupiter, 10 hours. Saturn, 10 and a half hours. The Sun, 608 hours. The Moon, 702 hours. The mass of the Earth taken above as unity is 6,000 trillion tons. Observatories. Uraniburg flourished from 1576 to 1597. The Observatory of Paris was founded in 1667. Greenwich Observatory in 1675. Astronomers Royal, Flamsteed, Haley, Bradley, Bliss, Masculine, Pond, Airy, Christie. Lecture number nine, Newton's Principia. The law of gravitation, above enunciated, in conjunction with the laws of motion, rehearsed at the end of the preliminary notes of Lecture 7, now supersedes the laws of Kepler and includes them as special cases. The more comprehensive law enables us to criticize Kepler's laws from a higher standpoint, to see how far they are exact and how far they are only approximations. They are, in fact, not precisely accurate, but the reason for every discrepancy now becomes abundantly clear and can be worked out by the theory of gravitation. We may treat Kepler's laws either as immediate consequences of the law of gravitation or as the known facts upon which that law was founded. Historically, the latter is the more natural plan, and it is thus that they are created in the first three statements of the above notes. But each proposition may be worked inversely, and we might state them thus. 1. The fact that the force acting on each planet is directed to the sun necessitates the equable description of areas. 2. The fact that the force varies as the inverse square of the distance necessitates motion in an ellipse or some other conic section with the sun in one focus. 3. The fact that one attracting body acts on all the planets with an inverse square law causes the cubes of their mean distances to be proportional to the squares of their periodic times. Not only these, but a multitude of other deductions follow rigorously from the simple datum that every particle of matter attracts every other particle with a force directly proportional to the mass of each and to the inverse square of their mutual distance. Those dealt with in the Principia are summarized above, and it will be convenient to run over them in order, with the object of giving some idea of the general meaning of each, without attempting anything too intricate, to be readily intelligible. Number 1. Kepler's second law, equable description of areas, proves that each planet is acted on by a force directed toward the sun as a center of force. The equable description of areas about a center of force has already been fully, though briefly, established. It is undoubtedly of fundamental importance and is the earliest instance of the serious discussion of central forces, i.e. of forces directed always to a fixed center. We may put it afresh thus. OA has been the motion of a particle in a unit of time. At A it receives a knock toward C, whereby in the next unit it travels along AD instead of AB. Now the area of the triangle CAD swept out by the radius vector in the unit time is one-half BH, one-half base times height, H being the perpendicular height of the triangle from the base AC. Now, the blow at A being along the base has no effect upon H, and consequently the area remains 
just what it would have been without the blow. A blow directly to any point other than C would at once alter the area of the triangle. One interesting deduction may at once be drawn. If gravity were a radiant force emitted from the sun with a velocity like that of light, the moving planet would encounter it at a certain apparent angle, aberration, and the force experienced would come from a point a little in advance of the sun. The rate of description of areas would thus tend to increase, whereas in reality it is constant. Hence, the force of gravity, if it travel at all, does so with a speed far greater than that of light. It appears to be practically instantaneous. CF Modern Views of Electricity, 126, end of chapter 12. Again, anything like a retarding effect of the medium through which the planets move would constitute a tangential force entirely undirected towards the sun. Hence, no such frictional or retarding force can appreciably exist. It is, however, conceivable that both these effects might occur and just neutralize each other. The neutralization is unlikely to be exact for all the planets, and the fact is that no trace of either effect has yet been discovered. The planets are, however, subject to focuses not directed towards the sun, vis-a-vis -vis their attractions for each other, and these perturbing forces do produce a slight discrepancy from Kepler's second law, but a discrepancy which is completely subject to calculation. Number two, Kepler's first law proves that this central force diminishes in the same proportion as the square of the distance increases. To prove the connection between the inverse square law of distance and the traveling in a conic section with the center of force in one focus, the other focus being empty, is not so simple. It obviously involves some geometry and must therefore be left to properly armed students. It may be useful to state that the inverse square law of distance although the simplest possible law for force emanating from a point or sphere is not to be regarded as self-evident or as needing no demonstration. The force of a magnetic pole on a magnetized steel scrap, for instance, varies as the inverse cube of the distance, and the curve described by such a particle would be quite different from a conic section. It would be a definite class of spiral, called Coates's spiral. Again, on an iron filing, the force of a single pole might vary more nearly as the inverse fifth power, and so on, even when the thing concerned is radiant in straight lines. Like light, the law of inverse squares is not universally true. Its truth assumes, first, that the source is a point or sphere, Next, that there is no reflection or refraction of any kind. And lastly, that the medium is perfectly transparent. The law of inverse squares by no means holds from a prairie fire, for instance, or from a lighthouse, or from a street lamp in a fog. Mutual perturbations, especially the pull of Jupiter, prevent the path of a planet from being really and truly an ellipse or indeed from being any simple re-entrant curve. Moreover, when a planet possesses a satellite, it is not the center of the planet which ever attempts to describe the Keplerian ellipse, but it is the common center of gravity of the two bodies. Thus, in the case of the Earth and Moon, the point which really does describe a close attempt to an ellipse is a point displaced about 3,000 miles from the center of the Earth towards the moon, and is therefore only 1,000 miles beneath the surface. Number three, Kepler's third law proves that all the planets are acted on by the same kind of force, of an intensity depending on the mass of the sun. The third law of Kepler, although it requires geometry to state and establish it for elliptic motion, for which it holds just as well as it does for circular motion, is very easy to establish for circular motion by anyone who knows about centrifugal force. If m is the mass of a planet, v its velocity, r the radius of its orbit, and t the time of describing it, 
2 pi r equals v t, and the centripetal force needed to hold it in its orbit is m v squared over r or 4 pi squared m r over t squared. Now, the force of gravitative attraction between the planet and the sun is gamma m s over r squared, where gamma is a fixed quantity called the gravitation constant. To be determined, if possible, by experiment once for all. Now, expressing the fact that the force of gravitation is the force holding the planet in, we write... 4 pi squared m r over t squared equals gamma m s over r squared. Whence, by the simplest algebra, r cubed m r over t squared equals gamma s over 4 pi squared. The mass of the planet has been cancelled out. The mass of the sun remains, multiplied by the gravitation constant, and is seen to be proportional to the cube of the distance divided by the square of the periodic time, a ratio which is therefore the same for all planets controlled by the sun. Hence, knowing r and t for any single planet, the value of gamma s is known. Number four. So by knowing the length of year and distance of any planet from the sun, the sun's mass can be calculated in terms of that of the earth. Number five. For the satellites, the force acting depends on the mass of their central body, a planet. Hence, the mass of any planet possessing a satellite becomes known. The same argument holds for any other system controlled by a central body. For instance, for the satellites of Jupiter, only instead of S, it will be natural to write J as meaning the mass of Jupiter. Hence, knowing R and T for any one satellite of Jupiter, the value of gamma J is known. Apply the argument also to the case of moon and earth. Knowing the distance and time revolution of our moon, the value of gamma E is at once determined. E being the mass of the earth. Hence, S and J, and in fact the mass of any central body possessing a visible satellite, are now known in terms of E, the mass of the Earth, or what is practically the same thing in terms of gamma, the gravitation constant. Observe that so far none of these qualities are known absolutely. Their relative values are known and are tabulated at the end of the notes above. But the finding of their absolute values is another matter which we must defer. But it may be asked if Kepler's third law only gives us the mass of a central body, how is the mass of a satellite to be known? Well, it is not easy. The mass of no satellite is known with much accuracy. Their mutual perturbations give us some data in the case of the satellites of Jupiter. But to our own moon, this method is, of course, inapplicable. Our moon perturbs at first sight nothing and accordingly its mass is not even yet known with exactness. The mass of comets, again, is quite unknown. All that we can be sure of is that they are smaller than a certain limit, else they would perturb the planets they pass near. Nothing of this sort has ever been detected. They are themselves perturbed plentifully, but they perturb nothing, hence we learn that their mass is small. The mass of a comet may, indeed, be a few million or even billion tons, but is quite small in astronomy. But now it may be asked, surely the moon perturbs the earth, swinging it round their common center of gravity, and really describing its own orbit about this point instead of about the earth's center. Yes, that is so, and a more precise consideration of Kepler's third law enables us to make a fair approximation to the position of this common center of gravity, and thus practically to weigh the moon, i.e., to compare its mass with that of the Earth, for their masses will be inversely as their respective distances from the common center of gravity or balancing point on the simple steel yard principle. Hitherto, we have not troubled ourselves about the precise point 
about which the revolution occurs but kepler's third law is not precisely accurate unless it is attended to the bigger the revolving body the greater is the discrepancy and we see in the table preceding lecture three on page fifty seven that jupiter exhibits an error which though very slight is greater than that of any of the other planets when the sun is considered the fixed center let the common center of gravity of earth and moon be displaced a distance x from the center of the earth then the moon's distance from the real center of revolution is not r but r minus x and the revolution of centrifugal force to gravitative attraction is strictly four pi squared over t squared times r minus x equals gamma e over r squared instead of what is in the text above and this gives a slightly modified third law from this equation if we have any distinct method of determining gamma e and the next section gives such a method we can calculate x and thus roughly weigh the moon since r minus x over r equals e over e plus m but to get anything like a reasonable result the data must be very precise number six the force constraining the moon in her orbit is the same gravity as gives terrestrial bodies their weight and regulates the motion of projectiles here we come to the newtonian verification already several times mentioned but because of its importance i will repeat it in other words the hypothesis to be verified is that the force acting on the moon is the same kind of force as acts on bodies we can handle and weigh and which gives them their weight now the weight of a mass m is commonly written mg where g is the intensity of terrestrial gravity a thing easily measured being indeed numerically equal to twice the distance of a stone drops in the first second of free fall see table page 205 hence expressing the weight of a body is due to gravity and remembering that the center of the earth's attraction is distant from us by one earth's radius r we can write m g equals gamma m e over r squared or gamma e equals g r squared equals ninety five thousand five hundred twenty two cubic miles per second per second but we already know gamma e in terms of the moon's motion as for pi squared r cubed over r squared approximately more accurately see preceding note this quantity is gamma parentheses e plus m and parentheses and bracket hence we can easily see if the two determinations of this quantity agree all these deductions are fundamental and may be considered as the foundation of the principia it was these that flashed upon newton during that moment of excitement when he learned the real size of the earth and discovered his speculations to be true the next are elaborations and amplifications of the theory such as in ordinary times are left for subsequent generations of theorists to discover and work out newton did not work out these remoter consequences of his theory completely by any means the astronomical and mathematical world has been working them out ever since but he carried the theory a great way and here it is that his marvelous power is most conspicuous it is this treatment of number seven the perturbations of the moon that perhaps most especially has struck all future mathematicians with amazement number seven number fourteen number fifteen these are the most inspired of the whole number seven the moon is attracted not only by the earth but by the sun also hence its orbit is perturbed and newton calculated out the chief of these perturbations now running through the perturbations page two or three in order the first is in parenthesis because it is mere eccentricity it is not a true perturbation at all and more properly belongs to kepler a the first true perturbation is what ptolemy called the evection the principal part of which is a periodic change in the ellipticity or eccentricity of the moon's orbit owing to the pull of the sun it is a complicated matter and newton only partially solved it i shall not attempt to give an account of it b the next the variation is a much simpler affair 
It is caused by the fact that, as the moon revolves around the earth, it is half the time nearer to the sun than the earth is, and so gets pulled more than the average, while for the other fortnight it is further from the sun than the earth is, and so gets pulled less. For the week during which it is changing from a decreasing half to a new moon, it is moving in the direction of the extra pull, and hence becomes new sooner than would have been expected. All next week it is moving against the same extra pull, and so arrives at quadrature half moon somewhat late. For the next fortnight it is in the region of too little pull. The earth gets pulled more than it does. The effect of this is to hurry it up for the third week, so that the full moon occurs a little early, and to retard it for the fourth week, so that the decreasing half moon, like the increasing half, occurs behind time again. Thus, each syzygy, as new and full are technically called, is too early. Each quadrature is too late. The maximum hurrying and slackening force being felt at the octants or intermediate 45 degree points. C. The annual equation is a fluctuation introduced into the other perturbations by reason of the varying distance of the disturbing body, the sun, at different seasons of the year. Its magnitude plainly depends simply on the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. Both these perturbations, B and C, Newton worked out completely. D and E. Next come the retrogression of the nodes and the variation of the inclination, which at the time were being observed at Greenwich by Flamsteed, from whom Newton frequently, but vainly, begged for data that he might complete their theory while he had his mind upon it. Fortunately, Halley succeeded Flamsteed as astronomer royal, see list at end of notes above, and then Newton would have no difficulty in gaining such information as the National Observatory could give. The inclination meant is the angle between the plane of the moon's orbit and that of the Earth. The plane of the Earth's orbit round the sun is called the elliptic. The plane of the moon's orbit round the Earth is inclined to it at a certain angle, which is slowly changing. Though, so, in a periodic manner, imagine a curtain ring bisected by a sheet of paper and tilted to a certain angle. It may be likened to the moon's orbit, cutting the plane of the elliptic. The two points at which the plane is cut by the ring are called nodes, and these nodes are not stationary, but are slowly regressing, i.e. traveling in a direction opposite to that of the moon itself. Also, the angle of tilt is varying slowly, oscillating up and down in the course of centuries. F. The two points in the moon's elliptical orbit where it comes nearest to or farthest from the Earth, i.e. the points at the extremity of the long axis of the ellipse, are called separately perigee and apogee, or together the apses. Now the pull of the sun causes the whole orbit to slowly revolve in its own plane, and consequently these apses progress, so that the true path is not quite a closed curve, but a sort of spiral with elliptic loops. But here comes in a striking circumstance. Newton states, with reference to this perturbation, that theory only accounts for one and a half degrees per annum whereas observation gives three degrees, or just twice as much. This is published in the Principia as a fact, without comment. It was for long regarded as a very curious thing, and many great mathematicians afterwards tried to find an error in the working. D'Alembert, Clairaut, and others attacked the problem, but were led to just the same result. It constituted the great outstanding difficulty in the way of accepting theory of gravitation. It was suggested that perhaps the inverse square law was only a first approximation, that perhaps a more complete expression, such as a over r squared plus b over r to the fourth, must be given for it, and so on. Ultimately, Clairaut took into account a whole series of neglected terms, and it came out correct, thus verifying the theory. But the strangest part of this tale is to come, for only a few years ago, Professor Adams of Cambridge, Neptune Adams, as he is called, 
was editing various old papers of newton's now in the possession of the duke of portland and he found manuscripts bearing on this very point and discovered that newton had reworked out the calculations himself had found the cause of the error had taken into account the terms hitherto neglected and so fifty years before clairaut had completely though not publicly solved this long outstanding problem of the progression of the apses g and h two other inequalities he calculated out and predicted these variation in the motions of the apses and the nodes neither of these had then been observed and they were afterwards detected and verified a good many other minor irregularities are now known some thirty i believe and altogether the lunar theory or problem of the moon's exact motion is one of the most complicated and difficult in astronomy the perturbations being so numerous and large because of the enormous mass of the perturbing body the disturbances experienced by the planets are much smaller because they are controlled by the sun and perturbed by each other the moon is controlled only by the earth and perturbed by the sun planetary perturbations can be treated as a series of disturbances with some satisfaction not so those of the moon and yet it is the only way at present known of dealing with the lunar theory to deal with it satisfactorily would demand the solution of such a problem as this given three rigid spherical masses thrown into empty space with any initial motions whatever and abandoned to gravity to determine their subsequent motions with two masses the problem is simple enough being pretty well summed up in kepler's laws but with three masses strange to say it is so complicated as to be beyond the reach of even modern mathematics it is a famous problem known as that of the three bodies it has not yet been solved even when it is solved it will be only a close approximation to the case of the earth moon and sun for these bodies are not spherical and are not rigid one may imagine how absurdly and hopelessly complicated a complete treatment of the motions of the entire solar system would be number eight each planet is attracted not only by the sun but by the other planets hence their orbits are slightly affected by each other the subject of planetary perturbation was only just begun by newton gradually by laplace and others the theory became highly developed and as everybody knows in eighteen forty six neptune was discovered by means of it number nine he recognized the comets as members of the solar system obedient to the same law of gravity and moving in very elongated ellipses so their return could be predicted it was a long time before newton recognized the comets as real members of the solar system and subject to gravity like the rest he at first thought they moved in straight lines it was only in the second edition of the principia that the theory of comets was introduced Halley observed a fine comet in 1682 and calculated its orbit in newtonian principles he also calculated when it ought to have been seen in past times and he found the year 1607 when one was seen by kepler also the year 1531 when one was seen by appian again he reckoned 1456 1380 1305 all these appearances were the same comet in all probability returning every seventy-five or seventy-six years the period was easily allowed to be not exact because of perturbing planets he then predicted its return for seventeen fifty eight or perhaps seventeen fifty nine a date he could not himself hope to see he lived to a great age but he died sixteen years before this date as the time drew nigh three quarters of a century afterwards astronomers were greatly interested in this first cometary prediction and kept an eager lookout for halley's comet clairaut a most eminent mathematician and student of newton proceeded to calculate out more exactly the perturbing influence of jupiter near which it had passed after immense labor for the difficulty of the calculation was extreme and the mass of mere figures something portentous he predicted its return of the thirteenth of april seven fifty nine but he considered that he might have made a possible heir of a month it returned on the thirteenth of march seventeen fifty nine and established beyond all doubt the rule of the newtonian theory over comets number ten a 
Applying the idea of centrifugal force to the earth considered as a rotating body, he perceived that it could not be a true sphere, and calculated its oblateness, obtaining 28 miles greater equatorial than polar diameter. Here we return to one of the more simple deductions. A spinning body of any kind tends to swell at its circumference or equator, and shrink along its axes or poles. If the body is of yielding material, its shape must alter under the influence of centrifugal force, and if a globe of yielding substance subject to known forces rotates at a definite pace, its shape can be calculated. Thus, a plastic sphere the size of the Earth, held together by its own gravity and rotating once a day, can be shown to have its equatorial diameter 28 miles greater than its polar diameter, the two diameters being 8,000 and 8,028 respectively. Now, we have to guarantee that the Earth is of yielding material. For all Newton could tell, it might be extremely rigid. As a matter of fact, it is now very nearly rigid. But he argued thus. The water on it is certainly yielding, and although the solid earth might decline to bulge at the equator in deference to the diurnal rotation, that would not prevent the ocean from flowing from the poles to the equator and piling itself up as an equatorial ocean 14 miles deep, leaving dry land everywhere near either pole. Nothing of this sort is observed. The distribution of land and water is not thus regulated. Hence, Whatever the earth may be now, it must once have been plastic enough to accommodate itself perfectly to the centrifugal forces and to make the shape appropriate to a perfectly plastic body. In all probability, it was once molten and for long afterwards pasty. Thus, then, the shape of the earth can be calculated from the length of its day and the intensity of its gravity. The calculation is not difficult. It consists in imagining a couple of holes bored to the center of the earth, one from a pole and one from the equator. Filling these both with water and calculating how much higher the water will stand in one leg of the gigantic V-tube, so formed than in the other. The answer comes out about 14 miles. The shape of the earth can now be observed geodetically, and it accords with calculation. But the observations are extremely delicate. In Newton's time, the size was only barely known. The shape was not observed till long after, but on the principles of mechanics, combined with a little common sense reasoning, it could be calculated with certainty and accuracy. Number 11. From the observed shape of Jupiter, or any planet, the length of its day could be estimated. Jupiter is much more oblate than the Earth. Its two diameters are to one another as 17 is to 16. The ellipticity of its disk is manifest to simple inspection. Hence, we perceive that its whirling action must be more violent. It must rotate quicker. As a matter of fact, its day is ten hours long, five hours daylight and five hours night. The times of rotation of other bodies in the solar system are recorded in a table above. Number 12. The so calculated shape of the Earth, in combination with centrifugal force, causes the weight of bodies to vary with latitude, and Newton calculated the amount of this variation. 194 pounds at pole balance 195 pounds at equator. But following the calculated shape of the Earth followed several interesting consequences. First of all, the intensity of gravity will not be the same everywhere. For at the equator, a stone is further from the average bulk of the Earth, say the center, than it is at the poles. And owing to this fact, a mass of 590 pounds at the pole would suffice to balance 591 pounds at the equator. If the two could be placed in the pans of a gigantic balance whose beam straddled along an Earth's quadrant. This is a true variation of gravity due to the shape of the Earth. But besides this, there is a still larger apparent variation due to centrifugal force, which affects all bodies at the equator, but not those at the poles. From this cause, even if the Earth were a true sphere, yet if it were spinning at its actual pace, 288 pounds at the pole would balance 289 pounds at the equator, because at the equator the true weight of the mass would not be fully appreciated. Centrifugal force would virtually diminish it by one 
289th of its amount. In actual fact, both causes coexist, and accordingly, the total variation of gravity observed is compounded of the real and apparent effects. The result is that 194 pounds at a pole weighs as much as 195 pounds at the equator. Number 13. A homogeneous sphere attracts as if its mass were concentrated at its center. For any other figure, such as an oblate spheroid, this is not exactly true. A hollow, concentric, spherical shell exerts no force on small bodies inside it. A sphere composed of uniform material, or of materials arranged in concentric strata, can be shown to attract external bodies as if its mass were concentrated at its center. A hollow sphere, similarly composed, does the same, but on internal bodies it exerts no force at all. Hence, at all distances above the surface of the earth, gravity decreases in inverse proportion as the square of the distance from the center of the earth increases. But, if you descend a mine, gravity decreases in this case also, as you leave the surface, though not at the same rate as when you went up. For, as you penetrate the crust, you get inside a concentric shell, which is thus powerless to act upon you, and the earth you are now outside is a smaller one. At what rate the force decreases depends on the distribution of density. If the density were uniform all through, the law of variation would be the direct distance. Otherwise, it would be more complicated. Anyhow, the intensity of gravity is a maximum at the surface of the Earth, and decreases as you travel from the surface either up or down. Number 14. The Earth's equatorial protuberance being acted on by the attraction of the Sun and Moon must disturb its axis of rotation in a calculated manner, and thus is produced the precession of the equinoxes. Here we come to a truly awful piece of reasoning. A sphere attracts as if its mass were concentrated at its center. Number 12. But a spheroid does not. The Earth is a spheroid, and hence it pulls and is pulled by the moon with a slightly uncentric attraction. In other words, the line of pull does not pass through its precise center. Now, when we have a spinning body, say a top, overloaded on one side, so the gravity acts on it unsymmetrically, what happens? The axis of rotation begins to rotate cone-wise, at a pace which depends on the rate of spin, and on the shape and mass of the top, as well as on the amount of leverage of the overloading. Newton calculated out the rapidity of this conical motion of the axis of the Earth, produced by the slightly unsymmetrical pull of the moon and found that it would complete a revolution in 26,000 years, precisely what was wanted to explain the precession of the equinoxes. In fact, he had discovered the physical cause of that precession. Observe that there were three stages in this discovery of precession. First, the observation of Hipparchus, that the nodes or intersections of the Earth's orbit, the Sun's apparent orbit, with the plane of the equator, were not stationary but slowly moved. Second, the description of this motion by Copernicus, by the statement that it was due to a conical motion of the Earth's axis of rotation about its center as a fixed point. Third, the explanation of this motion by Newton as due to the pull of the moon on the equatorial protuberance of the Earth. The explanation could not have been previously suspected, for the shape of the Earth, on which the whole theory depends, was entirely unknown till Newton calculated it. Another, and smaller motion of a somewhat similar kind, has been worked out since. It is due to the unsymmetrical attraction of the other planets for this same equatorial protuberance. It shows itself a periodic change in the obliquity of the ecliptic, or so-called recession of the apses, rather than as a motion of the nodes. Number 15. The waters of the ocean are attracted towards the sun and moon, 
on one side, and whirled a little farther away than the solid earth on the other side. Hence, Newton explained all the main phenomena of the tides. And now comes another tremendous generalization. The tides had long been an utter mystery. Kepler likens the earth to an animal, and the tides to his breathings and inbreathings, and says they follow the moon. Galileo chafes him for this, and says that it is mere superstition to connect the moon with the tides. Descartes said the moon pressed down upon the waters by the centrifugal force of its vortex, and so produced a low tide under it. Everything was fog and darkness on the subject. The legend goes that an astronomer threw himself into the sea in despair of ever being able to explain the flux and reflux of its waters. Newton now, with consummate skill, applied his theory to the effect of the moon upon the ocean, and all the main details of tidal action gradually revealed themselves to him. He treated the water rotating with the earth once a day, somewhat as if it were a satellite acted on by perturbing forces. The moon, as it revolves round the earth, is perturbed by the sun. The ocean, as it revolves round the earth, being held on by gravitation just as the moon is, is perturbed by both sun and moon. The perturbing effect of a body varies directly as its mass, and inversely as the cube of its distance. The simple law of inverse square does not apply, because a perturbation is a differential effect. The satellite or ocean, when nearer to the perturbing body than the rest of the earth, is attracted more, and when further off, it is attracted less than is the main body of the earth. And it is these differences alone which constitute the perturbation. The moon is the more powerful of the two perturbing bodies. Hence, the main tides are due to the moon, and its chief action is to cause a pair of low waves or oceanic humps of gigantic area to travel round the earth once in a lunar day, i.e. in about 24 hours and 50 minutes. The sun makes a similar but still lower pair of low elevations to travel round once in a solar day of 24 hours, and the combination of the two pairs of humps, thus periodically overtaking each other, accounts for the well-known spring and neap tides. Spring tides, when their maxima agree, neap tides, when their maximum of one coincides with the minimum of the other, each of which events happens regularly once a fortnight. These are the main effects, but besides these there are the effects of varying distances, obliquity to be taken into account, and so we have a whole series of minor disturbances, very like those discussed in number seven. Under the lunar theory, but more complex still, because there are two perturbing bodies instead of only one. The subject of the tides is, therefore, very recondite, and though one may give some elementary account of its main features, it will be best to defer this to a separate lecture. Lecture 17. I had better, however, here say that Newton did not limit himself to the consideration of the primary oceanic humps. He pursued the subject into geographical detail. He pointed out that, although the rise and fall of the tide at mid-ocean islands would be but small, yet on stretches of coast the wave would fling itself, and by its momentum would propel the waters to a much greater height, for instance, 20 or 30 feet, especially in some funnel-shaped openings like the Bristol Channel and the Bay of Fundy, where the concentrated impetus of the water is enormous. He also showed how the tidal waves reached different stations in successive regular order each day, and how some places might be fed with tide by two distinct channels, and that if the time of these channels happened to differ by six hours, a high tide might be arriving by one channel and a low tide by the other, so that the place would only feel the difference, and so have a very small observed rise and fall, instancing a port in China, in the Gulf of Tonquin, where that approximately occurs. In fact, although his theory was not as we now know, complete or final, yet it satisfactorily explained a mass of intricate detail as well as the main features of the tides. Number 16. The sun's mass being known, he calculated the height of the solar tide. Number 17. From the observed heights of spring and neap tides, he determined the lunar tide, and thence made an estimate of the mass of the moon. 
Knowing the sun's mass and distance, it was not difficult for Newton to calculate the height of the protuberance caused by it in a pasty ocean covering the whole earth. I say pasty because if there was any tendency for impulses to accumulate as timely pushes to a pendulum accumulate, the amount of disturbance might become excessive, and its calculation would involve a multitude of data. The Newtonian tide ignored this, thus practically treating the motion as either deadbeat or else the impulses as very inadequately timed. With this reservation, the mid-ocean tide due to the action of the sun alone comes out about one foot, or let us say one foot for simplicity. Now, the actual tide observed in mid-Atlantic is at the springs about four feet, at the neaps about two. The spring tide is lunar plus solar. The neap tide is lunar minus solar. Hence, it appears that the tide caused by the moon alone must be about three feet, when unaffected by momentum. From this datum, Newton made the first attempt to approximately estimate the mass of the moon. I said that the masses of satellites must be estimated, if at all, by the perturbation they are able to cause. The lunar tide is a perturbation in the diurnal motion of the sea, and its amount is therefore a legitimate mode of calculating the moon's mass. The available data were not at all good, however, nor are they even now very perfect, and so the estimate was a good way out. It is now considered that the mass of the moon is about one eightieth that of the earth. Such are some of the gems extracted from their setting in the Principia, and presented as clearly as I am able before you. Do you realize the tremendous stride in knowledge? Not a stride, as Wellwell says, nor yet a leap, but a flight which has occurred between the dim groupings of Kepler, the elementary truths of Galileo, the fascinating but wild speculations of Descartes, and this magnificent and comprehensive system of ordered knowledge. To some, his genius seemed almost divine. Does Mr. Newton eat, drink, sleep like other men? And the Marquis de L'Hôpital, a French mathematician of no mean eminence, I picture him to myself as a celestial genius entirely removed from the restrictions of ordinary matter. To many, it seemed as if there was nothing more to be discovered, as if the universe were now explored and only a few fragments of truth remained for the gleaner. This is the attitude of mind expressed in Pope's famous epigram. Nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. This feeling of hopelessness and impotence was very natural after the advent of so overpowering a genius, and it prevailed in England for fully a century. It was very natural, but it was very mischievous, for, as a consequence, nothing of great moment was done by England in science, and no Englishman of the first magnitude appeared, till some who are either living now or who have lived within the present century. It appeared to his contemporaries as if he had almost exhausted the possibility of discovery. But did it so appear to Newton? Did it seem to him as if he had seen far and deep into the truths of this great and infinite universe? It did not. When quite an old man, full of honor and renown, venerated, almost worshipped by his contemporaries, these were his words. I know not what the world will think of my labors, but to myself it seems that I have been but as a child playing on the seashore, now finding some pebble rather more polished, and now some shell rather more agreeably variegated than another, while the immense ocean of truth extended itself unexplored before me. And so it must ever seem to the wisest and greatest of men when brought into contact with the great things of God, that which they know is as nothing and less than nothing to the infinitude of which they are ignorant. Newton's words sound like a simple and pleasing echo of the words that the great unknown poet, the writer of the book of Job, lo, these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him, the thunder of his power, who can understand? End of lecture number nine. Recording by John Thomas Kutsumarski, JTK, www.validateyourlife.com.